Oxford University Press. The Iliad. Translated by Anthony Ver. Book 1. Sing. Goddess. The anger of Achilles, Peleus' son. The accursed anger which brought the Achaeans countless agonies and hurled many mighty shades of heroes into Hades, causing them to become the prey of dogs and all kinds of birds. And the plan of Zeus was fulfilled. Sing from the time the two men were first divided in strife, Atreus' son, lord of men, and glorious Achilles. Which of the gods was it who set them to quarrel and fight? The son of Zeus and Leta, for he was bitter against the king, and roused an evil plague through the camp, and the people went on dying, because the son of Atreus had dishonored his priest Chrysus. This man had come to the swift ships of the Achaeans to redeem his daughter, bringing a boundless ransom, and holding in his hands the woolen bands of Apollo who shoots from afar, fixed to a golden staff. He entreated all the Achaeans, but especially the two sons of Atreus, marshals of the people. You sons of Atreus, and you other well-grieved Achaean, may the gods who have their homes on Olympus grant that you sack the city of Priam and return safely home. Only release my dear child, and accept this ransom, and show reverence to Zeus's son Apollo who shoots from afar. Then all the rest of the Achaeans shouted their approval, that they should be in awe of the priest and accept the splendid ransom. But this found no favor in the heart of Atreus's son Agamemnon. He sent Chrysus roughly away, and added a harsh command. Let me not discover you, old man, beside our hollow ships, either dawdling here now or returning again later, in case your staff and the gods' bands prove no help to you. I will not let the girl go. Before I do, old age will find her in my house in Argos, far from her fatherland, going back and forth at the loom and serving me in my bed. Go, do not provoke me. This way you will return unharmed. So he spoke, and the old man was afraid and did as he said, and silently made his way along the shore of the loud roaring sea. Then, going some way apart, the old man prayed at length to Lord Apollo, whom Leto of the beautiful hair bore. Hear me, Lord of the Silver Bow, you who stand guard over Christ and sacred Scylla, and govern Tenedos with your power. Smintheus, if ever I built a temple that pleased you, or if I ever burnt for you the fat-wrapped thigh bones of bulls or goats, I beg you to fulfill this plea for me. May the Danans pay for my tears with your arrows. So he spoke in prayer, and Phoebus Apollo heard him, and came down from Olympus's heights furious in his heart, his bow and lidded quiver hanging from his shoulders. The arrows clattered against the angry god's shoulder as he moved, and he came on like nightfall. Then, sitting apart from the ships, he let fly an arrow, and his silver bow sang out with a terrible noise. First he went after the mules and the swift dogs, and then loosed piercing arrows at the men themselves, shooting without cease, and all the time the corpse pyres burnt, crowded together. For nine days the gods' shafts ranged throughout the camp, and on the tenth Achilles summoned the people to an assembly. The goddess Hera of the white arms had put this into his mind, since she cared for the Danans, because she saw them dying. So when they had assembled and were gathered together, swift-footed Achilles rose and spoke among them. Son of Atreus, I think we shall now be turned back from here to wander home again, if, that is, we can avoid death if the Achaeans are to be beaten down by plague as well as war. Come, let us interrogate some prophet or priest or interpreter of dreams, for dreams too come from Zeus, who may tell us why Phoebus Apollo is so bitter against us. Whether he finds fault with us over some vow or hecatomb, to see if he will accept the savor of lambs and unblemished goats, and so be willing to turn the plague away from us. So he spoke and took his seat again, and among them rose Calchas, the son of Thestor, by far the best of bird interpreters, who understood the present, the future, and the past, and had guided the ships of the Achaeans to Ilium by the prophetic skill which Phoebus Apollo had given him. With generous intent he spoke out and addressed them, Achilles, dear to Zeus, you command me to explain the anger of Apollo, the lord who shoots from afar. Well, I shall speak, but you must mark my words and swear to come to my help willingly in both word and deed, because I think I shall infuriate a man who has supreme authority over the Argives, and whom the Achaeans obey. A king is the more powerful when he is angry with a lesser man, because even if he stifles his anger there and then he feeds the resentment afterwards in his breast until he brings it to fulfillment. Now tell me if you will protect me. Then in answer swift-footed Achilles addressed him, Take courage, and speak out whatever divine truth you know. 
I swear by Apollo, dear to Zeus, to whom ye calchas pray when you expound divine revelations to the Danans, that while I live on earth and have the power of sight, no one will lay heavy hands on you by the hollow ships, no man of all the Danan, not even if you mean Agamemnon, who now boasts that he is by far the best of all the Achaeans. Then the blameless prophet took courage and spoke. It is not over a vow or hecatomb that he finds us at fault, but because of his priest, whom Agamemnon dishonored and did not accept the ransom and release his daughter. That is why the shooter from afar torments us and will do so again. Nor will he drive the ugly, shameful plague from the Danans until the girl with darting eyes is returned to her father, without ransom and without payment. And a holy hecatomb is taken to Christ. Only then might we appease and persuade him. So he spoke and took his seat again, and among them rose the hero son of Atreus, wide ruling Agamemnon. Full of distress, his dark heart was filled to the brim with fury, and his two eyes were like flashing fire. First of all he addressed Calchas with a look of hate. Prophet of evil, never yet have you told me anything good. It is always dear to your heart to prophesy calamities, and you have never given us good news or brought it to fulfillment. And so now you prophesy and speak publicly to the Danans, claiming that the one who shoots from afar is tormenting us because I was not willing to accept the splendid ransom for the girl Crace's daughter. Even though it is my desire to keep her in my house, and indeed I prefer her to Clytemnestra, my wedded wife, since she is in no way inferior to her in stature or in beauty, nor in understanding or accomplishments. Even so, I am prepared to give her back, if that is the better course. I would wish the people to survive rather than to perish. But you must at once get ready another prize for me, so that I alone of the Argives am not without one. Since that cannot be right, you can all see that my prize is going elsewhere." Then in answer glorious, swift-footed Achilles addressed him, Most illustrious son of Atreus, rapacious beyond all other men, how can the great-spirited Achaeans give you a prize? We know of no great common store of possessions anywhere. Everything that we sacked from cities has been distributed, and it is not fitting that the people should collect it together again. No, you must now give the girl up to the god, and the Achaeans will compensate you three and fourfold if ever Zeus grants that we tear apart the strongly walled city of Troy. Then in answer Lord Agamemnon addressed him. Godlike Achilles, great man though you may be, do not try to deceive me in this, since you will not outwit nor get the better of me. Are you telling me to give the girl back and to sit here meekly with no reward, simply so that you may keep your prize? Well, if the great-spirited Achaeans award me a prize, suiting it to my desire, equal in status to the other, I will accept it but if they will not, then I shall myself come and take one, either yours, or the prize belonging to Ajax or Odysseus, and carry it away, and the man to whom I come will be angry. However, we shall give thought to this at a later time. As for now, come, let us drag a black ship down to the bright sea, and gather some oarsmen for the purpose, and put on board a hecatomb, and embark Chrysus's fair-cheeked daughter herself, and let there be one man, a counselor, as captain, either Ajax or Idomeneus or glorious Odysseus, or you, son of Peleus, most outrageous of men, so that you may make offerings and appease the far worker for us. Looking at him darkly, swift-footed Achilles addressed him, You wear shamelessness like a garment, and your mind is full of greed. How can any of the Achaeans readily obey your order, to join an expedition, or to try their strength with men in battle? For my part, I did not come here to fight because of the Trojan spearmen since they have done me no wrong at all. They have never driven off my cattle or my horses, nor have they ever destroyed my crops in rich-soiled fia, nurturer of men, since between us lies a very great distance of shadowy mountains and the roaring sea. It was you we followed, shameless brute, to please you, to win honor for Menelaus and for you, you dog, from the Trojans. But you care nothing for this, and pay it no heed, and now you threaten to take my prize from me in person for which I labored hard, and the sons of the Achaeans gave it to me. I never receive a prize equal to yours whenever the Achaeans sack some well-populated citadel of the Trojans. It is always my hands that sustain the greater part of the violent conflict. But when there is a sharing out of booty, your prize is by far the greater, and I go back to my ships with some small thing, yet dear to me, exhausted by the fighting. So now I shall return to Fodia, since it is far and away better to go home on my curved ships, I am not minded to stay here without honor, 
heaping up riches and wealth for you. Then in answer Agamemnon, lord of men, addressed him, run away, then, if your heart so urges you. I shall not beg you to stay on my account, since there are many others near me to give me honor, and especially Zeus the counselor. Of all the Zeus-nurtured kings, you are the most hateful to me, for strife and war and battles are always dear to your heart. And even if you are very strong, that must be a gift from some god. Go home with your ships and your companions and lord it over the Myrmidons. I care nothing about you, and your anger does not trouble me. But this is my threat to you. Phoebus Apollo is taking Christ's daughter from me, and I shall send her back on my ship with my companions, but I shall come myself to your hut and take away Briseus's lovely-cheeked daughter, your prize, so that you may know well how much more powerful I am than you, and so that others too may fear to speak to me as an equal and match me face to face. So he spoke, and grief rose up in the son of Peleus, and the heart in his hairy chest was divided in two, as he deliberated whether to draw his sharp sword from beside his thigh and drive the others away, and kill the son of Atreus, or to suppress his bitter anger and subdue his heart. He was pondering this in his heart and in his mind, and was drawing his great sword from its scabbard when Athena came from the high sky. The goddess white-armed Hera had sent her, since she loved and cared equally for both men in her heart. She stood behind Peleus's son and grasped him by his fair hair, appearing to him alone and none of the others saw her. Achilles was amazed and turned round and at once recognized Pallas Athena, for her eyes shone with a terrible light, and he addressed her, speaking with winged words. What are you doing here, daughter of Aegis wearing Zeus? Is it to mark these arrogant insults from Atreus's son Agamemnon? I tell you this plainly, and I believe it will be fulfilled. One day soon his high-handedness will cause him to lose his life. Then in answer the goddess gray-eyed Athena addressed him. I have come from the high sky to stop your fury, hoping that you will obey me. The goddess Hera of the white arms sent me, for she loves and cares equally for both of you in her heart. Come, leave off your strife and take your hand from your sword, though you may abuse him in words, and tell him how things will be. For I tell you this plainly, and indeed it will be fulfilled. One day you will have three times as many splendid gifts to pay for these insults. Restrain yourself now, and do as we say. Then, in answer, swift-footed Achilles addressed her. Goddess, a man must respect the words of you both, however great the anger in his heart, for it is better this way. If a man obeys the gods, they are more ready to listen to him. So he spoke, and set his heavy hand on the silver hilt, and thrust the great sword back into its scabbard, and did not disobey the word of Athena and she went away towards Olympus, to the house of Zeus, wearer of the edges, to join the rest of the gods. Then the son of Peleus once again addressed the son of Atreus with wounding words, and was not yet ready to give up his anger, wine-sodden man, with the eyes of a dog and the heart of a deer. Never yet have you been brave enough to arm with the people for war, or to set out for an ambush with the best of the Achaeans, for that course seems to you to be as dangerous as death. No, it is much better to skulk in the broad camp of the Achaeans and to take away the gifts of any man who speaks out against you. You are a people-devouring king, for you rule over non-entities. Otherwise, son of Atreus, this would be the last outrage you caused. But I tell you this plainly, and I swear a great oath with it, by this staff, which will never again grow leaves and shoot since it first left the trunk where it was cut in the mountains, nor will it sprout again. For the bronze axe has stripped away the leaves and bark all around it and now in turn the judgment-giving sons of the Achaeans hold it in their hands, upholding the ordinances of Zeus, and this will be a mighty oath to you. One day longing for Achilles will come upon the sons of the Achaeans, every one of them, and then, for all your grief, you will have no power to help them, when many fall and die at the hands of man-slaying Hector, and you will tear apart the heart within you in anger, because you denied all honor to the best of the Achaeans. So the son of Peleus spoke and flung the staff, studded with golden nail, to the ground, and sat down himself. On the other side Atreus's son still raged, but among them Nestor of the sweet words leapt up, the clear-voiced orator of the Peleans, from whose tongue flowed a voice sweeter than honey. In his lifetime two generations of mortal men had already died, those who had been raised with him and those born afterwards in holy Pylos, and he was now ruling over the third. With generous intent he spoke out and addressed them. Surely great distress is coming to the land of Achaia. 
how Priam and the sons of Priam would be overjoyed, and all the rest of the Trojans would be glad in their hearts, if they were to hear of all this fighting between the pair of you. You who excel among the Danans in both counsel and battle. Come, listen to me. You are both younger than me, and I have in times past kept company with better men than you, and never did they treat me with disdain. I have never seen, nor shall I ever see, such men as Pirithus and Dryas, shepherd of his people, and Caeneus and Exadius and godlike Polyphemus, and Theseus, son of Aegeus, who resembled the immortals. They were the mightiest of all men on earth in their rearing. They were the mightiest, and they fought with the mightiest, with mountain-dwelling beasts, and they dealt them an appalling death. These were my companions when I came from Pylos, from a far distant land, because they had summoned me. I gave a good account of myself in the fighting, and against them no one of mortals who now live upon the earth could fight. Moreover, they listened to my advice and obeyed my words. So you two both should listen to me, since it is better to listen. You, great man though you are, must not take the girl from this man, but let her be, since the Achaeans' sons first gave him her as a prize. As for you, son of Peleus, do not seek to rival a king by force, since a staff-holding king to whom Zeus grants glory enjoys a greater portion of honor than other men do. Even if you are stronger, it is because your mother is a goddess, but he is the greater, because he rules over more people. Son of Atreia, give up your anger. It is I who entreat you to renounce your bitterness against Achilles, who is a mighty bulwark for all the Achaeans in ruinous war. Then in answer Lord Agamemnon addressed him, Very well, old man, all that you say is according to due measure, but this man desires to be above all other men, desires to rule over all men, to lord it over everyone, to give orders to all, though I think some will not obey him. Even if the gods who live forever have made him a spearman, is this a reason for insulting words to burst from his mouth, breaking in on him? Glorious Achilles answered, I should certainly be called a coward and a man of no account if I were to give way to you in everything you say. Go and give these orders to others, but do not instruct me, because I have no mind to listen to you any further. But I tell you another thing, and you should store it in your mind. I shall not fight you with my bare hands for the girl's sake, not you or anyone else. You all gave her to me, and then you took her away. But as for the rest of the possessions that I keep in my black ship, you will not take any of them and carry them off against my will. Come on now, put me to the test, so that these here also may see, and quickly your black blood will gush out over my spear. So these two fought with violent words, one against the other, and stood up, and broke up the assembly beside the Achaeans' ships. Peleus's son went away to his huts and well-balanced ships with the son of Minoetius and his own companions, and Atreus' son dragged a swift ship down to the sea and picked out twenty rowers to go in it, and loaded onto it a hecatomb for the god, and brought Chrysa's lovely-cheeked daughter and set her on it, and much scheming Odysseus went aboard as captain. So they embarked and sailed along the watery pathways, and the son of Atreus commanded the people to purify themselves. When they had purified themselves and thrown the defilement into the sea, they sacrificed to Apollo unblemished hecatombs of bulls and goats, beside the shore of the unresting sea, and the savor reached the high sky. Caught up in the whirling smoke, so they busied themselves throughout the camp. But Agamemnon did not give up the quarrel and the threat he had made to Achilles before this, but spoke to Talthebius and Eurybate, the two who were his heralds and diligent attendants, go to the hut of Achilles, son of Pileus, and take Brasius's lovely-cheeked daughter by the hand and bring her here. If he does not give her to you, then I shall come in person and get her, and with more men, and that will be the worse for him. So he spoke, and sent them away, and laid a harsh command on them. Reluctantly they made their way along the shore of the unresting sea, and came to the huts and ships of the Myrmidons. They found Achilles beside his hut and his black ship, sitting inactive, and when he saw them he was not glad. The two men were terrified, and stood there, in awe of the king, and did not address a word to him or ask him questions, but he understood in his heart and spoke to them. Welcome, heralds, messengers of Zeus and of men. Come closer. It is not you I blame, but Agamemnon, who is sending you here for the girl, Briseis's daughter. Come, Patroclus, sprung from Zeus, bring the girl out and give her to these men to take away. Let them be witnesses in the sight of the blessed gods and of mortal men, and of him, that ruthless king, if ever in future a need arises for me to turn ugly destruction away from the rest. 
His mind is surely hurtling towards ruin, and he has not the sense to look before him and behind, to ensure that the Achaeans survive, fighting beside their ships. So he spoke, and Patroclus obeyed his dear companion, and brought Briseus's lovely cheek daughter out of the hut and gave her to them to take away. They returned to the Achaeans' ships, and the woman went with them, reluctantly. But Achilles wept, and at once took himself apart from his companions and sat on the shore of the gray sea, gazing out over the boundless expanse. Stretching out his arms, he prayed at length to his dear mother, Mother, you gave me birth to live for only a short while, so surely the Olympian, Zeus the High Thunderer, ought to have bestowed some honor on me, but as it is he has given me none, not even a little. Atreus's son, wide-ruling Agamemnon, has dishonored me. He has taken away my prize in person and keeps it for himself. So he spoke, shedding tears, and his revered mother heard him as she sat in the depths of the sea next to her aged father. Quickly she rose up from the gray sea like a mist and took her seat in front of him as he wept his tears, and stroking him with her hand she spoke to him, saying, Child, why are you weeping? What sorrow has entered your heart? Tell me, do not hide it in your mind, so that we both may know. With a heavy groan, swift-footed Achilles addressed her, You do know. Why should I tell you all this when you know it? We went to Thebe, the sacred city of Eshan, and sacked it and brought all the plunder here. This the sons of the Achaeans distributed properly among themselves and picked out for Atreus's son Chrysus's lovely-cheeked daughter. But then Chrysus, the priest of Apollo who shoots from afar, came to the swift ships of the bronze-shirted Achaeans, intending to redeem his daughter, bringing a boundless ransom and holding in his hands the woolen bands of Apollo the far shooter, fixed to a golden staff, and he entreated all the Achaean, but especially the two sons of Atreus, marshals of the people. Then all the rest of the Achaeans shouted their approval, that they should be in awe of the priest and accept the splendid ransom, but this found no favor in the heart of Atreus's son Agamemnon. And he sent him roughly away, and added a harsh command. The old man went back in anger, and Apollo heard him when he prayed, because he was very dear to him, and let loose deadly shafts against the Argives, and the people kept dying, one after another, and the gods' arrows ranged everywhere throughout the Achaeans' broad camp. Our prophet, with sure knowledge, explained the far worker's divine will to us, and it was I who first urged that we should at once appease the god, but at this anger took hold of Atreus's son, and instantly he rose and made threats against me, which have indeed been fulfilled. Now the darting-eyed Achaeans are sending the girl, Christ's child, with a swift ship to Christ, and are taking gifts for the Lord Apollo, while heralds have lately come and taken from my hut that other girl, Briseus's daughter, whom the sons of the Achaeans gave to me. I beg you, if it is in your power, have care for your son. Go to Olympus and entreat Zeus, reminding him of any service of word or deed that you have done to Zeus's heart. Indeed, I often heard you boasting in the halls of my father when you said that you alone among the immortals averted ugly destruction from Cronus's son of the dark clouds at the time when other Olympians, Hera and Poseidon and Pallas Athena, were wishing to tie him down. But ye, goddess, came and released him from his bonds, quickly summoning to high Olympus the hundred-handed one called Briarius by the gods, but all men call him Agion, and he is mightier than his father. He took his seat next to the son of Cronus, exulting in his triumph, and the blessed gods cowered in fright and did not try to bind him. Sit beside Zeus now and take hold of his knees and remind him of this, to see if he will agree to help the Trojans by penning the Achaeans in by their ship's sterns along the seashore and killing them, so that they all may take delight in their king, and that the son of Atreus, wide ruling Agamemnon, may come to know his delusion, in that he did not honor the best of the Achaeans. Then Thetis answered him, shedding tears, Ah, my child, why did I bear you, giving birth to such suffering? If only you could sit at ease by your ships without tears and grief, since your portion of life is but short and not at all long. But you are doomed to a swift death, to be wretched beyond all men. It was indeed to a cruel destiny that I bore you in my halls. Still, I shall say these words for you to Zeus who delights in the thunderbolt, going to snow-covered Olympus, to see if he will listen. And as for you, sit now beside your swift-traveling ships and rage against the Achaeans, and hold back altogether from the war. Zeus went yesterday to Ocean to join the blameless Ethiopians and to take part in a feast, and all the other gods went with him, 
On the twelfth day he will come again to Olympus. And then I shall go to Zeus's house with its bronze floor, and I shall entreat him, and I believe I shall persuade him. So she spoke and went away, leaving him there, bitterly angry in his heart because of the well-girdled woman, whom they were taking from him by force, against his will. Now Odysseus was nearing Christ with the holy hecatomb, and when they had sailed into the harbor with its many deep bays, they furled the sail and stowed it in the black ship and then quickly slackened the forestays and laid the mast in its crutch, and with oars rowed the ship on to an anchorage. Out they threw the anchor stone, and made the stern cables fast. Out they themselves landed on to the shore of the sea. Out they brought the hecatomb for Apollo who shoots from afar. Out stepped Chrysa's daughter from the sea-traversing ship. Then much scheming Odysseus escorted her to the altar and gave her into her father's arms and said to him, Chrysa's Agamemnon. Lord of men, has sent me to bring you your daughter and to offer a holy hecatomb to Phoebus on the Danans' behalf, that we may appease the Lord who has been bringing grief and lamentation on to the Argives. So he spoke, and gave her into his arms, and with joy he received his dear child. Quickly the others set out the holy hecatomb for the god in due order around the well-built altar. Then they washed their hands and lifted up the barley grains, and among them Chrysus prayed in a loud voice, lifting up his hands, Hear me! God of the silver bow, you who stand guard over Christ and sacred Scylla, and rule over Tenedos with your power, you listened to me when I prayed to you before, and gave me honor, and bore heavily on the Achaean people. So this time also bring this plea to fulfillment for me. Now turn aside the ugly plague from the Danans. So he spoke in prayer, and Phoebus Apollo heard him. When they had prayed and sprinkled the barley grains, they first pulled back the beasts' heads, then slit their throats and flayed them, then cut away the thigh bones and wrapped them in fat, covering them above and below, and laid raw hunks of meat upon them. These the old man burnt on billets of wood and poured gleaming wine over them, and young men held five-pronged forks in their hands. When the thigh bones were burnt up and they had tasted the entrails, they chopped the rest of the meat small and threaded it on skewers and cooked it with great care and then drew it all off. When they had finished their work and made the meal ready, they feasted, and no one's heart lacked a fair share in the meal. When they had put from themselves the desire for food and drink, young men filled mixing jars to the brim with drink and distributed it to all, after first pouring libations into the cup. So all day long the young men of the Achaeans set about appeasing the god with songs, chanting a beautiful paean, singing of the far worker, and he heard it and was glad in his heart. When the sun went down and darkness came over them, they lay down to sleep beside the ship's stern cables, but when early-born dawn with her rosy fingers appeared, then they put out to sea for the broad camp of the Achaeans, and Apollo, who shoots from afar, sent them a following wind. The men set up the mast and spread the white sail aloft, and the wind blew into the belly of the sail, and a dark wave sang out loudly about the stem as the ship sailed on, speeding over the waves and keeping close to its course. When they reached the broad camp of the Achaeans, they dragged the black ship up onto the land, high on the sands, and positioned long props under it, and themselves dispersed to their huts and their ship. But still he raged, sitting idle beside his swift-traveling ships, the son of Pelia, sprung from Zeus, swift-footed Achilles. No longer did he frequent the assembly where men win glory, nor ever go to the war, but wasted his dear heart away, staying where he was, but yearning for the battle cry and the fighting. But when the twelfth dawn from that day appeared, the gods who live forever did indeed return to Olympus altogether, and Zeus led the way. Thetis did not forget her son's request, but rose up through the waves of the sea, and early in the morning flew up to the vast high sky in Olympus. She found Cronus's wide thundering sun sitting apart from the rest on the topmost peak of Olympus, mountain of many ridges. Sitting in front of him, she caught him by the knees with her left hand, and with her right reached up and grasped his chin, and addressed Zeus, the son of Cronus, entreating him. Father Zeus, if ever I was of service to you among the immortals in word or in deed, then bring this plea to fulfillment for me. Honor my son. He is fated to have the briefest life of all men, and now Agamemnon, lord of men, has dishonored him. He has taken away his prize in person and keeps it for himself. I beg you, Olympian Zeus, counselor, to honor him, give victory to the Trojans, until such time as the Achaeans make amends to my son and increase his honor. So she spoke, 
and Zeus the cloud gatherer gave her no answer, but sat for a long time in silence. Thetis had grasped his knee and kept tight hold of them and asked him a second time, Promise me without fail and nod your head in assent, or else deny me, for you have nothing to fear, and so I will know well how much I am the least honored among all the gods. Then, deeply angered, Zeus the cloud gatherer addressed her, This will surely prove a bad business. You will cause me to quarrel with Hera, and she will provoke and abuse me. Even as it is, she is always arguing with me among the immortal gods, saying that I take the Trojan side in the fighting. Go away now, in case Hera finds out that you are here. I shall see to this matter, and bring it to fulfillment. Look, I shall nod my head in assent to you, so that you will trust me. For this is the most important sign that comes from me to the immortals. No word of mine can be revoked or beguiled or denied, when once I have nodded my head in assent. So the son of Cronus spoke, and nodded his dark brows in assent, and the locks of the Lord's deathless hair swung forward on his immortal head, and he made great Olympus tremble. So these two left their plotting, and went their separate ways. Thetis leapt from shining Olympus into the deep sea, and Zeus went to his house. All the gods stood up together from their seats in the presence of their father, and no one dared to stay seated as he approached, but they all stood facing him. There he seated himself on his throne, but Hera knew well when she saw him that Thetis had been scheming with him, Thetis the silver-footed daughter of the Ancient of the Sea. At once she addressed Zeus, the son of Cronus, in jeering words, Crafty schemer, which of the gods has been plotting with you now? It is always your delight to keep away from me and ponder in secret before deciding something. Never yet have you brought yourself to tell me openly what you are brooding on. Then the father of gods and men answered her, Hera, do not expect to know about all my thoughts. They will turn out hard for you, even though you are my wife. As for those that it is fitting for you to hear, no one will know before you, either of gods or men. But when I am minded to muse on something apart from the gods, you must not seek to know it or to question me closely. Then the ox-eyed lady Hera answered him, Most dread son of Cronus, what is this that you have said? In the past I have not questioned you closely or sought to know, but you have devised whatever you wished in complete peace. But now I am terribly afraid in my mind that silver-footed Thetis, daughter of the Ancient of the Sea, has contrived to beguile you. Early in the morning she sat beside you and grasped your knees, and I fancy you have nodded your head in assent, saying you will honor Achilles, and kill many of the Achaeans beside their ships. Then Zeus who gathers the clouds addressed her in answer, You are possessed, and always fancying things, I cannot elude you. Even so you will achieve nothing, and this will take you further from my heart, and that will be the worse for you. If this is how things are, it must be that I wish them to be so. You should sit in silence and abide by my words. If not, all the gods who are on Olympus will be unable to help you when I come near and lay my irresistible hands upon you. So he spoke, and the lady ox-eyed Hera was afraid, and sat in silence, bending her heart to submission. And in Zeus's house the gods of the high sky were troubled. But among them Hephaestus the famed craftsman began to speak, out of concern for his dear mother, Hera of the white arms. Well, this will indeed be a bad business and not to be born, if you two give rise to strife in this way because of mortals, and provoke brawling among the gods. There will be no pleasure at all in the splendid feast, since ill feeling will prevail. To my mother I give this advice, though she knows it herself, to give in to our dear father Zeus, so that he will not again reprimand her, and so throw our feast into disarray. What if the Olympian god of the lightning had a mind to hurl us bodily from our seats? He is much the most powerful here. No, you must approach him with words that are gentle, and then straight away the Olympian will be merciful to us. So he spoke, and leaping up he placed a two-handled cup in his dear mother's hand, and addressed her. Be patient, my mother, and endure, troubled though you are, or else I may see you, dear as you are to me, beaten before my eyes. And then, though grieved, I would not be able to help you, since it is a hard thing to defy the Olympian. Indeed, once before, when I was eager to come to your help, he seized me by the foot and flung me from the divine threshold. All day long I dropped through the air, and with the sun setting fell upon Lemnos, and there was little life left in me, but straight after my fall the Sinchian men took care of me. So he spoke. And the goddess Hera of the white arms smiled, and as she smiled took the cup from her son in her hand. Then he, moving from left to right, 
poured out sweet nectar for all the other gods, drawing it off from the mixing bowl, and unquenchable laughter broke out among the blessed gods when they saw Hephaestus shuffling about the house. And so the whole day long until the setting of the sun they feasted, and no one's heart lacked a fair share in the feast, nor were they denied the beautiful lyre which Apollo held, nor the muses, who sang antiphonally with their lovely voices. But when the bright light of the sun had gone down, they went to prepare for sleep, each to their own house, to where the far-famed bow-legged god Hephaestus had in his cunning skill built a house for each of them. And Zeus, the Olympian god of the lightning, went to his bed, where he always rested when sweet sleep came upon him. There he went up and slept, and beside him was Hera of the Golden Throne. Book Two Now all other beings, gods, and horse-marshalling men, slept the night long, but sweet sleep did not keep hold of Zeus. He was pondering in his mind how he might give honor to Achilles and kill many men beside the Achaeans' ships. And this seemed to him in his heart to be the best plan, to send a destructive dream to Agamemnon, son of Atreus. Addressing the dream, he spoke with winged words, Away now, destructive dream, to the Achaeans' swift ships. Go into the hut of Agamemnon, son of Atreus, and repeat everything to him exactly as I instruct you. Command him to arm the flowing-haired Achaeans with all speed, because now he may take the Trojan city with its wide streets. The immortals dwelling on Olympus are no longer divided in their purpose, for Hera has bent the wills of them all by her pleading, and affliction has laid hold of the Trojans. So he spoke, and when it had heard his words, the dream departed, and came without delay to the swift ships of the Achaeans. It made for Atreus's son Agamemnon, and found him asleep in his hut, and deathless slumber was poured over him. It stood above his head in the likeness of Neleus's son Nestor, whom Agamemnon valued most of the elders. Assuming this likeness, the god-sent dream addressed him. You sleep, son of Atreus, war-minded breaker of horses, but a man of counsel should not sleep the whole night through, one to whom the people are entrusted and who has so many cares. Now listen quickly to me. I am a messenger to you from Zeus, who though far away is deeply concerned for you and pities you. He commands you to arm the flowing-haired Achaeans speedily, because now you may take the Trojan city with its wide streets. The immortals dwelling on Olympus are no longer divided in their purpose, for Hera has bent the wills of them all by her pleading, and affliction sent from Zeus has laid hold of the Trojans. Store this then in your heart, do not let forgetfulness possess you, when once mind-cheering sleep has released you. So it spoke and departed, and left him there, pondering these things in his heart, which would not be fulfilled. He thought he would take the city of Priam on that same day, fool that he was, and did not know what deed Zeus was planning, who was about to inflict even more anguish and lamentation on both Trojans and Danons in the course of the harsh conflict. He woke from his sleep, and the divine voice was poured over him. He started up, then stood and clothed himself in his soft tunic, beautiful and not yet worn, and threw over it his great cloak. Under his shining feet he bound his fine sandals, and from his shoulders he slung his silver-riveted sword. He picked up his ancestral, never-decaying staff, and holding it made his way along the ships of the bronze-shirted Achaeans. Now the goddess Dawn had reached high Olympus, to announce the daylight to Zeus and the other immortals, when Agamemnon commanded the clear-voiced heralds to summon the flowing-haired Achaeans to an assembly. So they made the summons, and the men gathered with great speed, but first he held a council of the great-spirited elders beside the ship of Nestor, the king who was born in Pylos. When he had called them together, he framed a subtle plan. Listen to me, friends. A god-sent dream came to me in my sleep through the deathless night, and it most closely resembled glorious Nestor in appearance and stature and form. It stood above my head and spoke these words to me. You sleep, son of Atreia, war-minded breaker of horses, but a man of counsel should not sleep the whole night through one to whom the people are entrusted, and who has so many cares. Now listen quickly to me. I am a messenger to you from Zeus, who though far away is deeply concerned for you and pities you. He commands you to arm the flowing-haired Achaeans speedily, because now you may take the Trojan city with its wide streets. The immortals dwelling on Olympus are no longer divided in their purpose, for Hera has bent the wills of them all by her pleading, and affliction sent from Zeus has laid hold of the Trojans. Store this in your heart. So it spoke, and flew away from my sight, and sweet sleep released me. So come, 
Let us see if we can arm the sons of the Achaeans for battle. But first I shall test them with words, as is right, and I shall urge them to flee in their many benched ships. And you must go among them and try to hold them back with words. So he spoke and took his seat again, and among them arose Nestor, who was king in sandy Pylos. With generous intent he spoke out and addressed them. My friends, chieftains, and rulers of the Argives, if anyone else of the Achaeans had told us of this dream, we would say it was false and would turn our backs on it. But the man who saw it claims to be the best of the Achaeans. So come, let us try to arm the sons of the Achaeans for battle. So he spoke, and was the first to leave the assembly, and the rest, all the staff-holding kings, stood up after him and obeyed the shepherd of the people, and the people rushed to meet them. As when troops of swarming bees stream out from a hollow rock in bursts, one after another, and settle in clusters on springtime flowers, and then, massing together fly off in different directions. So the numerous tribes streamed out by companies from their ships and huts along the wide sea shore to the assembly place. And among them blazed rumor, Zeus's messenger, urging them ever onwards. And so they gathered, and the assembly was in turmoil, and the earth groaned under the men as they sat down, and there was an uproar. Nine heralds set about holding them back, shouting, hoping to stop their clamor and make them listen to the Zeus-nurtured kings. So the people hastily sat down and kept to their seats, and stopped their shouting. Then Lord Agamemnon arose, holding the staff which Hephaestus had made by his craft. Hephaestus had given it to Lord Zeus, the son of Cronus, and then Zeus had given it to the guide, slayer of Argus. Lord Hermes gave it to Pelops, whipper of horses, and Pelops in his turn gave it to Atreus, shepherd of the people. Atreus, as he died, left it to Thyestes, rich in flocks, and Thyestes in his turn left it to Agamemnon to wheel, to rule over many islands and the whole of Argos. Leaning on this staff, Agamemnon addressed the Argives, Friend, Danon Hero, ministers of Ares, Zeus, the son of Cronus, has mightily snared me in a cruel delusion, hard god that he is, who once promised and assured me that I should return home only after sacking strongly walled Ilium, but now he has planned an evil deception and tells me to return to Argos without glory, after losing many of my people. This must, I suppose, be pleasing to Zeus the All-Powerful, who has indeed destroyed the crowns of many cities, and will do so again, for his might is the greatest of all. But this will be a shameful thing for future men to hear, that so fine and numerous a host of Achaeans fought a vain and futile war, fighting against men who were fewer in number, with no success to be shown at its end. If we were minded, both Achaeans and Trojans, to make a solemn truce in both sides to reckon their numbers, the Trojans to count up those who have houses in the city, and we Achaeans to arrange ourselves in groups of ten, and if each group were to choose a Trojan to pour their wine, then there would be many tens who lacked a wine pourer, so greatly, I say. Do the sons of the Achaeans outnumber the Trojans who dwell in the city? But they have allies from many cities on their side, men who wield the spear, who thwart me mightily and prevent me from sacking Ilium, that well-populated city, for all my desire to do so. Already nine years from great Zeus have passed, and, as we see, the ship's timbers have rotted and their rigging has gone slack, and our wives and our infant children must be sitting in our halls longing for our return, while our enterprise, the cause of our coming here, remains quite unaccomplished. Come then, let us all be agreed, and do as I say. Let us go away in our ships to our dear native land, because we shall never capture Troy of the wide streets. So he spoke, and roused the spirit in the breasts of all those in the army who did not know his purpose. The assembly was stirred like the tall waves of the sea, the open sea by Icaria, when the east and south winds churn it up, swooping down from the clouds of Father Zeus. As when the west wind moves over a deep cornfield and stirs it, and the ears of corn bend before its violent onset, so the whole assembly was stirred, and the men rushed shouting towards the ship. And underneath their feet the dust rose and hung suspended in the air. They called to each other to lay hold of the ships and drag them down to the bright sea. And they began to rake out the slipways and pulled the props from under the ships. In their longing for home, their shouts reached the sky. Then the Argives would have returned home, against their destiny if Hera had not spoken to Athena with these words. Daughter of Aegis-wearing Zeus, Atritone, this will not do. It seems that the Argives are about to flee home to their dear native land, over the broad back of the sea. 
If they do, they will leave to Priam and the Trojans a reason to boast, I mean Argi of Helen, on whose account many of the Achaeans have died at Troy, far from their dear native land. Go now among the people of bronze-shirted Achaeans and with coaxing words try to hold back every man, and do not let them drag their well-balanced ships down to the sea. So she spoke, and the goddess gray-eyed Athena did not disobey her, but went swooping down from the peaks of Olympus, and quickly came to the swift ships of the Achaeans. There she found Odysseus, the equal of Zeus in scheming, standing idle. He had not laid hold of his well-benched black ship, because sadness had entered his heart and his spirit. Standing nearby, the goddess gray-eyed Athena addressed him, son of Laertes, sprung from Zeus, Odysseus of many schemes, are you really about to fall into your many-benched ship, all of you, and to run home like this, to your dear native land? If so, you will leave to Priam, and the Trojans a reason to boast, I mean Argiv Helen, on whose account many of the Achaeans have died at Troy, far from their dear native land. Come now, do not delay, but go among the people of the Achaeans, and with coaxing words try to hold back every man, and do not let them drag their well-balanced ships down to the sea. So she spoke, and he knew he had heard a goddess's voice, and set off at a run, throwing away his cloak, which was retrieved by the herald Eurybates, who came from Ithaca and served him. He himself went to meet Agamemnon, son of Atreus, and received from him the ancestral, never-decaying staff, and holding it made his way along the ships of the bronze-shirted Achaeans. Whenever he came across a king or man of eminence, he would stand beside him and try to restrain him with coaxing words. You are possessed. It is not right to threaten you as if you were a coward. Go, sit down again and make all your people sit as well. You do not yet know clearly what the son of Atreus intends. He is testing the Achaeans' sons now, but soon he will hit them hard. Did we not all hear what he said in the council? I am afraid that in his bitterness he may punish the sons of the Achaeans. Great is the temper of kings who are nurtured by Zeus. Their honor comes from Zeus, and Zeus the counselor loves them. But whenever he saw a man of the common people yelling out, he would belabor him with the staff and shout at him, You are possessed. Sit down quietly and listen to the words of others who are better fighters than you. You are feeble and unwarlike not someone to be reckoned with either in war or in council. There is no way that we Achaeans can all be kings here. Many rulers are an evil thing. Let there be a single commander, one king, to whom the son of crooked scheming Cronus is given a staff and the power to judge, to decide for his people. So by his authority he brought them under control, and they streamed back again from their ships and huts to the assembly place. With the noise of a wave of the loud bellowing sea when it crashes on to a great beach, and the wide sea echoes its roar. So they all settled down and kept to their seats except for one man, Thersites, who kept whining on. His talk was full of chaos, and he had a mind crammed with words, numerous and disorderly, though he used them in a wild and unruly way to argue with the kings, and he would say what he thought would be amusing to the Argives. He was the ugliest man who had come to besiege Ilium. He was bandy leg and lame in one foot, and his shoulders were hunched together narrowing on to his chest, and his head grew to a point, and sprouted a scanty crop of hair. He was especially hated by Achilles and Odysseus, for it was his way to provoke them. But now against glorious Agamemnon, he began to shout abuse, yelling and screaming. The Achaeans were outraged in their hearts, and grew violently angry with him, but still he harangued Agamemnon, shouting at the top of his voice. What is your complaint this time, Atreus's son? What more do you want? Your huts are crammed full of bronze, and there are many women in your huts, expressly chosen, whom the Achaeans give to you before anyone else whenever we capture a city. Is it more gold you hanker after, gold such as one of the horse-breaking Trojans may bring from Ilium as ransom for his son, whom I or another Achaean have captured and delivered here? Or is it a young woman you want, to couple with in love, and to keep her apart for yourself? It is not right for one who is their leader to make trouble for the sons of the Achaeans. Weak fools, wretched fools, women of Achaea, no longer men. Let us make our way home in our ships, and leave this one here at Troy to brood on his winnings. He will soon find out whether the rest of us will come to his help or not. And now he has even dishonored Achilles, a much better man than him, taking his prize away in person and keeping it for himself. But there is no rage in Achilles' heart, and he is slow to act. Otherwise. Son of Atreus, 
this would be your last outrage. So Thersite spoke, provoking Agamemnon, shepherd of the people. But glorious Odysseus quickly came up and stood beside him, and looking at him darkly rebuked him with hard words. Thersite, you may be a clear-voiced speaker, but your words are wild. Restrain yourself. Do not hope to be the one man who argues with kings. I do not believe there is any mortal less warlike than you, out of all those who came with the sons of Atreus to besiege Ilium. So, let's have no more bawling out the names of your kings trying to make sure of a voyage home by flinging abuse at them. We do not yet know for sure how these things will be, whether we sons of Achaeans will return home in triumph or in defeat. Yet here you sit and behave insolently towards Agamemnon, shepherd of the people, because the Danan heroes give him a great many gifts. Your speech is nothing but jeering abuse. But I tell you this plainly, and it will certainly be fulfilled. If ever I find you playing the fool again as you are now, may the head of Odysseus no longer sit on his shoulders. And may I no longer be called the father of Telemachus, if I do not lay hands on you and strip you of your garments, your cloak and your tunic, which cover up your shame, and send you away weeping to the swift ships when I have thrashed you out of the assembly with shameful blows. So he spoke, and with the staff beat Thersites on his back and shoulders he doubled up, and a huge tear fell from his eyes, and on his back a bloody wheel swelled up, raised by the blows of the golden staff. He sat down again, terrified and in pain, and with a helpless look wiped the tear away. But the rest, vexed though they were, laughed happily to see it, and this is what they would say, each man looking at his neighbor. Well, we know that Odysseus has done countless fine things, both leading us with good counsel and deploying us in battle. But this is by far the best thing he has done among the Argives, stopping this blustering and intemperate man speaking in the assembly. I do not think Thersite's proud spirit will ever again urge him to use such insulting words to pick fights with the kings. So spoke the mass of men, and now Odysseus, sacker of city, stood up, holding the staff, and by his side gray-eyed Athena in the likeness of a herald commanded the people to be silent so that the nearest and the furthest of the sons of the Achaeans might hear what he said and reflect on his advice. With generous intent he spoke out among them, Son of Atreus, Lord, it seems now that the Achaeans are minded to make you thoroughly disgraced among mortal men, and they will not fulfill the promise that they made to you on their voyage here from Argos, rearer of horses, that you would return home only after sacking Ilium of the strong walls. They are behaving like young children or widowed women, when they start wailing to each other about their return home, clearly the battle toil discourages them, and so they want to go back. Even a man who spends one month apart from his wife will brood impatiently beside his many benched ship, which winter storms and swelling seas keep confined to the shore. But in our case, this is now the ninth circling year that we have remained here inactive. I do not therefore blame the Achaeans for their brooding impatience beside the curved ships, Yet it is surely a shameful thing to wait so long and return empty-handed. Be patient, my friend, and hold out for a time, and we will learn whether Calchas prophesies truly to us or not. What I shall now say we remember well in our minds, and you are all witnesses. Those whom the specters of death have not carried off. It seems like yesterday or the day before that the Achaean ships assembled at Alla, bringing ruin to Priam and to the Trojans, and we on sacred altars that surrounded a spring were sacrificing unblemished hecatombs to the immortals under a beautiful plane tree from which bright water flowed. When a momentous sign appeared, a snake with a blood-red back, hideous, that the Olympian himself had dispatched into the light, slithered out from under the altar and made for the plane tree. Now in this were some sparrows' fledglings, infant children, on the topmost branch, cowering under the leaves, eight of them, and the mother who bore them made nine. The snake swallowed them down, all squeaking piteously, and their mother fluttered about them, lamenting her dear brood, and as she cried over them it coiled itself up and caught her by the wing. But when it had devoured the sparrow's children and their mother, the god who had caused it to appear made it into a clear sign. The son of crooked scheming Cronus turned it to stone, and we stood there in amazement at what had happened. When this dreadful prodigy had interrupted the god's hecatombs, Calchas straightway interpreted it for us and spoke out. Why have you fallen silent, flowing hair to Kean? It is for us that Zeus the Counselor has revealed this great sign, late appearing and late in fulfillment, but its fame will never die. 
As this creature has devoured the children and the sparrow herself, eight of them, and the mother who bore them made nine, so shall we make war at Troy for that number of years. And in the tenth we shall take the city with its wide streets. So he spoke out, and all this has now been fulfilled. So come, stand firm where you are, all you well-grieved Achaeans, until such time as we take the great city of Priam. So he spoke, and the Argives gave a great yell, and the ships resounded loudly around to the shouts of the Achaeans, as they acclaimed the speech of godlike Odysseus. Then among them the horseman Gerenian Nestor spoke up, Come, come, truly, your speeches are like children's, infants, who know nothing of the business of war. What is now to become of our oaths, and the agreements we made? We may as well throw into the fire all men's counsels and stratagems, those libations of unmixed wine, and the right hands we trusted in. We are fighting with words, but to no purpose, and we cannot find a remedy, even though we have been here for a long time. Son of Atreus, you must hold your purpose unshaken, as before, and command the Argives in the harsh conflict, and leave these others to die, the one or two of the Achaeans who are plotting in secret, though it will all come to nothing, to go back to Argos before they find out about the promise of Zeus who wears the Aegis, whether it is false or not. I believe that the son of Cronus, the all-powerful, nodded assent to us on the day that the Argives boarded their swift traveling ships, bringing bloodshed and doom to the Trojan, when he flashed lightning on our right, showing us an auspicious sign. So let no one hurry to sail away towards his home until each man of you has slept with the wife of a Trojan, and has exacted vengeance for Helen's struggles and groans. But if anyone has an overwhelming desire to leave for home, let him merely touch his well-benched black ship, and in the sight of all he will meet death and destruction. Come, Lord, consider well and listen to the advice of another. Whatever I say to you, you should not cast it aside. Separate the army by tribes, and by clans, Agamemnon, so that clan may support clan and tribe may support tribe. If you do this, and if the Achaeans follow your order, you will find out the cowards among the leaders and people, and the brave men, because they will fight in their own companies. You will find, too, if it is by divine will that you fail to destroy the city, or because of men's cowardice and their ignorance of warfare. Then in answer Lord Agamemnon addressed him, Once again, old man, you far surpass the Achaean sons in debate. Father Zeus and Athena and Apollo, how I wish that I had ten counselors such as this man among the Achaeans. Then the city of Lord Priam would soon reel before us, when it has been captured and devastated by our hands. But Zeus, Cronus's aegis-wearing son, has brought me anguish, pitching me into disputes and quarrels that cannot be resolved. We fought, I and Achilles, for the sake of a girl, matching violent words, and I was the first to become angry, but if ever we can agree on one course of action. No longer will the Trojans' evil day be put off, not even for a short time. So go now and make your meal, and prepare for Era's warfare. Let each man take care to sharpen his spear and fettle his shield. Let each man take care to give their meal to his swift-footed horses. Let each man take care to inspect his chariot well and prepare for war, so that all day long we may join in the judgment of hateful Ares. There will certainly be no intervening respite, not even a little, until the coming of night brings men's fury to judgment. Sweat will cover the strap across his chest of each man's body, protecting shield, and the hand on his spear will grow weary, and sweat will cover each man's horse as it strains at the polished chariot. And if I chance to see anyone attempting to hang back from the battle by the beaked ships, there will be no sure way for him thereafter to escape the dogs and vultures. So he spoke and the Argives gave a great roar, like a wave churned up by the south wind's onset, falling onto a steep shore against a jutting rock that the breakers, driven by winds from every quarter, never leave, but come at it from every side. They rose quickly to their feet and scattered to their ships, and lit fire, everyone in his own hut, and ate their meal. Each man sacrificed to one of the gods who live forever, praying that he would escape death and the grind of Era's warfare. But Agamemnon, lord of men, sacrificed a bull, a fat five-year-old, to the all-powerful son of Cronus, and summoned the elder, chieftains of the whole Achaean force. Nestor came first of all, and the lord Idomeneus, then the pair called Ajax and the son of Tydia, then sixth came Odysseus, the equal of Zeus in scheming. Uninvited came Menelaus, master of the war cry, for he knew in his heart how troubled his brother was. 
they stood around the bull and lifted up the barley grains, and among them Lord Agamemnon spoke in prayer. Mightiest, most glorious Zeus of the dark cloud, dwelling in the upper air, grant that before the sun sets and darkness comes I shall hurl the palace of Priam down headlong, blackened in smoke, and burn its doors with ravaging fire, and that I shall rip Hector's tunic into tatters on his chest, slashed by the bronze, and may great numbers of his companions fall face forward on the earth, biting the ground with their teeth. So he spoke, but the son of Cronus did not yet fulfill his prayer. He accepted the sacrifice, but prolonged their miserable toil. Now when they had prayed and sprinkled the barley grain, first they pulled back the bull's head, slit its throat and flayed it, then cut away the thigh bones and wrapped them in fat, covering them above and below, and laid raw hunks of meat on them. These they laid on to billets of dead wood and burnt them, then spitted the entrails and held them over Hephaestus's fire. When the thigh bones were burnt up and they had tasted the entrail, they chopped the rest of the meat small and threaded it on skewers and cooked it with great care and then drew it all off. When they had finished their work and made the meal ready, they feasted and no one's heart lacked a fair share in the meat. But once they had put from themselves the desire for food and drink, among them the horseman Gerenian Nestor began to speak. Most glorious son of Atreus, Agamemnon, lord of men, let us not spend more time conversing, nor any longer postpone the work which a god is putting into our hands. Come now, let the heralds of the bronze-shirted Achaeans make a proclamation and assemble the people by ships, and let us go together as we are throughout the broad camp of the Achaeans, so that we may quickly stir up bitter airs. So he spoke, and Agamemnon, lord of men, did not disobey him. Immediately he ordered the clear-voiced heralds to make a proclamation, calling the flowing-haired Achaeans to war. So they made their proclamation, and the men gathered very quickly. Then Atreus's son, and with him the kings, nurtured by Zeus, busily mustered the army, and in their midst was gray-eyed Athena, holding the precious Aegis, ageless and immortal, from which fluttered a hundred tassels, all golden, all of them skillfully woven each worth a hundred oxen. Holding this, she darted swiftly in and out of the Achaean people, provoking them to action. And in each man she stirred up strength in his heart to engage in the war and fight without ceasing. And so then war became sweeter to them than a return in their hollow ships to their dear native land. As when devastating fire blazes through an enormous forest on a mountain peak, and its glare is seen from afar. So as they marched the glitter from the stupendous mass of bronze flashed all around through the upper air and reached the high sky. As the numerous companies of winged birds, geese or cranes or swans with their long necks, gather on the Asian water meadow by the streams of Castor, and soar this way and that, exulting in their wing, and settle with a clamor. And the meadow resounds with their cries. So the army's numerous companies poured out from ships and huts on to the plain of Scamander and the ground under the feet of men and horses gave back a terrifying sound. They took their stand on the flowery plain of Scamander, numberless as the leaves and flowers that appear in spring, as many as the numerous companies of swarming flies that swarm about the sheepfold of a herdsman in the season of spring, when pails brim with milk. So many were the flowing-haired Achaeans facing the Trojans and taking their stand on the plain, raging to break them utterly. And just as gothards easily separate their far-wandering flocks of goats when they have become mixed up in the pasture, so the commanders mustered their men on this side and on that, ready for the conflict. And in their midst was Lord Agamemnon, his gaze and head like Zeus who delights in the thunderbolt, in girth like Ares, and with the chest of Poseidon. Just like an ox which far surpasses all the rest of a herd, a bull, which stands out among the cattle gathered round it, even so Zeus made the son of Atreus on that day, conspicuous in the soldiery, preeminent among the heroes. Tell me now, muses who have your homes on Olympus, for you are goddesses, and are present, and know everything, while we hear only rumor, and know nothing, who were the commanders and princes of the Danans. As for the soldiery, I could not describe or name them, not even if I had ten tongues and ten mouths, an indestructible voice, and a bronze heart within me unless the muses of Olympus, daughters of Aegis wearing Zeus, were to recount all those who came to besiege Ilium. So I shall relate the ship's captains and the number of their ships. Of the Boeotians, Penelios and Letus were their captains, and Arcesilaus and Prothoner and Clonius. These were the men who lived in Hyria and Rocky Aulus, Shonus 
and Scolus and Etionus with its many peaks, Thespea, Graea, and Mycalesis of the wide dancing places, and who occupied Harma and Ilesium and Erythrae, and those who possessed Elion and Hyle and Petion, Ocalia and the well-built fortress of Medio, Cope, Eutrasis, and Thisbe rich in doves, and those who lived around Coronea and Grassy Haliartus, those who inhabited Plataea and who lived in Glacia, those who possessed Lower Thebes, that well-built fortress, and sacred on Chester, Poseidon's splendid grove, and who inhabited Arn, rich in vines, and who held Medea and sacred Nisa and Anthedon on the far border. Of these people, fifty ships had come, and in each one hundred and twenty young Boeotians had embarked. Those who lived in Aspledon and Minion or Chominus were led by Escalaphus and Ialmenus, sons of Era, whom Astyosh bore in the house of Actor, Azeus's son, to mighty Ares, a modest virgin. She went up to her chamber, and there the powerful god lay with her in secret. Under these was marshaled a fleet of thirty hollow ships. The captains of the Phocians were Scedius and Epistropha, sons of Ephitus, the great-hearted son of Nobilus. These were the men who held Cyparissus and Rocky Pytha, sacred Cresa, and Daulis and Panopeus, and those who occupied Anamoria and Hyampolis, and those whose homes were by the bright river Cephasus, and those who inhabited Laleia next to the springs of Cephasus. They were accompanied by forty black ships. Their captains ordered the ranks of the Phocians and stationed them on the left flank, close to the Boeotians. The Locrians were commanded by Oleus's son, Swift Ijax, the lesser one, not as huge as Ijax, son of Telamon, but much smaller. He was of slight build and wore a linen jerkin, but he far excelled all the Hellenes and Achaeans with the spear. These were the men who lived in Sinus and Opus and Caliaris, in Bessa and Scarfin, in lovely Orgea, Tarfi and Thronia, and the land around Boagrius water. Accompanying Ijax came forty black ships of the Locrians who live opposite sacred Euboea. As for the fury-breathing Abante, who held Euboea, Chalcis and Eretria and Histiaea, rich in vines, Cerinthus next to the sea, and the steep fortress of Dios. Those who inhabited Charistus and those who lived in Styra, these in their turn were commanded by Elephanor, a shoot of Era, son of Chalcodon, captain of the great-hearted Abantis. With him came the swift Abantis, their hair streaming behind them, spearmen raging with their outthrust ash shafts to tear through the corslets on their enemies' chests. Accompanying Elephanor came forty black ships. Then there were those who lived in Athens, a well-built city, the people of great-hearted Erechtheus, whom long ago Athena Zeus's daughter nurtured. After the grain-giving earth had borne him, and established him in Athens, in her own rich temple, and there with an offering of bulls and rams the young men of the Athenians appease him in each year's wheeling course. These in their turn were commanded by Menestius, Pedius's son. No man had yet been born upon earth who was his equal in the deployment of chariots and shield-bearing men. Only Nestor could rival him, since he was from an older time. Accompanying Menestius came fifty black ships. Ajax brought twelve ships from Salamis, and stationed them where the Athenians' troops were deployed. As for those who inhabited Argos and fortified Tyrans, Hermione and Essene which lie on the deep gulf, Troezen and Ione, and vine-bearing Epidorus, and those young Achaean men who held Aegina and Maces, they in their turn were led by Diomedes, master of the war cry, and Sanilus, dear son of far-famed Capaneus. Third with them came Euryalus, a man resembling the gods, son of Mesistius the king, who was the son of Talaus. Diomedes, master of the war cry, commanded the whole force, and accompanying them came eighty black ships. As for those who inhabited the well-built city of Mycenae, wealthy Corinth and well-built Cleona, and who lived in Ornea and lovely Araithyria and Sicyon, where Adrestus was the first king, and those who inhabited Hyperese and steep Ganossa and Pelene, and had their home in Aegean and all the coastal strip of Aegeala, and broad Helis. The captain of their hundred ships was Agamemnon, son of Atreus, and with him came by far the most numerous and best men. He stood in their midst, armed in flashing bronze, exulting, conspicuous among all the heroes because he was the best, and brought by far the largest army. As for those who lived in low-lying Lacedaemon, riven by gorges, in Pharis and Sparta and Messerich in doves, and who lived in Brysiae and lovely Orge, and those who held Amyclae and the maritime fortress of Helus, and who possessed Laos and lived around Oatalus, 
These and their sixty ships were commanded by his brother, Menelaus, master of the war cry. They were stationed apart, and he moved among them, drawing strength from his passion, urging them on to battle. Most of all, he desired in his heart to exact vengeance for Helen's struggles and groans. As for those who lived in Pylos and lovely Arene, three on where Alpheus is forded, and well-built Ape, and whose home was Cyperesses and Amphigenia, Tellius and Hillus and Doria, where the muses met Thamiris the Thracian on his way from Oechalia, from the house of Eurydice the Oechalian, and ended his singing, because he boasted that he would win the prize, even if the muses themselves, daughters of Aegis wearing Zeus, were to sing. In their anger they mutilated him, and took away his marvelous gift of singing, and made him forget his lyre-playing art. Of these the commander was the horseman, Gerenian Nestor, and with him were mustered ninety hollow ships. As for those who held Arcadia, under Cilene's steep mountain, near the tomb of Apidus where men fight hand to hand, and those who lived in Phineas and Orchomenus, rich in flocks, ripe and strati and anispi, swept by winds, and those who possessed Tegea and lovely Mantinia, and those who possessed Stymphalus, and who lived in Paras, these were commanded by the son of Ancaeus, Lord Agapeno, with sixty ships. And in each ship, many men of Arcadia skilled in warfare had embarked. Atreus's son Agamemnon, lord of men, had himself given them well-benched ships to cross the wine-faced open sea, since they had no knowledge of seafaring matters. As for those who lived in Buprasium and glorious Aeolus, all the land that Hermine and Mersinus on the far borders and the rock of Olinus and Elysian enclose between them. Of these there were four captains, and each man was accompanied by ten swift ships, and many Apeans had embarked on them. Some were commanded by Ampimachus and Thalpius, one a son of Tietus and the other of Eurydice, both of Actor's family. Diores, the mighty son of Amarincius, was captain of the third, and godlike Polyxenus was captain of the fourth division the son of King Agasthenes, who was the son of Augea. As for those from Dulichium and the sacred Echinean island, who live across the sea opposite Aeolus, these were commanded by Mega, the equal of Ares, Phileus' son, whom the horseman Phileus, dear to Zeus, fathered. He had long ago quarreled with his father and migrated to Dulichium. Accompanying him came forty black ships. Odysseus led the great-spirited Cephalenians, who held Ithaca and Neritum with its trembling leaves, and lived in Crocelea and rugged Ageleps, and those who possessed Zakynthos and inhabited Samos, and those who possessed the mainland and the coast opposite. Of these the captain was Odysseus, the equal of Zeus in scheming. Accompanying him came twelve ships with red-painted prose. Thoas, son of Andrema, commanded the Aetolians who occupied Pleuron and Olinus and Pylene, Chalcis that lies on the coast, and rocky Caledon. The sons of great-hearted Oeneus were no longer alive nor Oenius himself, and fair-haired Meliger was dead, to whom all power had been entrusted to rule over the Aetolians. Accompanying him came forty black ships. The Cretans' commander was Idomeneus, famed with the spear. They possessed Knossus and fortified Gordon, Lictus and Miletus, and Lycistus with its chalk cliff, and Phaestus and Rysha, well-populated cities. And there were other men, who lived in Crete of the hundred cities. Of all these Idomeneus, famed with the spear, was commander, and with him Meriona, the equal of Inelius, killer of men. Accompanying them came eighty black ships. Topolemus, the valiant and mighty son of Heracles, brought from Rhodes nine ships of proud Rhodians, who lived on Rhodes in three separate settlements, Lindos and Ialysis and Camiris with its chalk cliffs. Their commander was Tlepolemus, famed with the spear, whom Astioche bore to mighty Heracles, when he had carried her off from Ephyr, from the river Cells, after sacking many cities of strong young men, nurtured by Zeus. Now when Tlepolemus had grown up in their well-built house, he soon afterwards killed his father's maternal uncle, the Simonus, a shoot of errors, who was now an old man. At once he built some ships, and assembling a great company fled away across the sea, because the other sons and grandsons of mighty Heracles had threatened him. After many wanderings and hardships he came to Rhodes, and his men settled there by tribes in a threefold division, and were loved by Zeus, who rules over both gods and men. And the son of Cronus showered them with astounding wealth. Nereus brought three well-balanced ships from Syme, Nereus, the son of Aglaea, and Lord Charapus Nerea, 
who was the handsomest man of all the Danans who came to besiege Ilium, excepting the blameless son of Peleus, but he was a feeble man, and few people came with him. As for those who possessed Nisiros, Krapathos, and Kassos, and Tsios, city of Eurypylus, and the Calydnian Islands, these men were commanded by Phidippus and Antiphus, the two sons of King Thessalus, the son of Heracles, and with them were mustered thirty hollow ships. Now all those whose home was Palatian Argos, and those who lived in Alus and Alope, and those from Trachis, and those who possessed Phaea and Hellas of beautiful women, and were called Myrmidons and Hellenes and Achaeans, the captain of their fifty ships was Achilles. But they had no thought for war's hideous clamor, because there was no one to lead them in the battle line. Glorious, swift-footed Achilles was lying among the ships, angry over the girl. Briseis's daughter of the beautiful hair, whom he had chosen from Lernessus' spoils after much labor, when he had sacked Lernessus in the walls of Thebe, and had struck down mines and Epistrophus, famous spearmen, who were the sons of King Euenus, son of Selipus. And so he lay there, grieving for her, but he was soon to rise again. As for those who possessed Phales and flowery Pyrrhus, the precinct of Demeter, and Iton, mother of flocks, Antron by the sea, and Telius with its beds of grass, these were commanded by warlike Protesilas while he was alive, but now the black earth held him below. His wife was left behind in Phyllis, tearing her cheeks in grief, in a half-built house. One of Dardanus's people killed him as he leapt from his ship, the very first of the Achaeans. Even so, they were not leaderless, though they yearned for their captain. Podarses, a shoot of Ares, was their marsh, Iphicles' son, who was himself the son of Philicus rich in flock and he was full brother to great-hearted Protesilaus, and older than him in years. But the hero warlike Protesilaus was the better man, and more skilled in war. His people did not lack a leader, though they longed for this fine man. Accompanying Podarses came forty black ships. As for those who lived around Ferre beside Lake Bobe, in Bobi and Glaphere and well-built Iolcus, the captain of their eleven ships was Admetus' dear son, Eumelus, born to him by Alcesta bright among women, the most beautiful of the daughters of Peleus. As for those who lived in Methony and Thaumachi and possessed Meliboea and rugged Olazon, their captain was the skilled archer Philoctete, in charge of seven ships, in each of them fifty rowers had embarked, well skilled in fighting strongly with their bows. But he was lying on an island, enduring cruel agony, on sacred Lemnos, where the Achaean sons had left him, suffering from the foul wound of a deadly water snake. There he lay in torment, but the Argives would soon turn their minds to Lord Philoctetes beside their ships. Even so, his men were not leaderless, though they longed for their captain. Medoth, the bastard son of Oleus, was their marshal, he whom Reen had borne to Oleus, sacker of city. As for those who possessed Trixi and Cragiathon, and those who held Oecalia, city of Oecalia and Eurydice, these men were commanded by the two sons of Asclepia, excellent healers both, Podalirius and Mashan and with them were mustered thirty hollow ships. Those who possessed Ormenion and the spring Hyperea, and those who possessed Asterion and Titanus's white peaks, were led by Eurypolis, the splendid son of Euemo. Accompanying him came forty black ships. As for those who possessed Argissa and lived in Girton, in Orth, and the city of Alone and White Olosan, they were commanded by Polypoet, steadfast in war, the son of Pyrrhitha, who was fathered by immortal Zeus, Renowned Hippodamea had borne him to Pyrrhus on the day that he took his revenge on the hairy centaurs and expelled them from Pelion as far as the Aethesis land. He was not alone, but with him came Leontes, a shoot of Ares, son of high-hearted Coronis, himself the son of Cinea. Accompanying them came forty black ships. Gunius brought twenty-two ships from Cyphus. Following him were the Inianes and the Parabi, steadfast in war, who made their homes around Dodona where winters are harsh, and by those who worked the land around lovely Titeresus, which pours out its beautiful waters into the Paneas, though it does not mingle with silver eddying Paneas, but flows along on its surface like olive oil. It is a branch of the waters of Styx, dreadful river of oaths. Prothus, son of Tenthran, was captain of the Magnetes, who lived around Paneas and Pelion with its quivering leaves. The swift Prothus was their commander, and accompanying him came forty black ships, these then were the leaders and commanders of the Danans. Now tell me, Muse, who was the most outstanding of those who followed Atreus's sons, 
both themselves and their horses. The finest horses belonged to the son of fear, now driven by Eumelus. They were swift as birds, and were alike in coats and age, their backs dead level measured by the rule. Apollo of the Silver Bow had raised them in Perea, both Meres, and they carried in them the terror of Ares. Of men, by far the best was Ajax, Telamon's son, so long as Achilles kept up his anger, but Achilles was much the strongest, as were the horses which carried Peleus's blameless son, but he was lying beside his curved sea-traversing ships, full of anger against Agamemnon, shepherd of the people, the son of Atreus, and his people were amusing themselves on the seashore by throwing the discus and javelin, and shooting with the bow, and each man's horses stood beside his chariot cropping clover and wild, marsh growing parsley, doing nothing. The chieftain's chariots stood well covered near their huts, while the men, yearning for their captain, loved by Ares, wandered up and down through the camp and did not fight. So the Achaeans marched on as if the whole earth were grazed by fire, and the ground under their feet groaned as if thunder-delighting Zeus was angry, as when he lashes the earth around Typhaeus in the land of the Arimi, where men say is Typhaeus' bed. Just so the earth groaned loudly under their feet as they marched, and very quickly they crossed the plain. Now to the Trojans a messenger came, wind-footed swift Iris, with a message for them, full of pain from Aegis-wearing Zeus. They were holding an assembly at Priam's gate, all gathered together, both the young and the old, and swift-footed Iris stood close to Priam and addressed him, likening her voice to that of Priam's son, Polite, who was the Trojans' lookout, and, trusting in his feet's speed, used to sit on top of the burial mound of ancient Aeshites, watching for when the Achaeans would attack from their ship. Assuming this man's likeness, swift-footed Iris addressed Priam. Old man, it is always your way to delight in endless speeches, just as before in times of peace, but now relentless war has arisen. I tell you, I have taken part in many battles of men, but never before have I seen such a host, nor one so numerous. More than anything, they are like leaves or grains of sand as they march, ready to fight, over the plain towards the city. Hector, to you especially I give this command, and you must carry it out. There are many allies throughout the great city of Priam, speaking different tongues, for they come from peoples spread over the earth. Let each one of these give orders to those he rules over, and let him marshal his countrymen and then lead them out. So she spoke, and Hector did not fail to recognize a goddess's voice, and quickly broke up the assembly. The Trojans rushed to arms, all the gates were opened, and the people streamed out, on foot and in chariots, and a great clamor arose. There is in front of the city a steep mound, set at some distance from it on the plain, with clear space around it, to which men give the name of Batia, but the immortals call it the burial mound of the dancer Myrene. There now the Trojans and their allies marshaled themselves. The Trojans' commander was great Hector of the glittering helmet, Priam's son, and with him were armed by far the best and most numerous people, raging to fight with their spears. The captain of Dardanus's people was the valiant son of Anchises, Aeneas, whom the goddess Aphrodite bore to Anchises, a goddess lying with a mortal on the slopes of Ida. He was not alone, but with him were the two sons of Antinor, Archelochus and Achima, well skilled in all the arts of battle. Those who inhabited Zillaia, under the lowest shoulder of Ida, wealthy men, who drank the black waters of Aesopus, called Troes. These were led by the splendid son of Lycon, Pandarus, to whom Apollo himself had given his bow. As for those who held Adrasteia and the land of Apasus, and possessed Pitea and the steep mountain of Terea, their captains were Adrestus and Amphius of the linen jerkin, the two sons of Merops from Percote, who above all men was skilled in seercraft. He tried to prevent his sons from going to man-destroying war, but they would not listen to him, for the specters of black death were leading them on. As for those who occupied Percote in practice, and possessed Cestus and Abidus and bright Arisbe. Their captain was Asius, son of Hyrtacus, marshal of the army, Asius, son of Hyrtacus, whom huge gleaming horses had brought from Arisbe, which is near the river Cells. Hippothus led the tribes of Pelasgians, famous spearmen, who had their home in Larissa of the rich soil. Their captains were Hippothus and Pelea, shoots of Eras, two sons of Pelasgian Lethus, who was himself the son of Teutamus, Akamas and the hero Pyrrhus were leaders of the Thracians, all those whose lands the strong flowing Hellespont encloses. Captain of the Siconian spearmen was Euphemus, 
son of Troazina, who was himself the son of Sia, nurtured by Zeus. Pyrachmes led the Paeonians with their curved bows from far off Amidon, by the broad flowing Axias, whose water is the most beautiful that flows over the earth. The Paphlagonians were led by hairy chested Pylaemonus, from the land of the Aeneti, home of a strain of wild mules. They possessed Citrus and inhabited Sesame, living in splendid houses around the river Parthenius and Crame and Aegialus and lofty Erythene. The Halazones' captains were Odius and Epistrophus from far off Alib, which is the birthplace of silver. The Mysians' leaders were Chromus and Anomus the bird seer, though bird lore could not save him from black doom. He was beaten down by the hands of Aeacus's swift footed grandson in the river, along with the other Trojans he cut down there. Forces and godlike Ascanius were leaders of the Phrygians from far off Ascani, and they were raging to fight in the crush of battle. The Myonians were commanded by Messels and Antifa, two sons of Talimenas, whom the lake Gigea bore. They led the Myonians, whose homeland was under Tamolus. Nasts commanded the Carians, who spoke a foreign tongue. They held Miletus and the thickly wooded Mount Thyres, and the waters of Myander and Mycale's steep peak. Their leaders were Ampimachus and Nasts, Nasts and Ampimacha, splendid sons of Nomia. Ampimachus came to the war wearing gold ornament, like a girl, the fool. They gave him no protection against miserable death when beaten down by the hands of Aeacus's swift-footed grandson. In the river, and war-minded Achilles carried off his goal. Sarpedon and blameless Glaucus were captains of the Lycian, who came from far off Lycia, beside the rolling Xantha. Book 3. Now when both sides had been marshaled with their leaders, the Trojans advanced, screeching and shouting like birds, as when the screech of cranes is heard in the high sky. When they have fled from winter's onset and prodigious rain, and screaming fly towards the streams of ocean, bringing death and destruction to the pygmy men, challenging them through the air to deadly conflict. But the Achaeans went on in silence, breathing fury, raging in their hearts to fight on each other's behalf. As when the south wind sheds a mist over mountain peaks, no friend to shepherds but for the thief better than night, when a man can see only as far as he can throw a stone. So under their feet a dense cloud of dust arose from the men as they marched, and very quickly they crossed the plain. When they had advanced to within close range of each other, from the Trojans Alexander, handsome as a god, came out to fight, wearing over his shoulder a leopard skin and a curved bow and a sword, shaking his two spears. Tipped with bronze, he issued a challenge to all the best men of the Argives to fight with him in grim conflict, matching strength to strength. When Menelaus, dear to Ares, caught sight of Alexander advancing with great strides in front of the soldiery, just as a lion exults when it lights upon a great corpse. Discovering an antlered stag or a wild goat, the lion is starving and devours it quickly, in case swift hounds and strong young men are on its trail. So Menelaus exulted when his eyes fell on Alexander. Handsome as a god, and thinking to avenge himself on the wrongdoer, he quickly leapt fully armed from his chariot to the ground. Now when Alexander, handsome as a god, saw him appear in the front ranks, his dear heart was shattered, and he withdrew into his companion's ranks to avoid the death specter. As when a man who has seen a snake in a mountain glen starts back, and a trembling seizes hold of his legs, and he jumps backwards and pallor grips his cheeks, so Alexander, handsome as a god, shrank back into the mass of proud Trojans, terrified by the son of Atreus. But when Hector saw him, he rebuked him with shaming words. Paris, disaster Paris, superbly beautiful, woman crazy seducer. I wish you had never been born, or had else died unmarried. Indeed, I would have preferred this, and it would have been far better for you than to be thus mocked and despised by others. How the flowing-haired Achaeans must laugh out loud, thinking that with us a chieftain becomes a champion only because he is handsome to look at, even if there is no strength or courage in his heart. Was this how you were when you sailed over the sea in your sea-traversing ships with a band of trusty companions, and lived among foreigners and carried off a beautiful woman from a distant land, kin of spearfighters as she was, to be a great affliction to your father, the city, and all the people, but a delight to your enemies and a disgrace to yourself? Can you really not stand up against Menelaus, dear to Ares? You would find out what kind of man he is whose lovely wife you keep, and then your lyre would be of no help to you, nor Aphrodite's gifts, nor your hair and beauty, when you roll in the dust's embrace. 
but the Trojans are great cowards. Otherwise, by now, you would be wearing a stone garment in return for all the misery you have caused. Then Alexander, handsome as a god, addressed him in turn. Hector, you reproach me deservedly, and not beyond my desert. Always your heart is like an axe which keeps its edge, and which cuts through a plank in the hands of a man who shapes ship timber with his skill. And it adds power to his stroke. Just so is the never-wavering heart in your breast. But do not throw the sensual gifts of golden Aphrodite in my face. Indeed, men should never spurn the gods' splendid gifts that they alone can bestow, and no man can have them by choice. But now, if you want me to engage in the battle and fight, make all the rest of the Trojans and Achaeans sit down and set me in the middle ground against Menelaus dear to Ares, to do battle for the sake of Helen and all her possessions, and whichever of us is victorious and proves the stronger. Let him fairly take all the possessions and the woman and carry them home. And let everyone else make a solemn truce and pledge friendship. So may you all live on in rich soiled Troy, and may they return to horse-rearing Argos and Achaia, home of beautiful women. So he spoke, and hearing his words Hector was greatly pleased, and went into the middle ground and forced back the Trojans' companies, gripping his spear in the middle. And they all sat down, but the flowing-haired Achaeans began to shoot at him making him their mark and trying to hit him with arrows and stones. Then the lord of men, Agamemnon, gave a great shout, Hold back, Argives, sons of the Achaean, do not shoot. Hector of the glittering helmet is impatient to tell us something. So he spoke, and they held back from the fighting and quickly fell silent. Then Hector addressed both the armies, Listen to me, Trojans and well-grieved Achaean, and hear the words of Alexander, on whose account this quarrel has arisen. His command is that all the rest of the Trojans and Achaeans should lay their fine armor on the earth that nourishes many, and that he and Menelaus, dear to Ares, should fight alone in the middle ground for the sake of Helen and all her possessions. Whichever of them is victorious and proves the stronger, let him fairly take all the possessions and the woman and carry them home. Let the rest of us make a solemn truce and pledge friendship. So he spoke, and they all remained silent and still. Then Menelaus, master of the war cry, addressed them. Listen now to me too, for it is my heart that chiefly feels this pain. I am minded that today the Argives and Trojans should go their separate ways, since you have suffered much because of my quarrel, and because of Alexander, who began it. Whichever one of us has death and his destiny in store for him, let him die, and the rest of you may quickly go your separate ways. Now bring two lambs, one white and the other black to be offered to earth and sun, and let us bring a third for Zeus. Bring mighty Priam out here, so that he can make a solemn truce in person. His sons are arrogant and unreliable, and he will make sure no one oversteps the mark and so wrecks the oath sworn by Zeus. Young men's minds are forever floating high in the air, but when an old man takes a hand he looks to the future and the past, and so the matter may be best concluded for both sides. So he spoke, and both Achaeans and Trojans were glad, since they hoped to put an end to the miseries of war. They held back their chariots in the ranks and jumped down from them, and took off their armor and laid it on the ground, close to one another, and there was little space between them. Hector sent two heralds off to the city, with orders to bring the lambs quickly and to summon Priam, and Lord Agamemnon sent Talthebius to go off to the hollow ships, and ordered him to fetch two lambs, and he did not disobey glorious Agamemnon. Now Iris came with a message to white-armed Helen, in the likeness of her husband's sister, the wife of Antenor's son, whom the Lord Helicon, the son of Antenor, had as his wife, Laodice, the most beautiful of the daughters of Priam. She found Helen in her hall. She was weaving a great web, a red double cloak, and on it she was working the struggles of the horse-breaking Trojans and the bronze-shirted Achaeans that they were undergoing for her sake at the hands of Aerith. Standing close to her swift-footed Iris addressed her, Come with me, dear bride, and witness the extraordinary deeds of the horse-breaking Trojans and the bronze-shirted Achaeans, those who before were waging tear-laden war on each other on the plain, and lusting after the deadly conflict, are now, look, seated in silence, and the fighting has stopped, they are leaning on their shields, and their long spears are stuck in the ground beside them. Alexander and Menelaus, dear to Ares, are about to fight over you with their long spear, and you will be famed as the dear wife of the one who wins. So the goddess spoke, and thrust into Helen's heart sweet longing for her former husband and her city and her parents, 
At once, she wrapped a white linen scarf round her head and hurried from her chamber, shedding a soft tear, not alone, but two women servants accompanied her, Aethri, daughter of Pythias, and Oxide Clymene. Quickly, they reached the place where the Scaean gates were. Those who attended Priya, Panthus, and Thymoates, Lampus, Clesius, and Hysotone, Shoot of Era, and Eucalagon and Antinor, both men of sound judgment, all elders of the people, these were sitting with him at the Scaean gates. Because of old age, they had given up warfare, but they were excellent speaker, like cicadas which perch on trees in a wood, singing away in their lily-like voices. Such were the leaders of the Trojan, as they sat on the tower. When they saw Helen making her way to the tower, they spoke softly to one another. In winged words, it is not a matter of blame that the Trojans and well-grieved Achaeans should suffer agonies for so long over such a woman. She is terribly like the immortal goddesses to look on. But for all her beauty, it is better for her to go away in their ships and not stay here as a future affliction for us and our children. So they spoke. But Priam raised his voice and called to Helen, Come he, dear child, and sit beside me, so that you can see your former husband, your kinsmen, and your friends. You are not to blame in my eyes. But the gods are to blame, who have stirred up tear-laden war for me with the Achaeans, and so that you can give a name to that monstrous man, that valiant and mighty Achaean, and tell me who he is. There are certainly others who are taller in stature, but I have never yet cast eyes on anyone as handsome as him, nor one so full of dignity. He looks like a kingly man. Then Helen, bright among women, answered him and said, Dear father-in-law, you deserve my respect and awe. Evil death should have been my choice when I came here with your son leaving my home and my family, my late-born daughter and the pleasant company of my friends. But that is not how it happened, and so I waste away in tears. Now I will tell you what you ask and question me about. That man is the son of Atreus, wide-ruling Agamemnon, both a noble king and a mighty spearman, and he was also my husband's brother, bitch-faced that I am, if this ever really happened. So she spoke, and the old man marveled at him, and said, Fortunate son of Atreus, child of good fortune, blessed by the gods, you have indeed many sons of the Achaeans under your sway. In time past I traveled to Phrygia, rich in vines, and there I saw a great many Phrygians, men with nimble horses, the peoples of Autrius and of godlike Migdon, who at that time were encamped along the banks of Sangarius. I was their ally, you see, and was numbered among them on the day that the Amazons came, who were a match for men. But not even they were as many as the darting-eyed Achaeans. Next, the old man's eyes fell on Odysseus, and he asked her, Come, tell me about this man too, dear child. Who is he? He is shorter in stature than Agamemnon, son of Atreus, but broader in the shoulders and chest to look upon. His armor is lying on the earth that nourishes many, but he is prowling along the ranks of men like a ram. I would say he was like a thick-fleeced ram that roams in and out of a huge flock of white sheep. Then in, answer Helen, daughter of Zeus, said to him, now that one is the son of Laertes, much scheming Odysseus, who was reared in the land of Ithaca, rugged though it is, and who is skilled in all kinds of trickery and cunning schemes. Then in his turn sagacious Antenor addressed her, Lady, what you have said is indeed quite true. Glorious Odysseus has been here before, some time ago with Menelau, dear to Ares, on a mission concerning you. I received them as guest friends and welcomed them in my hall, and I came to know the appearance of both and their clever schemes. When they mingled with the Trojans in their assembly and all were standing, broad-shouldered Menelaus was the taller, and when both were sitting Odysseus was the more dignified. But when they began to weave their cunning speeches before us all, Menelaus for his part spoke with a rapid fluency, briefly but very clearly, not being a man of many words, nor stumbling in speech, and indeed he was the younger man, but whenever much scheming Odysseus leapt to his feet, he would stand there and look down, eyes fixed on the ground, not waving the staff backwards and forwards, but holding it stiffly. Like a man who did not know what to do, you would take him for a surly person, a genuine fool. But when he released his great voice from inside his chest, speaking words like flakes of snow falling in winter, then no other mortal could compete with Odysseus and we were no longer so surprised at the sight of him. The third man whom the old man saw was Ajax, and he asked, Who is that other Achaean, a valiant and mighty man, 
whose head and broad shoulders stand out above the Argives. Then long-robed Helen, bright among women, answered, That is the massive Ajax, bulwark of the Achaeans. And on the other side, among the Cretans, stands Idomeneus, like a god, and around him are gathered the Cretan captains. Many times Menelaus, dear to Ares, entertained him in our house whenever Idomeneus came from Crete. And now I can see all the other darting-eyed Achaeans, whom I could easily recognize and name for you. But there are two marshals of the peoples I cannot see, horse-breaking Castor and Polydeuces the skillful boxer, full brothers of mine, born to the same mother as me. Either they did not accompany the army from lovely Lacedema, or they did come here in their sea-traversing ships, but are now reluctant to enter the battle of men, made uneasy by my disgrace and the many insults against me. So she spoke, but the life-giving earth already held them back home in Lacedemo, in their dear native land. Now heralds were bringing offerings to the gods throughout the city, to ratify the treaty, two lambs and cheering wine, fruit of the earth, in a goatskin bag, and Idaeus the herald brought a shining mixing bowl and wine cups, made of gold, and standing next to the old man Priam he roused him, saying, Up now, son of Laomedon, the chieftains of the Trojan horsebreakers and the bronze-shirted Achaeans are calling you to go down onto the plain, to make a solemn truce. Alexander and Menelaus, dear to Ares, are about to fight for the woman's sake with their long spears. The woman and her possessions will go to the one who wins, and the rest of us will make a solemn truce and pledge friendship, we to live on in rich-soiled Troy, and they to return to horse-rearing Argos and Achaea, home of beautiful women. So he spoke, and the old man shuddered, and told his companions to yoke the horses, and they quickly obeyed his order. Priam mounted the chariot and pulled back on the reins, and Antenor climbed into the finely made chariot beside him, and they drove the swift horses through the Scaean gates on to the plain. When they reached the assembled Trojans and Achaeans, they got down from the chariot to the earth that nourishes many and strode to the middle ground between the Trojans and Achaeans. Immediately Agamemnon, lord of men, rose to his feet, and with him much scheming Odysseus. Excellent heralds drove the solemn truce offerings together, and mixed wine in a bowl, and poured water over the king's hands. Then the son of Atreus with his hand drew the knife that always hung next to his sword's great scabbard, and cut hairs from the lamb's heads, and the heralds distributed these among the Trojan and Achaean chieftains. Then Atreus's son prayed in a loud voice, holding up his hands, Father Zeus, ruling from Mount Ida, greatest and most glorious, and you, son, who sees all things and hears all things, rivers and earth, and you too who below the earth punish men who have died, if any have sworn false oaths, be witnesses, and see that these solemn oaths are kept. If it should happen that Alexander kills Menelaus, then let him keep Helen for himself, and all her possessions, and let us return home in our sea-traversing ship. But if fair-haired Menelaus should kill Alexander, then the Trojans must give back Helen and all her possession, and must pay the Argaves the compensation that is proper and recognized as such, even by generations in time to come. But if Priam and the sons of Priam are unwilling to pay me compensation when Alexander has fallen, then I shall fight on after that to secure reparation and I shall stay here until I reach the end of the war. So he spoke, and slit the lambs' throats with the pitiless bronze. He laid them on the ground, gasping as their life ebbed away, for the bronze had taken away their strength. Then they drew the wine from the mixing bowl into cups and poured it out, and prayed to the gods who live forever. And this is what one of the Trojans or Achaeans would say, Zeus, greatest and most glorious, and all you other gods, whichever side is the first to violate these oaths, May their brains be poured out on the ground as this wine is, theirs and their children's, and may their wives be mastered by strangers. So they spoke. But the son of Cronus did not yet fulfill their prayers. And among them Priam of the line of Dardanus spoke, saying, Listen to me, Trojans and well-grieved Achaeans, I am now going back to Troy that is swept by the wind, since I cannot bring myself to see my dear son doing battle before my eyes with Menelaus, dear to Ares. Zeus doubtless knows, as do the other immortal gods, for which of the two the end of death has been appointed. So the godlike man spoke, and laid the lambs in his chariot, then mounted himself, and pulled back on the reins, and Antenor climbed into the finely made chariot beside him. So the two of them went on their way, back towards Ilium. But Hector, the son of Priam, and glorious Odysseus first measured out the ground, 
and after that took two lots and shook them in a bronze helmet, to see which man should throw his bronze-tipped spear first. And the peoples prayed, and held up their hands to the gods, and this is what one of the Achaeans or Trojans would say. Father Zeus, ruling from Mount Ida, greatest and most glorious, whoever it was who brought these troubles on to both sides, grant that he may die and go below into the house of Hades but grant too that we may enjoy friendship and a solemn truce. So they spoke, and great Hector of the glittering helmet shook the lots, looking away, and the lot of Paris quickly leapt out. Then they all sat down in rank, in the place where each one's high-stepping horses and finely worked armor lay. Then that man put his fine armor on over his shoulders, glorious Alexander, husband of Helen of the beautiful hair. First of all he fastened greaves around his shin, splendid ones, fitted with silver ankle pieces. Then over his chest he put on a corslet which belonged to his brother Lycon, and it fitted him equally as well. Around his shoulders he threw his silver riveted sword, made of bronze, and after that his huge, massive shield. On his powerful head he set a well-made helmet with a horsetail crest, and the plume nodded terribly above him. Then he chose a stout spear, which fitted his grasp, and in the same way Menelaus, dear to Ares, put on his armor. So when they were armed among the soldiery on either side, they strode into the middle ground between Trojans and Achaeans, glaring grimly at each other, and amazement gripped the onlookers, both horse-breaking Trojans and well-grieved Achaeans. They took their stand near each other on the measured ground, shaking their spears and full of rage at each other. Alexander was the first to throw his far-shadowing spear, and it hit the perfectly balanced shield of Atreus's son, but the spear did not shatter it, for its bronze point was bent back on the mighty shield. Then Menelaus, Atreus's son, stood up ready to throw the bronze and made a prayer to Father Zeus. Lord Zeus, grant me revenge on the man who wronged me at the start, glorious Alexander, and beat him down under my hands, so that among later generations too a man may shudder to think of wronging the host who has offered him friendship. So he spoke and poised his long shadowing spear and threw it and it hit the perfectly balanced shield of Priam's son. The massive spear passed through the shining shield and drove through the intricately worked corslet, going straight on to cut through the tunic next to his ribs. But Paris leaned aside and avoided the black death specter. Then the son of Atreus drew his silver riveted sword and swinging his arm high, struck the other's helmet plate, but there the sword shattered into three or four pieces and fell from his hand. Atreus's son gazed up at the broad high sky and cried out, Father Zeus, there is no one who causes more mischief than you. Truly, I thought I had taken revenge on Alexander for his villainy, but instead my sword is broken in my hands, and my spear sped uselessly from my hand, and I did not strike him down. So he spoke, and sprang and seized Paris by the horsehair-crested helmet, and swinging him round began to drag him towards the well-grieved Achaeans. Paris was being choked by the embroidered strap at his soft throat, which was drawn tight under his chin to secure his helmet, and now Menelaus would have dragged him away, winning immense glory. Had not Aphrodite, daughter of Zeus, been sharp enough to see it, and broken the strap that was made from a slaughtered ox's hide, the helmet came away empty in Menelaus's brawny hand, and the hero whirled it round his head and flung it among the well-grieved Achaeans, and his trusty companions retrieved it, then he leapt back towards Paris, raging to kill him with his bronze-tipped spear. But Aphrodite snatched Paris away very easily, as a god will do, wrapping him in a dense mist, and set him down in his fragrantly perfumed chamber. She herself went off to summon Helen, and found her on the high tower, with a large group of Trojan women around her. Grasping Helen's nectar-scented veil in her hand, she pulled it and spoke to her, likening herself to a woman of many years, a wool comber who when Helen lived in Lacedaemon used to work fine wool, and Helen loved her very much. In the likeness of this woman, bright Aphrodite addressed her. Come with me. Alexander is calling for you to return home. There he is in his chamber, on the spiral-decorated bed, glowing in his beauty and clothing. You would not think he had come from fighting with someone, but was going to the dance, or had just returned and was sitting down to rest. So she spoke, and quickened Helen's heart within her breast and when she recognized the goddess's beautiful neck, her desirable breasts and her bright sparkling eyes, she was amazed and spoke to her, saying, Lady, why are you so anxious to lead me astray like this? Are you intending to take me away to some well-populated city, 
to somewhere in Phrygia or lovely Maonia, where there is perhaps some other mortal man who is dear to you? Or is it because Menelaus has overcome glorious Alexander and wishes to take me, loathed woman, to his home, that you now stand beside me here with guile in your heart? Well, go and sit beside him yourself, and forsake the path of the gods, and never set your feet again on Olympus, but all the time suffer on his behalf and wait on him, until such time as he makes you his wife, or even his slave. As for me, I will not go there to serve that man's bed, for that would bring blame on me. All future Trojan women will despise me, and I already have grief enough in my heart. At this bright Aphrodite became enraged and addressed her, Do not provoke me, obstinate woman, or I may grow angry and desert you, and come to hate you as violently as now I love you. I may well plan some fatal enmity between the two sides, Trojans and Danan, and then you will die a wretched death. So she spoke, and Helen, daughter of Zeus, was afraid, and went away, covering her face with her shining white veil, in silence. And no Trojan woman saw her. A divinity guided her. When they reached the splendid house of Alexander, the women servants at once turned to their tasks, while she, bright among women, went to her high-roofed chamber. Then the goddess Aphrodite, who loves to smile, brought a chair and placed it for her opposite Alexander, and Helen, daughter of Zeus the Aegis-wearer, took her seat on it, and turning her eyes away from him, spoke sharply to her husband. So you have returned from the fighting. I wish you had died there, beaten down by the mighty man who was my husband before you. There was a time when you would boast that you were a better man than Menelaus, dear to Ares, in strength of arm and with the spear. So go now, make your challenge to Menelaus, dear to Ares, to fight you once again, face to face. But no, I advise you to hold back, and not to match your strength recklessly with fair-haired Menelaus in battle or in the fighting because you may be quickly beaten down by his spear. Then Paris answered and addressed her with these words, Wife, do not attack my heart with these harsh taunts. Yes, this time Menelaus defeated me, with Athena's help, but another time I shall defeat him. We too have gods on our side. Come now, let us go to bed and find delight in love. Never before has desire enveloped my senses like this. Not even when I first stole you away from lovely Lacedaemon and sailed away in my sea-traversing ships, and on the island Krana I took you to bed and made love to you. That is how I now desire you. And sweet longing takes hold of me. So he spoke, and led the way to the bed, and his wife went with him. And so the two of them lay together on the fretted bed. But Atreus's son prowled among the soldiery like a wild beast, hoping to catch sight of Alexander, handsome as a god. But no man of the Trojans or of their far-famed allies could point Alexander out to Menelau, dear to Ares. Certainly they would not have hidden him out of love, if anyone had seen him, since they all hated him like the black death specter. Then Agamemnon, lord of men, spoke among them. Listen to me, Trojans and Dardanians and allies, since the victory clearly belongs to Menelaus, dear to Ares, you must give back our give Helen, and her possessions along with her, and must pay the compensation that is proper and recognized as such, even by generations in time to come. So spoke Atreus' son and the rest of the Achaeans applauded him. Book 4 Now the gods were sitting beside Zeus, gathered in assembly on a golden floor, and in their midst lady Hebe served them with nectar, and they pledged each other in golden cups, looking out towards the city of the Trojans. Then the son of Cronus tried to provoke Hera with taunting words, speaking out with a hidden purpose. Menelaus has a pair of goddesses to support him. Hera of Argos and Athena of Alakamini, and yet they are sitting here as onlookers, leaving him alone and enjoying the spectacle. While Aphrodite, who loves to smile, stands always beside Paris, keeping away death specters, and just now she saved him when he thought he would die. Even so, the victory clearly belongs to Menelaus, dear to Ares, so let us consider how these things should be done. Whether we should again stir up destructive war and grim conflict, or bring both sides together in friendship. If this second way proves pleasing and welcome to all, then the city of Lord Priam could continue to thrive, and Menelaus could take Argive Helen home again. So he spoke, and Athena and Hera muttered to each other. They were sitting close together, plotting misery for the Trojans. Athena was silent, and did not say a word, feeling resentful towards Father Zeus, and harsh bitterness gripped her, but Hera's breast could not contain her anger. And she addressed him, most dread son of Cronus, 
what is this that you have said? How can you expect my toil to count for nothing, unfulfilled, the sweat that I poured painfully out, and my horse's wariness as I was gathering a force to bring misery to Priam and his sons? Do as you will, but I tell you, we other gods will not all approve. Then, deeply angered, Zeus the cloud gatherer answered her, You are possessed. How have Priam and the sons of Priam done you such great wrong that you rage so relentlessly to tear Ilium apart, that well-built city, only if you were to enter its gates and long walls yourself, and to eat the raw flesh of Priam and the sons of Priam and the rest of the Trojans, would you perhaps satisfy your anger? Do as you will. I would not want this quarrel to become a great conflict between the two of us in time to come, but I tell you another thing, and you should store it in your mind. Whenever it is my passionate desire to destroy a city and I choose one inhabited by men who are dear to you, do not try to thwart my anger, but leave me to do as I will. I give way to you in this willingly, though with an unwilling heart, because of all the cities under the sun and the starry high sky that are inhabited by men who live on the earth. The most prized in my heart was always sacred Ilium, and Priam and the people of Priam of the fine ash spear. Never has my altar lacked a fair share of the feast, of drink offerings and the savor of burnt flesh, which is our privilege. Then the Lady Oxide Hera answered him, There are three cities which are by far the dearest to me, Argos and Sparta and Mycenae of the wide street, and these you may sack, whenever they incur your heart's hatred. I shall certainly not stand in your way, nor grudge them to you, for if I was resentful and stopped you destroying them I would gain nothing by it, since you are far stronger than me but you must not allow my labor to come to nothing, since I too am divine and my ancestry is the same as yours, and I am the most honored of crooked scheming Cronus's children, in two ways, through my birth, and because I am renowned as your wife, and you are lord of all the immortals. So, let us give way to each other in this matter, I to you and you to me, and the rest of the immortal gods will follow us. Command Athena immediately to enter the grim conflict between Trojans and Achaeans, Tell her to try to ensure that the Trojans are the first to give offense to the far-famed Achaeans by breaking their oaths. So she spoke, and the father of gods and men did not disobey her, but immediately addressed Athena with winged words. Go as fast as you can to the Trojan and Achaean camps, and try to ensure that the Trojans are the first to give offense to the far-famed Achaeans by breaking their oaths. So speaking, he roused Athena, who was already eager to go, and she went swooping down from the peaks of Olympus. Just as a meteor that the son of crooked scheming Cronus sends as a portent to sailors or to a people's broad encampment, a bright star, and a shower of sparks shoots out from it. So Pallas Athena swooped down to earth and sprang into the middle ground, and amazement gripped the onlookers, horse-breaking Trojans and well-grieved Achaeans alike. And this is what they would say, each man looking at his neighbor. Surely evil war and grim fighting will break out again or else Zeus will bring about friendship between both sides. Zeus who is the dispenser of war to mankind. That is what the Trojans and Achaeans were saying. And Athena stole into the mass of Trojans in the likeness of a man, Laodocus, the son of Antenor, the mighty spearman, and looked for godlike Pandarus in the hope of finding him. And she found him, the blameless and mighty son of Lycon, standing idle, and around him were strong ranks of shield-bearing men who had come with him from the waters of Aesopus. Standing beside him, she addressed him with winged words, War-minded son of Lycan, will you perhaps do as I tell you, and have the courage to let fly a swift arrow at Menelaus, and so win gratitude and glory before all the Trojan, but most of all in the sight of the Prince Alexander. From him especially you would be sure to receive splendid gift, if he were to see Menelaus, the warlike son of Atreus, struck down by your shaft and laid on the painful pyre. So come, Shoot an arrow at splendid Menelaus, and vow to sacrifice to Lycian-born Apollo, renowned with the Ba, a splendid hecatomb of first-born lambs when you return to your home in Zelea, the sacred city. So Athena spoke and swayed the thoughts of a thoughtless man. At once he took out his well-polished bow, made from the horns of a full-grown wild goat that he himself had once shot in the chest as it emerged from a rocky place while he waited in a hide. And he hid it in the chest, and it fell backwards onto the rock. On its head grew horns of sixteen palms length, and these a craftsman who worked in horn had fitted together, smoothing the whole bow skillfully, and adding a tip of gold. Pandarus braced the bow's point firmly against the ground, 
and bent it back and strung it, and his excellent companions held their shields in front of him. In case the warlike sons of the Achaeans charged him before Menelaus, Atreus's warlike son was shot down. Then he opened the lid of his quiver, and from it took an arrow, feathered, not yet released, and a bearer of black agony. Quickly he fitted the bitter shaft to the bowstring and vowed to sacrifice to Lycian-born Apollo, renowned with the bear, a splendid hecatomb of firstborn lambs when he returned to his home in Zelea, the sacred city. Then, gripping the notches and ox gut string together, he pulled, bringing the string back to his chest and the iron tip to the bow. When he had bent the great bow so that it made an arc it sang out, the string gave a loud cry, and the sharp arrow leapt forth, raging to fly into the enemy soldier. But, Menelaus, the blessed immortal gods had not forgotten you, and the first to your aid was Zeus's daughter who gathers the spoil. She stood before you and fended off the sharp-pointed arrow, turning it away from your flesh just like a mother brushing a fly from her child who is lying in sweet sleep. And with her own hand she guided it instead to where its gold buckles held his belt together and overlapped the double corslet. The bitter arrow struck the close-fitting belt, and driving through the elaborately decorated belt forced its way through the finely worked corslet and the loinplate, a defense against missiles, that he wore to shield his flesh. This was his best protection. But the arrow flew straight through it too, just grazing the surface of the hero's flesh, and at once dark blood began to flow from the wound. As when a woman stains ivory with purple dye, a woman of Myonia or Caria, to be a cheek piece for horses, it lies in the store chamber, and many horsemen pray that their horse might wear it, but it lies there. A king's delight, both an adornment for his horse and a glory for his charioteer. Just so, Menelaus, were your shapely thighs stained with blood, and your shins and handsome ankles below. At this Agamemnon, lord of men, shuddered, when he saw the black blood flowing down from the wound, and Menelaus himself, dear to Ares, shuddered too. But when he saw that the barbs and binding were still outside his flesh, the spirit was gathered back into his breast. With a deep groan, Lord Agamemnon spoke to his companions, holding Menelaus by the hand, and they groaned with him. Dear brother, so it was for your death that I swore those oaths, setting you alone in front of the Achaeans to fight the Trojans. Now they have shot you and trampled on the solemn oath. But an oath cannot count for nothing, nor the blood of lambs, nor unmixed wine libations, nor our right hands that confirm the pact. Even if the Olympian does not bring fulfillment immediately, he will do so in full, however late, and men will pay a high price, with their own lives and with their wives' and children's lives as well. For I know this very well in my mind and in my heart, that there will come a day when sacred Troy will be destroyed. And Priam and the people of Priam of the fine ash spear, and Zeus, the son of Cronus, seated on high, dwelling in the upper air, will himself shake the dark aegis in the face of all men, in anger at their oath-breaking. So this will not be unfulfilled. But terrible grief will come on me because of ye, Menelau, if you die here and complete your life's allotted portion. And then I will return to thirsty Argos covered in contempt, for the Achaeans will immediately think of their homeland, and we will abandon Argive Helen here, for Priam and the Trojans to boast over, and the plowland will rot your bones as you lie here in Troy with your mission unaccomplished. And this is what one of the arrogant Trojans will say as he leaps up and down on the grave mound of splendid Menelaus. This is how Agamemnon's anger should always turn out. He brought an army of Achaeans here on a useless errand. And look, he has gone back home to his dear native land with empty ships, leaving the brave Menelaus behind. So they will say, and then I hope the wide earth will gape before me. Then fair-haired Menelaus spoke, minded to give him courage. Do not despair, and do not alarm the people of the Achaeans. The sharp arrow did not lodge in a fatal place. Before it could, my bright gleaming belt protected me, and underneath it my body shield and the loin plate that bronze smiths forged. Then in answer Lord Agamemnon addressed him. Dear Menelaus, I pray that it is as you say. But a healer will attend to your wound and will spread ointments on it to deliver you from your black pain. So he spoke and addressed Talthebius, the godlike herald. Talthebius, go as fast as you can and summon here Machon, the worthy son of Asclepius, the excellent healer, so that he can examine Menelaus, Atreus's warlike son, whom some man skilled in archery has shot at and wounded, some Trojan or Lycian bringing glory to himself but grief to us. So he spoke, 
and the herald heard and did not disobey him, but set off for the people of bronze-shirted Achaeans, looking out keenly for the hero Mashal. He found him standing idle, and around him were strong ranks of shield-bearing men who had come with him from horse-rearing tricks. Standing close, he addressed him with winged words. Quickly, son of Asclepius, Lord Agamemnon summons you to examine Menelaus, the warlike captain of the Achaeans, whom some man skilled in archery has shot at and wounded, some Trojan or Lycian, bringing glory to himself but grief to us. So he spoke and quickened the spirit in Mashan's breast, and they set off through the soldiery along the wide Achaean camp. When they reached the place where fair-haired Menelaus lay wounded, and around him all the best men were gathered in a circle, he went and stood in their midst, a man like a god, and at once pulled the arrow out from the close-fitting belt, and as it was pulled out the sharp barbs were broken backwards. Then he loosened the gleaming belt, and underneath it the body shield and loin plate that bronze smiths had forged. When he saw the wound, where the bitter arrow had struck, he sucked the blood from it and skillfully applied soothing ointments that Chiron had long ago given his father as a token of friendship. While they were tending to Menelaus, master of the war cry, the ranks of shield-bearing Trojans came on at them, and the Achaeans armed again, and called up their desire for battle. Then you would not have seen glorious Agamemnon drowsing, nor shrinking in fear, nor hanging back from the fighting but fervently eager for the battle where men win glory. He left his horses behind, and his chariot inlaid with bronze. His attendant kept the snorting horses in reserve. He was Eurymedon, the son of Ptolemaeus, who was Piraeus's son, and gave him strict orders to hold them nearby until weariness should overtake his limbs while he marshaled his many troops. And so on foot he roamed up and down the ranks of men. If he saw any of the swift horse Danans busying themselves, he would stand nearby and try to strengthen their courage. Argives, do not let your surging courage ebb away. Men who swear falsely will get no help from Father Zeus and those who were the first offender by breaking their oath. will have their tender flesh devoured by vultures, while we in our turn will carry off their dear wives and infant children in our ship when we have sacked their city but whenever he saw men holding back from hateful war, he would rebuke them severely with angry words. Contemptible argive braggarts, have you no shame? Why are you standing there in a day, just like fawns that are exhausted after running a long way over a plain, and stop still, and there is no courage in their hearts? That is how you are standing, in a daze and not fighting. Are you waiting for the Trojans to reach the place where your ships with their fine sterns are drawn up on the shore of the Grey Sea? to see if the son of Cronus will hold his protecting hand above ye. So he ranged through the ranks of men as their commander, and as he went among the mass of men he came upon the Cretans, who were arming themselves under war-minded Idomeneus. Idomeneus was in the front rank, like a wild boar in his courage, and Marinus was urging on the rearmost company. When he saw them Agamemnon, lord of men, was delighted, and he immediately addressed Idomeneus with gentle words. Idomeneus, I esteem you above all the swift horse Danans, whether it is in war or in any other kind of enterprise, or in feasting. Whenever the best men of the Argives mix gleaming wine in a bowl for a meeting of elder, while the other flowing haired Achaeans may drink up only their fixed portion, your cup always stands full, just as mine does, for you to drink when the spirit moves ye. Up, then, for battle. Be the man you have always claimed to be. Then, in answer to him, Idomeneus, leader of Cretan, spoke. Son of Atreus, I will surely be your faithful companion, just as I promised and undertook at the outset of this war. But you must stir up all the other flowing-haired Achaeans to fight as soon as we may, because the Trojans have undone their oaths. Now death and calamity are in store for them, since they were the first to offend by breaking their oaths. So he spoke, and the son of Atreus passed on, glad in his heart. As he went through the mass of men he found the two called Ajax. They were arming, and a cloud of foot soldiers came with them. As when a gathered on his lookout sees a cloud approaching over the open sea, driven by the west wind. And because he is far away, it seems to him blacker than pitch as it advances over the sea and brings a great whirlwind with it, and he shudders when he sees it, and drives his flock into a cave. So the close-packed companies of Zeus-nurtured strong young men advance towards the deadly battle under the two called Ajax, dark-colored, and bristling with shields and spear. When he saw them, the lord Agamemnon was delighted, and he addressed them, speaking with winged words. 
You two named Ajax, commanders of bronze-shirted Argives, I give you no orders, since it is not fitting to urge you on, and you yourselves are driving your people to fight with vigor. Father Zeus and Athena and Apollo, how I wish that there was a spirit like this in the breasts of everyone. Then the city of Lord Priam would quickly reel before us, captured and devastated by our hands. So he spoke and left them, and went on in search of others. Next he found Nestor, the clear-voiced speaker of the Pelians, preparing his companions and urging them on to fight, and they were led by huge Pelagon, and Alastor and Chromius, and Lord Haman, and Bias, shepherd of the people. He had deployed the charioteers in front, with their horses and chariots, and behind them large numbers of excellent foot soldiers, to be a bulwark in war. The weakest he drove into the middle, so that even the reluctant would be compelled to fight. First he gave orders to the charioteer, instructing them to hold their horses back and not to cause disorder among the soldiery. Let no one, relying on his own chariot skill and braver, be in a rage to fight the Trojans alone, in front of the rest, nor let him retreat, for this way you will be the less effective. But if a man in his chariot comes within reach of an enemy's, let him thrust with his spear, since that is much the better way. This is how men in times past would storm cities and their walls, keeping this strategy and resolution firmly in their hearts. So the old man urged them on, for he knew the wars of long ago, and when he saw him Lord Agamemnon was delighted, and addressed him, speaking with winged words. Old man, I could wish that your knee's vigor was equal to the spirit in your breast, and your strength was unimpaired, but old age that comes to all wears you down. How I wish that another man could take on your age, and you could join the younger men. Then Nestor the Gerenian horseman answered him, Son of Atreus, I too could fervently wish myself to be the man I was when I killed glorious Eruthalian. But the gods do not grant everything to men at once. I was a young man then, but now old age presses hard on me. Nonetheless, I shall go with my charioteers and direct them with counsel and in words, for that is the privilege of old men. The spear fighting will be done by younger men, who are later born than me, and have confidence in their strength. So he spoke, and Atreus's son passed on, glad in his heart. He found the son of Pedios, Menestheus, whipper of horses, standing idle, and with him were Athenians, raisers of the war cry. Close by them stood much scheming Odysseus, and around him the ranks of Cephalenians, no weakling, were standing idle, for their people had not yet heard the war cry, since the companies of horse-breaking Trojans and Achaeans had but recently roused themselves to action. So they waited, standing there, waiting until another Achaean band should advance and make an attack on the Trojans, and so begin the fighting. When he saw them, Agamemnon, lord of men, rebuked them, and he addressed them, speaking with winged words. Son of Pedios, who was a king nurtured by Zeus, and you too, you expert in low cunning, obsessed with gain, why are you cowering here out of the way, waiting for other? You too ought to be taking your stand among the front ranks and going to face the searing heat of the battle. You are the first to be invited to any feast of mine, whenever we Achaeans prepare a feast for the elders, where it is your pleasure to eat roast meat and drink, cups of honey-sweet wine for as long as you wish. But now you would happily look on even if ten Achaean squadrons were fighting with the pitiless bronze before you stirred yourselves. Then much scheming Odysseus looked at him darkly and replied, Son of Atreus, what words are these that cross your teeth's barrier? How can you say that I hang back from the battle, whenever we Achaeans stir up bitter war against the horse-breaking Trojans? If this is your concern and your desire, you will soon see Telemachus's dear father fighting in the thick of the front ranks of horse-breaking Trojans. But as for you, your words are nothing but empty wind. At this Lord Agamemnon smiled when he saw that Odysseus was angry, and taking back his words answered him, Son of Laertes, sprung from Zeus, Odysseus of many schemes, I have no great need to rebuke you, nor am I giving you order, because I know that the spirit which you keep in your breast is kindly disposed, and your thoughts are my thoughts. So come, if hard words have been spoken, we shall later make things right, and may the gods throw all this to the winds. So he spoke and left them and went in search of others. He found the son of Tydeus, high-spirited Diomede, standing inactive surrounded by his horses and close-jointed chariots, and next to him was standing Sthenelus, son of Capaneus. When he saw Diomedes, Lord Agamemnon rebuked him and addressed him, speaking with winged words, Son of war-minded Tydeus the horsebreaker, what is this? 
Why are you cowering here, eyeing the battle lines? Tydeus would not have been content to skulk like this, but would engage the enemy far in front of his companions. That is what those who saw him in action used to say. I myself never met or saw him, but they say he excelled all other men. He did once come to Mycenae, not with hostile intent, but as a guest, with godlike Polynices, trying to raise an army. They were planning a campaign against Thebes's sacred walls, and earnestly begged my people to give them illustrious allies, and they were ready to give them, and agreed to their request. But Zeus sent us ill-omened signs, and dissuaded us, and so when they had set out and were some way on the road, and had come to Asipa's grassy meadows, thick with reeds, the Achaeans appointed Tydeus to be their envoy. So he set off, and came upon a large number of Cadmeans holding a feast in the house of powerful Ediocles. Though he came as a stranger, alone among many Cadmeans, the horse-driver Tydeus was not afraid, but challenged them to athletic contests, and beat them in every event. Easily, that was the kind of support that Athena gave him. At this the Cadmeans, whippers of horses, grew angry, and on his way back they laid a strong ambush, gathering fifty young men together, and there were two captains, Maeo, son of Haman, a man resembling the immortals, and Autophonus's son Polyphontes, steadfast in war. On these men too Tydeus let loose an ugly death, for he killed them all, sending only one back to his home. It was Maeon he sent, persuaded by signs from the gods. Such a man was Tydeus the Aetolian, but he fathered a son inferior to him in battle, though one better at making speeches. So he spoke, and mighty Diomedes gave him no answer, put to shame by the rebuke of his respected king. But the son of splendid Capaneus answered, Son of Atreus, do not tell lies when you know the truth. We can claim to be much better than our fathers, since we actually captured the city of seven-gated Thebes, though we led a smaller force, and against stronger walls. Trusting in signs from the gods and in the help from Zeus, while they perished as a result of their own recklessness. So do not rank our father's honor equal to ours. But mighty Diomedes looked at Sthenelus darkly and said, Friend, be silent, sit down and listen to what I say. I am not angry with Agamemnon, shepherd of the peoples, because he is urging the well-grieved Achaeans to fight. It is him that the glory will attach to if the Achaeans cut down the Trojans and capture sacred Ilium. And his will be the greater grief if the Achaeans are cut down. So come, let us too also call up our surging courage. So he spoke, and jumped from his chariot to the ground, fully armed. And the bronze rang out terribly on the Lord's chest as he leapt, and then even the most steadfast would have felt some fear. As when waves of the sea beat on an echoing shore, in quick succession under the west wind's driving force, they first raised themselves up on the open sea, and then break with a great roar on the dry land, and, arching high, rear to a crest on both sides of headlands and spew salt spray. So then the companies of Danans moved in quick succession relentlessly towards the battle. Each one's leader gave the orders, and the rest came on in silence, and you would not think that so large an army had a voice in their breasts as they followed, so silent they were, in fear of their leaders. Around them all gleamed the finely worked armor that they wore in their rank. But as for the Trojans, just like sheep who stand in great numbers in the courtyard of a wealthy man, waiting to yield their white milk, bleeding incessantly because they can hear their lambs cry. So a confused clamor arose throughout their broad camp. They did not all use the same speech or language, but their tongues were mixed, summoned as they were from many lands. Ares urged them off, and gray-eyed Athena urged the Achaeans, and there were terror and panic, and endlessly raging strife, sister and companion of man-slaughtering Ares, who at first raises herself to only a lowly height, but later, though she walks on the earth, rears her head to reach the high sky. She now cast the poised conflict into the middle ground, striding through the soldiery and swelling the agonized cries of men. When the sides had met in a single place and come to grips, then there was a clash of leather shields and spears and the fury of bronze-armored warriors. Bossed shields smashed against each other, and a tremendous clamor arose, made up of the groans of dying men and the exultant cries of their killers and the earth ran with blood. As when two torrents in winter sweep down from the mountains and, fed by great spring, unite their floods in spate at a place where watercourses meet in some deep ravine, and a shepherd far away in the mountains hears their roar, such was the uproar and commotion of the armies as they clashed. 
Antilochus was the first to kill a Trojan chieftain, a fine man fighting in the front rank, Echepolis, Thalysius' son. Throwing first, he hit the plate of his horsehair-crested helmet. The bronze spear point struck him on the forehead and pierced right through the bone, and darkness covered his eyes, and he toppled like a tower in the fierce conflict. When he fell, Lord Elephoner seized him by the feet, Elephoner Chalcodon's son, captain of the great-hearted Abantes, and dragged him out of Missile's way, eager to strip him quickly of his armor. But his eagerness was short-lived, because as he dragged the dead man away, great-spirited Agener saw him, and, as he stooped, stabbed him with his bronze-tipped spear in the side where his shield left him exposed, and loosened his limbs. So his breath left him, and over him a grim tussle began as Trojans and Achaeans fought each other. Like wolves they leapt upon each other, and man struggled with man. Next, Ajax, son of Telamon, felled the son of Anthemia, Simoasius, a man in the prime of youth, whom his mother had borne by the banks of Simoais on her way down from Ida, when she had been there with her parents to inspect their flocks. And so they called him Simoasius, but he did not repay his dear parents for his upbringing. His lifespan was brief, for he was beaten down by the spear of great-spirited Ajax. As he advanced among the front ranks, Ajax struck him on the right nipple and the bronze tip passed clean through the shoulder, and he fell to earth in the dust like a poplar that has grown tall and wide. Low-lying water meadow, it is trimmed below, but from the very top branches sprout, and then a chariot maker fells it with a flashing iron, meaning to bend it into a wheel rim for a handsome chariot, and it lies drying beside the banks of a river. Such was Simoesia, son of Anthemio, slain by Ajax, sprung from Zeus, then Antiphus of the bright corslet, Priam's son, threw his sharp spear at Ajax from among the soldiery. He missed him, but hit Lucas, Odysseus's excellent companion, in the groin as he was dragging the dead man to one side, and he collapsed over it and the body dropped from his hand. Odysseus's spirit was deeply angered at Lucas's death, and he strode through the front fighters helmeted in gleaming bronze. Taking his stand very close to Lucas, he looked keenly around and then threw his shining spear. The Trojans retreated when they saw him throw, and he did not let it fly in vain, but hit Democon, one of Priam's bastard sons, who had come from Abydus, where he kept swift mares. Odysseus, enraged for his companion, hit him with his spear on the temple, and the bronze spear point passed through and out the other side. Darkness covered his eyes, and he fell with a thud, and his armor clattered about him. The front fighters retreated, and glorious Hector with them, and the Argives gave a great yell, and dragged the dead men back, and pressed on even further. But Apollo, looking down from Pergamus, grew indignant and shouted to the Trojans, Up with ye, horse-breaking Trojans, do not yield the battle to the Argives. Their flesh is not made of stone or iron, able to withstand the flesh-tearing bronze when they are hit. Moreover, Achilles, lovely-haired Thetis' son, is not fighting, but is brooding over his heart-sore bitterness beside his ships. So spoke the terrible god from the city, while the daughter of Zeus, splendid Tritogenia, urged on any of the Achaeans she saw holding back as she went among the soldiery. Next, his due destiny shackled Diore, son of Amarincius. He was struck by a jagged stone on the right leg, close to his ankle. A captain of the Thracians threw it, Pyrrhus, the son of Embraces, who had come from Anus. The pitiless stone smashed the two tendons to nothing, and his bones as well and he fell backwards in the dust, stretching out both hands towards his dear companions, gasping out his life. Pyrrhus, the man who threw the stone, rushed up and thrust his spear in by the navel. Diora's bowels all spilled out onto the ground, and darkness covered his eye. But as Pyrrhus ran back Thoas, the Aetolian hit him with his spear in the chest above his nipple, and the bronze point stuck fast in his lung. Thoas came up close and wrenched the massive spear out of his chest. Then, Drawing his sharp sword, he drove it into the middle of Pyrrhus's belly and robbed him of his life. Yet he did not strip his armor. Pyrrhus's companions surrounded him, Thracians with hair piled high and with long spears in their hands. And though Thoas was huge and powerful and splendid, they drove him back, and he was shaken and gave ground. So the two warriors lay stretched in the dust next to each other, one a Thracian and the other a man of the bronze-shirted Apeans, both leaders, and around them many others were being killed. Then no longer could any man have faulted their war work as he entered the action. Anyone who, as yet uninjured and unstabbed by piercing bronze, was roaming in the thick of battle. 
with Pallas Athena taking him by the hand and holding off the missile's onset. For on that day many men of the Trojans and Achaeans lay sprawled next to each other, face down in the dust. Book 5. Next, to Diomede, the son of Tydeus, Pallas Athena gave fury and daring, so that he might distinguish himself among all the Argives, and also win illustrious fame. From his helmet and shield she caused unwearied fire to blaze, like the star that in late summer rises to shine with a special brightness after it has bathed in the waters of ocean. Such was the fire she made blaze from his head and shoulders, and she thrust him into the battle's midst, where the turmoil was greatest. There was among the Trojans a man called Dares, a blameless, rich man, a priest of Hephaestus. He had two sons, Phegeus and Idaeus, both skilled in every art of battle. These separated themselves from the rest and rushed out to face Diomedes from their chariot, while he was on the ground, on foot. When they had advanced to within close range of each other, Phegeus was the first to fling his far-shadowing spear, but the spear point passed over the left shoulder of Tydeus's son and did not hit him. Then Tydeus's son threw his bronze-tipped spear, and the weapon did not fly in vain from his hand, but hit Phegeus in mid-chest and toppled him from the chariot. Aedaeus sprang back, leaving his beautifully made chariot, and did not have the courage to stand over his slain brother, nor indeed would he himself have escaped death's black specter, had not Hephaestus rescued him, shrouding him in night, unharmed, so that his old priest might not be utterly overwhelmed by grief. The son of great-spirited Tydeus drove off their horses and gave them to his companions to take back to the hollow ships. When the great-spirited Trojans saw the two sons of Dare, that one had fled and the other was lying dead by his chariot. Anger swelled up in them all, but gray-eyed Athena took impetuous errors by the hand and addressed him in these words, Ere, doom of mortals, Ares, blood-stained sacker of walled cities, shall we not leave the Trojans and Achaeans alone to struggle together and see to which side Father Zeus grants the glory? Let us withdraw and in this way avoid the anger of Zeus. So she spoke, and led impetuous Ares away from the battle, and made him sit beside the high banks of Scamander. And the Danans began to drive the Trojans back. Each of their leaders killed his man. First, Agamemnon, lord of men, toppled huge Odeus, captain of the Halizone, from his chariot. He was the first to turn away. And Agamemnon planted his spear in his back between the shoulders, and drove it out through his chest. He fell with a thud, and his armor clattered about him. Then Edomeneus killed Phaestus, the son of Boris, the Myonian, who had come from rich-soiled Tarn. Spear-famed Edomeneus pierced him with his long lance in the right shoulder as he was about to climb into his chariot. He tumbled from the chariot, and hateful darkness took him. Idomeneus' attendants stripped him of his armor, and then Menelaus, Atreus' son, with his sharp spear killed Scamandrius, the son of Strophia, a man skilled in the chase, a fine hunter whom Artemis herself had taught to shoot down all kinds of wild beasts that live in mountain forests. But this time Artemis' shooter of arrows could not help him, nor could the marksmanship in which he formerly excelled, because Atreus' son Menelaus, famed with the spear, struck him with a spear in the back as he fled before him, between the shoulders, and drove it through his chest. He collapsed onto his face, and his armor clattered about him. Meriones struck down Pharaclus, son of Tecton who was Harmon's son, who had the skill in his hands to fashion all kinds of intricate work, for Pallas Athena loved him above all others. It was he who had built for Alexander the well-balanced ships which began the trouble, and brought misery to all the Trojans and to himself, since he knew nothing of the gods' ordinances. Meriones went after him, and when he caught up with him struck him in the right buttock, and the spear point passed clean through under the bone into his bladder. Phereclus screamed and fell to his knee, and death enveloped him. Megas killed Pedaeus, son of Antenor, a bastard son, but glorious Theano had brought him up with the same faithful care that she gave to her own dear children, out of regard for her husband. The spear-famed son of Phileas came close to him and struck with his sharp spear at the muscle in his neck. The bronze passed clean through his teeth, severing the tongue's root, and he collapsed in the dust. The cold bronze clenched in his teeth. Eurypylus, son of Euaemon, killed glorious Hypsiner, the son of proud-spirited Dolopion, who was the priest of Scamander and was honored by the people as if he were a god. As he fled before him Eurypolis, Euamon's splendid son, ran him down and lunging forward drove his sword through Hypsinor's shoulder, 
and sheared off his heavy arm. The bloody arm fell to the ground, and dark death and his cruel destiny came down and fastened on his eyes. So they labored on in the fierce conflict. As for the son of Tydeus, you could not tell whose side he was on, whether he was allied with the Trojans or with the Achaeans. He stormed over the plain like a river in spate, a winter torrent that quickly sweeps dikes away in its surging course. Close-built embankments cannot hold it back, nor can walls raised to defend flourishing orchards resist its sudden onslaught when the heavy rain from Zeus has fallen and far and wide destroys the fruits of strong men's toil. So the close-packed ranks of Trojans were thrown by Tydeus's son into confusion, nor for all their numbers could they withstand him. Now when Pandarus, the splendid son of Lycon, saw him storming over the plain, scattering the companies before him, he quickly aimed his curved bow at the son of Tydeus, and hit him in the right shoulder as he charged forward, on a plate of his corslet. The bitter arrow flew through it, holding a straight course, and his corslet was spattered with blood. Then Lycon's splendid son let out a great shout over him. Up with you, great-spirited Trojans, whippers of horses. The best of the Achaeans has been wounded, and I do not think he will long hold out against my mighty arrow, if it truly was the lord son of Zeus who sent me here when I left Lycia. So he spoke, boasting, but the swift arrow did not fell Diomedes. And he turned back and stood in front of his horses and chariot, and spoke to Senelus, son of Capaneus, Quick, dear son of Capaneus, get down from the chariot, so that you can pull the bitter arrow from my shoulder for me. So he spoke, and Senelus jumped from the chariot to the ground, and standing by him pulled the swift arrow out from behind his shoulder, and the blood speared up through the closely woven tunic. Then Diomedes, master of the war cry, spoke in prayer. Hear me, daughter of Zeus who wears the aegis, Atritone. If ever you stood beside my father with kindly intent in deadly war, this time be a friend to me too, Athena. Let me kill this man. Grant that he may come within my spear cast, this man who shot me before I saw him, and who claims that I do not have long to look upon the bright light of the sun. So he spoke in prayer, and Pallas Athena heard him, and brought lightness to his legs and his arms again. Standing nearby, she addressed him with winged words. Take courage now, Diomedes, to fight against the Trojans. I have thrust into your breast the fury of your father, fearless fury such as the shield-wielding horseman Tydeus had. And I have taken from your eyes the mist that was there before, so that you can easily distinguish between God and man. So if some god now comes down here to test you, you must not fight face to face with any of the immortal gods, except only that if Aphrodite, daughter of Zeus, enters the battle, you may wound her with a sharp bronze. So gray-eyed Athena spoke and went away, and the son of Tydeus at once set off and joined the front fighter though even before he was raging in his heart to fight the Trojans, yet now three times that fury seized him. Like a lion that a shepherd watching over thick-fleeced sheep in open country has wounded but not killed when it leapt over his sheepfold's fence, he has provoked its strength, but he cannot then defend his flock. And the lion gets into the enclosures, and the helpless sheep run about in panic. They fall in heaps, piled one on another, and the lion, still raging, leaps away over the fold's high fence, so did mighty Diomedes plunge raging in among the Trojans. Next he killed Astinus and Hyperion, shepherd of the people, one he pierced above the nipple with his bronze-tipped spear, and struck the other's collarbone with his great sword next to the shoulder and sheared it away from his back and neck. He left them where they were and went after Abbas and Polyadus, the sons of Eurydama, the aged expounder of dreams. He had interpreted no dreams for them when they left for Troy and now mighty Diomedes stripped them of their armor. Next he went after Xanthus and Thon, two sons of Phaenops, both late-born. Their father was now worn out by grim old age, and had fathered no other son to inherit his possessions. Diomedes killed them, depriving them of their dear lives, both of them, and bequeathed lamentation and cruel grief to their father, since he could not welcome them back alive from the war. Distant cousins shared out his wealth, Next he caught two sons of Priam of the line of Dardanus, Echemon and Chromia, as they rode out in one chariot. As a lion springs on a herd of cattle and breaks the neck of a calf or cow as they graze in a wooded place, so the son of Tydeus thrust them both brutally from their chariot, though they resisted, and stripped them of their arms. He gave the horses to his companions to drive back to the ships, while he was spreading havoc among the ranks of men, 
Ania saw him and set off through the battle and the confusion of spears, seeking godlike Pandarus in the hope of finding him. And he came upon the blameless and mighty son of Lycon, and standing before him spoke directly to him, Pandarus, where now are your bow and your winged arrow and your fame? No man here can compete with you in archery, nor does any man in Lycia boast that he is better than you. Come now, lift your hands to Zeus and let fly an arrow at this man, the one who stands supreme here, who is inflicting great hurt on the Trojans, loosening the knees of many fine men. Unless he is some god who has a grudge against the Trojans being angry over a missed offering, a god's anger is hard to bear. Then in answer the splendid son of Lycon addressed him. Aeneas, counselor of the bronze-shirted Trojans, this man seems to me exactly like Tydeus's war-minded son, for I recognize him by his shield and his wizard helmet, and the look of his horses, but I do not know for sure if it is a god. If this is the man I think it is, Tydeus's war-minded son, this crazed assault cannot happen without a god, and some immortal must be standing close to him, his shoulders shrouded in mist. Who has turned aside the swift arrow that was on course to hit him? I have already let fly an arrow at him, and it hit his right shoulder, passing right through the plate of his corslet, and I believed that I was on the point of sending him to Haiti, but even so I did not fell him. So some resentful god must be here. Here I do not have horses, or a chariot that I can mount. Yet in Lycon's halls you must know that I have eleven chariot, fine ones, freshly built, brand new. Over them cloths are spread, and next to each of them pairs of horses stand, champing on white barley and emmer wheat. And indeed as I left, my father, the old spearfighter Lycon, gave me much advice in his well-built house, telling me I should take my stand in a horse-drawn chariot and lead the Trojans into the harsh conflict of battle. I did not listen to him and it would have been much better if I had, wanting to spare my horses, in case they ran short of fodder in places where men are crowded together. And they used to plentiful food. So I left them behind, and I came to Ilium on foot, relying on my bow. But that was to turn out no use to me. Already I have let fly an arrow at two of their champions, the son of Tydeus and Atreus's son, and in both I have made the blood flow with a clear hit, but it only provoked them the more. So it was for a miserable destiny that I took down my curved bow from its peg on the day that I came leading my Trojans to beautiful Ilium, doing a service to glorious Hector. But if I ever go back home and cast eyes on my native land, on my wife and on my great high-roofed house, may some stranger cut off my head there and then. If I do not smash this bow with my hands and throw it into the blazing fire, it was useless gear to bring with me. Then Aeneas, captain of the Trojans, answered him, do not talk like that, I beg you. Nothing will change until you and I go to meet this man with chariot and horses, to match our strength and bring him to the test in full armor. So come, climb into my chariot, and you will see the worth of the horses of Tiaros, which have the skill to range swiftly over all the plain, whether in pursuit or retreat. They will carry us safely back to the city. If Zeus continues to give the glory to Diomede, the son of Tydeus, come now. Take the whip and the shining reins, and I will get down from the chariot and enter the fighting, or you can go to meet this man, while I take care of the horses. Then the splendid son of Lycon addressed him, Aeneas, you must take care of the reins and the horses yourself. They are more likely to pull the curved chariot under the hands of their accustomed driver, if we have to flee from Tydeus's son. I am afraid that if they cannot hear your voice they will grow restive and take fright, and refuse to carry us out of the battle. And then the son of great-spirited Tydeus could attack and kill us and drive away your single-hoofed horses. No, you must drive the chariot and horses yourself, and I will face his onslaught with my sharp spear. So they spoke, and mounted the finely worked chariot, and, raging, guided the swift horses towards Tydeus's son. Senalus, the splendid son of Capaneus, saw them coming, and quickly addressed Tydeus's son with winged words. Diomedes, son of Tydea, delight of my heart. I can see two mighty men coming at you, raging for the fight, filled with immense strength. One is the skilled bowman, Pandarus, who boasts that he is the son of Lycon, while the other boasts that he was born the son of blameless Anchise, and that his mother was Aphrodite. Come, let us retreat in our chariot, and do not, I beg you, storm like this through the front fighters, or you may lose your dear life. But mighty Diomedes looked at him darkly and addressed him, do not talk to me of flight. I do not think you will persuade me. 
I am not the kind of man to hang back from the fight, nor to cower in fear. My fury is still firmly fixed within me, but I am loath to mount my chariot, and will go to meet them just as I am. Pallas Athena does not allow me to be afraid. As for those two, their swift horses will not carry them home, away from me, even if one or the other of them escaped. And I tell you another thing, and you should store it in your mind. If Athena of many counsels grants me the glory of killing these two, you must leave these swift horses of ours here, tying their reins to the chariot rail, and turn your mind to Aeneas's horses. Make a dash for him, and drive them from the Trojans to the well-grieved Achaeans. You must know, they are of the same stock that Zeus the wide thunderer gave to Tros as compensation for his son Ganymedes, for they were the best of all horses under the dawn and the sun. And Cheese, lord of men, bred from this bloodstock by deceit, by putting mares to the stallions without Laomedon's knowledge. From them six foals were born in his hall, and of these he kept four for himself, and raised them at his manger, and he gave two provokers of panic to Aeneas. If we were to capture these, we would win glorious fame. As they were speaking to one another in this way, the other two quickly closed on them, driving their swift horses. Then the splendid son of Lycon was the first to speak, steadfast-hearted, war-minded son of proud Tydeus. So my swift shot, my bitter arrow, did not fell you, but this time I will test you with my spear, and perhaps I will strike you down. So he spoke, and poised his long-shadowing spear and threw it and hit the shield of Tydeus's son, and the bronze point flew clean through it and reached Diomedes' corslet. At this Lycon's splendid son gave a great shout. You are hit, deep in your side. I do not think you will hold out much longer. You have given me great glory. Fearlessly, mighty Diomedes addressed him. You missed, you did not hit me. I think that before you are finished with all this one or other of you will fall and with his blood glut heirs, the fighter with the oxhide shield. So he spoke and hurled his spear, and Athena guided it on to Pandarus's nose by his eye, and it went through his white teeth. The relentless bronze cut his tongue away at the root, and the point then came out underneath his chin. He tumbled from the chariot, and his bright glittering armor clattered about him, and the swift-footed horses started in fear, and there his life and fury ebbed away. Now Aeneas jumped down, holding his shield and long spear, fearing that the Achaeans would drag the dead man away from him. He stood astride him like a lion, trusting in his strength, holding before him his spear and perfectly balanced shield, raging to kill anyone who might come to challenge him, and yelling terribly. But the son of Tydeus picked up a rock in his hand, a mighty feat, which not even two men such as mortals now or could hold up, but he easily lifted it on his own. With this, he hit Aeneas on the hip joint, where the thigh bone revolves in the hip socket and men call it the cup. He smashed Aeneas's cup, and severed both sinews as well, and the rough rock stripped away his skin. The hero sank to his knees and stayed there, propping himself on the ground with his brawny hand, and black night covered his eye. Then indeed Aeneas lord of men would have died, had not Aphrodite, daughter of Zeus, been quick to see him, his mother, who had borne him to Anchises, herdsman of cattle. Around her dear son she wrapped her white arms, and held before him a concealing fold of her white dress as a defense against missile, in case any of the swift horse Danans should hurl a spear into his chest and take away his life. So she set about rescuing her dear son from the fighting by stealth, but the son of Capaneus did not forget the agreement that Diomede, master of the war cry, had made with him. He held back his own single-hoofed horses, keeping them from the battle's confusion, and tied their reins to the chariot rail, and made a dash for the fine-maned horses of Aeneas and drove them away from the Trojans to the well-grieved Achaeans. He gave them to Daepolis, his dear companion, whom he esteemed above all his peer, because their minds thought alike, telling him to drive them to the hollow ship. Then the hero mounted his own chariot and took up the shining reins, and at once drove the strong-hoofed horses towards Tydeus's son, raging. Diomedes was pursuing Cyprus with the pitiless bronze, knowing what an unwarlike goddess she was, and not one of those reckoned to take command when men are at war. She was certainly no Athena, nor Enyo, sacker of cities. When the son of great-spirited Tydeus caught up with her, after pursuing her through the dense soldiery, he sprang forward and, lunging, stabbed her with his sharp spear on the wrist, where it was soft. The spear passed clean through the deathless garment which the graces had woven for her, piercing the flesh above the palm's base, 
and the goddess's deathless blood flowed. This was Iker, the kind of blood that flows in the blessed gods, for they eat no bread, and do not drink gleaming wine, and so are without blood, and men call them immortals. She gave a loud scream, and let her son fall from her. But Phoebus Apollo caught him up in his arms, protecting him in a dark cloud, in case any of the swift horse Danans should hurl a bronze spear into his chest and take away his life. Then Diomedes, master of the war cry, shouted aloud over her, Daughter of Zeus, stay away from warfare and fighting. Is it not enough that you lead feeble women astray? If you keep joining the battle, I think you will come to be terrified of war, even when you only hear others speak of it. So he spoke, and she went away, distraught and in great pain. When footed Iris lifted her up and led her out of the mass of men, exhausted with pain, and her lovely skin was darkening. On the left of the battlefield she found impetuous Ares sitting alone, his spear and swift horses resting against a cloud. Falling to her knees, she urgently entreated her dear brother, begging him for his horses with their headbands of gold. Dear brother, help me to escape. Give me your horses, so that I may reach Olympus, where the immortal gods have their seat. I am sorely troubled with a wound, which a mortal man gave me Tydeus's son, who would now fight even against Father Zeus. So she spoke, and Ares gave her the horses with golden headbands. And she mounted the chariot, suffering in her dear heart, and Iris mounted beside her and took up the reins in her hand, and whipped the pair to make them go, and they flew willingly on. Soon they arrived at steep Olympus, seat of the gods, and there swift, wind-footed Iris pulled up the horses, unyoked them from the chariot, and threw immortal fodder before them. Bright Aphrodite collapsed on to the knees of Dione and her mother, who took her daughter in her arms, and stroking her with her hand addressed her, saying, Dear child, which of the Uranian gods has done this to you so thoughtlessly, as if you had committed some public mischief? Then Aphrodite, who loves to smile, answered her. It was the son of Tydeus, arrogant Diomedes, who wounded me, because I rescued my dear son from the fighting by stealth, Aeneas, who is by far the dearest of all men to me. This grim conflict is no longer between Trojans and Achaeans, but now the Danans are fighting against immortals as well. Then Dione, bright among goddesses, answered her. Endure, my child, and bear this, distressed though you are. Many of us who have our homes on Olympus have suffered at men's hands when we tried to inflict harsh pain on each other. Air is for one suffered, when Otis and mighty Ephialtes, the sons of Aloeus, bound him in strong chains. For thirteen months he was imprisoned in a bronze jar, and then even Aerith, insatiable in war, would have died had not their stepmother, the beautiful Araboia, taken the news to Hermes. He stole Ares out of the jar, and he was now in a weak state, for the cruel chains were wearing him down. Again, Hera suffered when the mighty son of Amphitryon wounded her in her right breast with a three-barbed arrow, and incurable anguish seized hold of her. Monstrous Hades suffered too with the rest, hit by a swift arrow when that same man, the son of Zeus who wears the Aegis, shot him at Pylos among the dead men and gave him over to pain. He went away to the house of Zeus on high Olympus, grieving in his heart and pierced through with agony, for the arrow had driven into his massive shoulder and was vexing his heart. But Paeon spread pain-killing ointments on his wound and healed him, since he was not made to suffer death. Heracles was a hard and violent man, not troubled by the outrages he committed with his bow on the gods who hold Olympus. As for you, the goddess gray-eyed Athena set this man against you, fool that he is since Tydeus's son does not know in his heart that the man who fights with immortals is not at all long-lived. Such a man has no homecoming from war and grim conflict to find his children crying daddy as they climb on to his knees. So let the son of Tydeus, even if he is very mighty, now take care that no god more warlike than you fights against him, or else Aegealia, the prudent daughter of Adrestus and the steadfast wife of Diomede, breaker of horses, may one day rouse her household from sleep with morning cries, longing in vain for her wedded husband, the best of the Achaeans. So she spoke, and with her hands wiped away the ichor from Aphrodite's wrist. It was healed, and the harsh pain was soothed. Now the others had been watching this, Athena and Hera, and they began to tease Cronus's son Zeus with mocking words, and the first to speak was the goddess gray-eyed Athena. Father Zeus, Will you be angry at what I am going to say? I do believe that Cyprus has been persuading some Achaean woman into following the Trojans, 
whom she now loves to excess. And while she was caressing this lovely robed Achaean woman, she scratched her delicate hand on a golden pin. So she spoke, and the father of gods and men smiled, and calling golden Aphrodite to him, spoke to her. Warfare's business, my child, is not for you. Your task is to occupy yourself with matters of desire and marriage, leaving all this to be the concern of swift heirs and Athena. As they were talking to each other in this way, Diomedes, master of the war cry, sprang forward at Aeneas. He knew that Apollo himself had spread his arms over him, but even so he was not in awe of the great god, and kept rushing at Aeneas to kill him and to strip him of his famous armor. Three times he sprang at him, raging for the kill, and three times Apollo battered his shining shield back, but when he charged for the fourth time, like some divine being, Apollo, who shoots from afar, gave a terrible shout and addressed him, Think, son of Tydeus, and shrink back, and do not hope to match yourself with gods. The races of immortal gods and of men who walk upon the earth can never be the same. So he spoke, and Tydeus' son drew back a little space, avoiding the anger of Apollo, who shoots from afar. As for Aeneas, Apollo set him apart from the mass of men in the holy shrine on Pergamus where his temple stood. There Leto and Artemis, shooter of arrows, nursed him in the spacious sanctuary and renewed his glory. And Apollo, of the silver bow, fashioned a phantom in the exact likeness of Aeneas, and with the same armor. And around this phantom the Trojans and glorious Achaeans hewed at each other's oxhide shields, held before their chests, both round shields and those made from stretched shaggy hides. Then, indeed, Phoebus Apollo addressed impetuous errors, Errors, doom of mortals, blood-stained errors, sacker of walled cities. Will you not go after this man and take him from the battle? I mean Tydeus' son, who would now fight even against Father Zeus. First he grappled with Cyprus and wounded her on the wrist, and after that he came at me like some divine being. So he spoke, and settled down on the heights of Pergamus, while murderous Ares went among the Trojan ranks and urged them on, in the likeness of Akamas, swift commander of the Thracians and gave instructions to the Zeus-nurtured sons of Priam. You sons of Priam, a king nurtured by Zeus, how long will you allow your people to be killed by the Achaeans? Will you wait until they are fighting about your strongly made gates? Lying there is a man whom we honor as much as glorious Hector, Aeneas, the son of great-hearted Anchises. Come, let us rescue our fine companion from the roaring tumult of battle. So he spoke, and quickened the fury and spirit in each man. Then Sarpedon too rebuked glorious Hector with hard words. Hector, tell me, where has that fury gone that you had before? He used to say, I recall, that you could hold the city on your own, without men or allies, just you and your brothers and brothers-in-law. And yet I cannot see or make out a single one of them now, but they are cowering like hounds around a lion, while we, who are only here as your allies, do the fighting. I indeed have come a very great distance to be your ally. Lycia is far away, beside the Xanthus with its swirling water, where I left my dear wife and my infant son, and a great store of treasure, such as a poor man would envy. But for all that I urge on the Lycians, and am myself raging to fight man to man, even though I have no possessions here that the Achaeans would want to plunder and carry off. Meanwhile, you stand idle, and do not even order your people to stand their ground and fight to protect their wives. Take care that you are not caught in the all-embracing meshes of a corded net, and so become the prey and spoil of your enemy, because they will very soon sack your well-populated city. And yet all this should be your concern day and night to entreat the captains of your far-famed allies to hold unceasingly to their task. This way you may shake off their harsh rebuke. So Sarpedon spoke, and his words bid into Hector's thoughts. At once he leapt fully armed from his chariot to the ground and ranged through the whole camp, shaking two spears, urging the Trojans to fight, and rousing up the grim conflict. They turned and rallied, and stood facing the Achaeans, but the Argives massed and stood their ground, and did not run. As when on a sacred threshing floor a wind carries the chaff away when men are winnowing, at the time when fair-haired Demeter separates grain and chaff under the hurrying winds and the heaps of chaff grow white. So then did the Achaeans turn white under the fall of dust which the horses' hoofs kicked up through their ranks and sent up to the high brazen sky. As the men closed again in battle, and the charioteers kept wheeling back, so they drove their hands fury forward, and impetuous errors, roaming everywhere, 
drew a veil of night over the battle to help the Trojans. He was carrying out the commands of Phoebus Apollo of the Golden Sword, who had ordered him to wake the spirit of the Trojans when he saw Pallas Athena leaving the field, for she was the Danans' champion. Then he sent Aeneas out from his richly endowed sanctuary and thrust fury into the breast of the shepherd of the people. Aeneas took his place among his companions, and they were glad when they saw him coming back alive and restored to health and full of noble fury. But they did not question him at all for the toil before them. Stirred up by the god of the silver bow and by Ares' doom of mortals and by endlessly raging strife, would not let them. As for the Danan, the two called Aeax, with Odysseus and Diomede, were driving them on to fight. But even without their urging, the men had no fear of the Trojans' violent onslaught, but stood their ground like clouds that the son of Cronus holds motionless over the peaks of mountains on a windless day. While the fury of the north wind and of the other blustering winds which scatter the shadowing clouds with their shrill blasts is asleep, so the Danans stood unmoved, waiting for the Trojans, and refused to turn in flight. Atreus's son roamed through the ranks with constant exhortations. My friends, be met, and put courage in your hearts, and feel shame before each other in the fierce crush of battle. Men who feel shame are more often saved than killed, while those who run away find neither glory nor courage. So he spoke, and quickly threw his spear and hit a leading man, a companion of great-spirited Aeneas, Dica, who was the son of Pergasus, and whom the Trojans honored as much as Priam's sons, since he was always quick to fight in the front rank. Lord Agamemnon hit him with his spear on the shield, which could not stop it, and the bronze flew right through, driving beyond the belt into the base of his belly. He fell with a thud, and his armor clattered about him. Then in his turn Aeneas killed two of the best men of the Danans, Crethon and Orsilochus, the sons of Diocle, whose father's home was in well-built Phyre. He was a man of great wealth, and was descended from a river, Alpheus, which flows in a broad stream through the Pelian's land and he fathered Ortilochus to be king over many men. Ortilochus, in turn, was father to great-spirited Diocles, and to Diocles there were born two sons, twins, Crethon and Orcelicha, who were skilled in all battle's arts. When they reached youth's fullness, they accompanied the Argives in their black ships to Ilium rich in horses, to win compensation for Atreus's sons, Agamemnon and Menelaus. But there the end of death covered them both. They were like a pair of lions raised by their mother in deep wooded thickets high in the mountains, lions that pillage the enclosures of men's farm and carry off their cattle and sturdy sheep, until they in their turn fall into men's hands and are killed with the sharp bronze. Just so were they overcome at the hands of Aeneas and crashed to the ground like lofty pine trees. When they had fallen, the warrior Menelaus felt pity for them and strode through the front fighters helmeted in gleaming bronze, shaking his spear. Eras stirred up the fury in him, intending that he should be beaten down by the hands of Aeneas. But Antilochus, great-spirited Nestor's son, saw him and strode up through the front fighters. He was greatly afraid that the people's shepherd might be hurt and bring all their toil to nothing. The two men were poising their sharp spears ready in their hands, facing each other and in a frenzy to fight, when Antilochus came and stood very close to the shepherd of the people, and Aeneas, swift fighter though he was did not stand his ground when he saw the two men standing firm, side by side. So these dragged the dead men back into the Achaean people, and laid the wretched pair in the arms of their companion, and turned back and began to fight again in the front ranks. There they killed Pylaemone, who was the equal of Ares, captain of the great-spirited, shield-bearing Paphlagonians. He was standing still when Menelau, son of Atreus, famed with the spear, pierced him with his spear, hitting his collarbone. Antilochus struck down Mydon, his attendant and charioteer, Atimnius's fine son, as he wheeled his single-hoofed horses, hitting him with a rockful on his elbow, and the reins with their white ivory decoration fell from his hands and dropped into the dust. Antilochus sprang at him and drove his sword into Mydon's temples, and he fell from the well-made chariot, gasping for breath, head first in the dust, buried up to his head and shoulder. For some time he stuck there, for the sand was deep, until his horses kicked him and laid him flat on the dusty ground. Antilochus whipped them up and drove them back to the Achaean camp, but Hector noticed them across the ranks and sprang after them with a yell, and companies of the Trojans followed him in all their strength. They were led by Ares and Lady Enya, she bringing with her confusion, 
reckless in war, while Ara is held a spear of prodigious size in his hands, roaming now in front of Hector and now behind him. When he saw him, Diomedes, master of the war cry, shuddered, as when a man who is crossing a great plain stands helpless before a swift-moving river that flows towards the sea, and seeing it churned into foam runs back a little way. So then Tydeus' son drew back and spoke to his people. My friends, in the past we have been filled with amazement at glorious Hector, as a spearman and a brave fighter, but there is always one of the gods at his side to save him from ruin. As now Ares stands there next to him, in the likeness of a mortal. Come, keep your faces towards the Trojan, and retreat steadily, and do not rage to pit your strength in battle against gods. So he spoke, and the Trojans came up very close to them. Then Hector killed two men who were skilled in warfare, Menestas and Anchialos, who were both in one chariot. When they fell huge Ajax, Telamon's son, felt pity for them. He went forward, and standing nearby let fly with his shining spear, and hit Amphius, the son of Selagus, who lived in Pazus, a man of much property and rich in cornland. But his destiny had brought him to come to the help of Priam and his sons. Ajax, son of Telamon, hit him on his belt, and he far shadowing spear lodged at the base of his belly, and he fell with a thud. Illustrious Ajax ran up to strip him of his armor, but the Trojans rained their spears on him, sharp and gleaming, and he caught many of them on his shield. Setting his heel on the dead man, he pulled the bronze-tipped spear out of him, but he could not then strip the fine armor from Amphius's shoulders, since he was hard-pressed by missiles, and was also frightened by the proud Trojan's steadfast defense who confronted him bravely in numbers, grasping their spear, and who, for all his size and strength and splendor, forced him back from them, and he was shaken and withdrew. So they labored away in the fierce crush of battle. Then Tlepolemus, the great and valiant son of Heracle, was roused by his harsh destiny to attack godlike Sarpedon. When they had advanced to within close range of each other, one a son and the other a grandson of Zeus the cloud-gatherer, Tlepolemus was the first to speak to the other man. Sarpedon, counselor of the Lycians, what compulsion is forcing you, a man unskilled in fighting, to cower here? Men lie when they say that you are the offspring of Zeus who wears the Aegis, since you fall far short of those men who in former generations were fathered by Zeus, such men as they say the mighty Heracles was. He was my steadfast spirited, lion hearted father, and long ago came here in search of the mares of Lamadon with no more than six ships and a smaller force of men. But he sacked the city of Ilium and made widows of its streets. But you have a coward's heart, and your people are dying. I do not think that your coming here from Lycia will prove to be a defense to the Trojans, not even if you are very strong. No, you will pass through Hades' gates, beaten down at my hands. In answer to him, Sarpedon, the captain of the Lycian, said, Tlapolemus, Heracles did indeed destroy sacred Ilium but only through the folly of a man, splendid Laomedon, who rewarded his good deeds with words of abuse and refused him the mare, on whose account he had come so far. As for ye, I say that you will here meet death and the black specter at my hands, beaten down under my spear, you will give the glory to me and your life to Hades, master of famous horses. So spoke Sarpedon, and Tlepolemus lifted his ash spear, and both the long spears flew from their hands at the same time. Sarpedon hit the other in the middle of his neck, and the pain-loaded point passed clean through it, and dark night came down and covered his eyes. But Tlepolemus hit Sarpedon on the left thigh with his long spear, and the point sped furiously through, grazing the bone. But as yet his father kept destruction from him. The glorious companions of godlike Sarpedon began to carry him from the fighting. The long spear dragged and weighed him down but in their haste no one noticed or thought to pull the ash spear from his thigh so that he could stand. Such was the trouble they had in protecting him. On the other side, the well-grieved Achaeans began to carry Tlepolemus from the fighting. Glorious Odysseus of the enduring spirit saw him, and his dear heart within him was raging. He pondered then in his heart and in his spirit whether to pursue the son of loud thundering Zeus further, or to take away the lives of more of the Lycians. But it was not great-hearted Odysseus' destiny to kill the mighty son of Zeus with the sharp bronze, and so Athena turned his thoughts towards the mass of Lycians. He killed Coerenus and Alastor and Chromius, Alcandrus and Halius and Noman and Pritanus, and then glorious Odysseus would have slain yet more Lycians. 
had not great Hector of the glittering helmet been quick to notice. He strode through the front fighters, helmeted in gleaming bronze, bringing terror to the Danans, and at his coming Sarpedon, the son of Zeus, was glad and addressed him plaintively. Son of Priya, do not let me lie here, to become the prey of the Danans, but help me, and after this may my life leave me in your city of Troy. Since it seems I was not after all destined to return to my home in my dear native land, to bring gladness to my dear wife and my infant son. So he spoke, but Hector of the glittering helmet did not reply, and rushed past him, impatient to thrust back the Argives as quickly as possible, and to take away the lives of many. Then his glorious companions made godlike Sarpedon sit beneath a handsome oak, sacred to Zeus who wears the Aegis, and the ash spear was wrenched out of his thigh by mighty Pelagon, who was his dear companion. His life's breath left him, and a mist spread over his eye, but then he recovered, and a gust of the north wind blew on him and revived his feebly breathing spirit. Now the Argives, faced by Ares and bronze-helmeted Hector, at no time turned in flight towards the black ships, nor made a counterattack, but retreated steadily to the rear when they realized that Ares was helping the Trojans. Who was the first, and who the last to be slaughtered by Hector, son of Priam, and by brazen Ares? Tuthras first, and then Orestes, whipper of horses, Trechus the spearman from Aetolia, and Oenomas, Helena, son of Oenop, and Oresbius with his glittering loinplate, who lived in Hyl, carefully husbanding his wealth. On the shore of the Cephisian lake, and near him lived other Boeotians, possessors of a richly fertile land. When the goddess white-armed Hera saw the Argives being slaughtered in the fierce crush of battle, she straightway addressed Athena in winged words, Daughter of Zeus, the Aegis wearer, Atritone, this will not do. Worthless indeed was the undertaking we gave to Menelaus, that he would sack strongly walled Ilium before returning home, if we allow murderous Ares to rage in this way. Come now, let us too also call up our surging courage. So she spoke, and the goddess gray-eyed Athena did not disobey her. Hera set about harnessing her horses with golden headbands. Hera, elder goddess, daughter of great Cronus, and Hebe quickly fitted the curved wheels to the chariot. These are bronze, with eight spokes, on the ends of the iron axle. Their rims are made of gold, imperishable, and on them are fitted tires of bronze, a wonder to look on, and the hubs are made of silver, revolving on both sides. The car is woven of tightly plaited gold and silver straps, and there are double rails running right round it. From it extends a silver pole, and on to its end Hera lashed a fine golden yoke and to this she fastened the golden yoke straps. Then she led her swift-footed horses under the yoke, impatient for strife and the battle cry. And Athena, the daughter of Zeus who wears the Aegis, let fall onto her father's threshold the soft embroidered robe, which she herself had labored over with her own hands, and put on the tunic of Zeus who gathers the clouds, and clothed herself in armor for war, the bringer of tears. Around her shoulders she threw the tasseled Aegis, a terrifying sight, around which is set in a circle panic, and with it strife and courage, and with it chilling rout, and with it the head of the hideous monster Gorgon, terrifying and grim, a portent of Zeus who wears the Aegis. On her head she placed a twin-crested helmet with four plates, golden, decorated with foot soldiers from a hundred cities. She stepped onto the brightly blazing chariot and gripped the spear, heavy, thick, and massive, with which she beats down ranks of men of heroes with whom she, child of a mighty father, is enraged. Then Hera quickly lashed the horses with her whip, and of their own accord the gates of the high sky groaned open, gates held by the seasons, who have charge of the great sky and Olympus, either to push aside the dense cloud or to close it up together. Through these gates they steered the horses, driven on by the whip, and they found the son of Cronus, sitting apart from the other gods on the topmost peak of many-ridged Olympus. There the goddess white-armed Hera reigned in the horses and put a question to Zeus, the supreme son of Crona, saying, Father Zeus, are you not angry with Ares for these cruel deeds, the great numbers of fine Achaean people he has killed, pointlessly and recklessly, a cause of grief to me? While Cyprus and Apollo of the Silver Bow take their ease, delighted to have unleashed this madman who has no notion of divine order. Father Zeus, Will you be at all angry with me if I give Ares a painful thrashing and drive him from the battlefield? Then in answer Zeus, who gathers the clouds, addressed her. I will not, 
Stir up Athena who gathers the spoils against him, for she is the one most used to dealing out harsh pain to him. So he spoke, and the goddess white-armed Hera did not disobey him, and whipped the horses, and they flew willingly onward between the earth and the high sky, set with stars. As far as a man can see with his eyes into the misty distance as he sits on a lookout, gazing out over the wine-faced sea, so far is the leap of the loud whinnying horses of the gods. When they came to Troy and the streams of the two rivers, to the place where Simoes and Scamander unite their waters, there the goddess white-armed Hera reigned in the horses and freed them from the chariot, and poured a thick mist around them, and Simoes thrust up ambrosia for them to graze on. But the two goddesses set out, stepping like wild pigeons, full of rage to come to the help of the Argives. When they came to where the most numerous and the best men were standing, crowding around the mighty horsebreaker Diomedes, in the likeness of flesh-devouring lions or wild boars whose strength is in no way feeble, there the goddess white-armed Hera stopped and cried aloud, taking the appearance of great-hearted Stentor the brazen voice, whose shout was as loud as that of fifty other men. Shame, Argives! You things of disgrace, admired only for your handsome looks. As long as glorious Achilles came into the battle, the Trojans never marched out in front of the Dardanian gates, because they were in terror of his massive spear. But now they are fighting far from their sit by our hollow ships. So speaking, she quickened the fury and spirit in each man. Then the goddess gray-eyed Athena made quickly for the son of Tydeus, and she found the lord beside his horses and chariot cooling the wound which Pandarus had dealt him with his arrow. For sweat was causing the broad strap of his round shield to chafe it. It was troubling him, and his hand was growing weary as he held up the strap and wiped away the dark blood. The goddess laid her hand on the horse's yoke and spoke to him. Truly Tydeus fathered a son who bears him little resemblance. Tydeus was short in stature, but he was a fighter. Even at the time when I would not allow him to fight or push himself forward, when alone of the Achaeans he came as an envoy to Thebes, alone among a crowd of Cadmeans. And I told him to restrain himself as he feasted in their halls, even then, with the same audacious spirit as in former times, he challenged the young Cadmeans and beat them in every event. Easily, that was the kind of supporter I was to him. And now here I stand beside you and keep you from harm, and with all my heart urge you to do battle with the Trojans but either weariness from your many assaults has sunk into your limbs, or perhaps it is heart-sapping fear that has gripped you. If so, you are no offspring of Tydeus, the son of war-minded Oenius. Then in answer, mighty Diomedes addressed her, I know you, goddess, daughter of Zeus, who wears the aegis, so I shall speak openly and hide nothing from you. It is not heart-sapping fear that grips me, nor irresolution. I am still holding in my mind the commands that you gave me. You would not allow me to fight the blessed gods face to face, except only that if Aphrodite, daughter of Zeus, should enter the battle I was allowed to wound her with the sharp bronze. For that reason I am now falling back, and I have ordered all the rest of the Argives to gather around me here. I can see that it is Ares who is lording it on the battlefield. Then in answer, the goddess grey-eyed Athena addressed him, Diomede, son of Tydeus, delight of my heart, you should not on this account be afraid of Ares or any other of the immortals. That is the kind of support I give to you. So come now, direct your single-hoofed horses first against Ares. Go close and strike him. Do not be in awe of impetuous Ares, this crazed god, this shape formed of evil, this two-faced scoundrel, who not long ago spoke with Hera and me and undertook to fight against the Trojans and bring aid to the Argives, but now stands alongside the Trojans, and has forgotten his promise. So speaking, she pulled Sthenelus back with her hand and shoved him from the chariot towards the ground, and he quickly leapt down. She mounted the chariot and stood beside glorious Diomedes, a raging goddess, and the oaken axle groaned aloud at its load, for it carried a fearsome goddess and the best of men. Pallas Athena laid hold of the whip and reins, and at once directed the single-hoofed horses straight at Ares, who was stripping the armor from huge Perifa, Ochesius's illustrious son by far the best man of the Aetolians. Blood-stained Ares was busy stripping him, but Athena put on the helmet of Hade, so that the towering god should not see her. When Ares, doom of mortals, saw glorious Diomedes, he left monstrous Periphas to lie there, in the place where he had killed him and robbed him of his life, and made straight for Diomedes, breaker of horses. When they had advanced to within close range of each other, 
Ares first lunged over the yoke and the horse's reins with his bronze-tipped spear, raging to take the life from him. But the goddess gray-eyed Athena caught it with her hand and forced it up and out of the chariot, so that it flew aimlessly by. Then Diomedes, master of the war cry, lunged in his turn with his bronze-tipped spear, and Pallas Athena drove it at the base of Ares' belly, where his loinplate was belted. Here Diomedes hit and wounded him, biting through his fine flesh, and pulled the spear out again. Brazen airs bellowed, as loud as the yells of nine or ten thousand men grappling with each other on a battlefield in the war god's strife. At this, fear and trembling seized both Achaeans and Trojans. So loud was the bellowing of Ares, insatiable in war. Like a dark mass of air that appears out of the clouds when a violent wind springs up after burning heat, so brazen Ares appeared before Tydeus' son, Diomede rising with the clouds right up to the wide high sky. Quickly he came to the seat of the gods, steep Olympus, and took his seat next to Zeus, Cronus's son, grieving in his heart, and showed him the immortal blood flowing from the wound. Full of complaint he addressed Zeus with winged words. Father Zeus, are you not angry when you see cruel deeds like this? We gods always have to endure the most appalling sufferings through each other's scheming when we do favors to men. We are all at war with you because you fathered this witless girl, this cursed goddess, whose mind is always set on deeds of malice. All of the other gods who live on Olympus obey your will, and we are each of us subject to you. But her you do not reproach in word or deed, but let her run free, just because you yourself are the father of this murderous child. Now she has let loose Tydeus's son, arrogant Diomedes, in crazed assault against the immortal gods. First he closed with Cyprus and wounded her on the wrist, then hurled himself at me, Ares himself, like some divine being. But my swift feet carried me away, or I would now be suffering long-lasting anguish there among the ghastly piles of dead, or would live on enfeebled by the blows of his bronze. Zeus, who gathers the clouds, looked at him darkly and said, You two-faced scoundrel, do not sit here and whine to me. Of all the gods who live on Olympus, you are the most hateful to me. Strife and war and fighting are always dear to your heart. Your mother's spirit, too, is ungovernable, one that does not yield, Hera, whom I find it hard to control with my words. So I think it is at her prompting that you are suffering like this. Even so, I shall not allow you to be in pain any longer, for you are my offspring, and your mother bore you to me. But if any other god had fathered you to cause such carnage, you would long ago have been lower than the offspring of Uranus. So he spoke, and summoned Paeon to cure him and Paeon spread pain-killing ointments over his wound and healed it, for Ares was not made to suffer death. As when fig juice thickens white milk when it is liquid but very quickly becomes clotted when a man stirs it, so swiftly did Paeon heal impetuous Ares. Then Hebe bathed him, and dressed him in fine clothes, and he took his seat beside Cronus's son Zeus, exulting in his glory. Then the two goddesses returned to the house of great Zeus, Argive Hera and Athena of Alakamene, when they had halted the man-slaying exploits of Ares, Doom of Mortals. Book 6 So the grim fighting of Trojans and Achaeans was left to itself, and the battle ranged widely, this way and that over the plain, each side aiming their bronze-tipped spears at the other in the ground between the waters of Simoais and Xanthus. Iac, son of Telamon, bulwark of the Achaeans, was the first to break through the Trojan line, bringing hope to his companion by striking down a man who was the best of the Thracians, Achamas, son of Eucerus, a valiant and mighty man. Throwing first, Ajax hit him on the ridge of his horsehair-crested helmet, and the bronze point lodged in his forehead, piercing Hru to the bone, and darkness covered his eyes. Then Diomedes, master of the war cry, killed Axylus, the son of Teuthros, who lived in well-built Arisby. He was rich in possessions and hospitable towards men, for his house was by the roadside and he would entertain everyone. But not one of these could now save him from miserable death by standing before him to face his enemy. Diomedes robbed two men of their lives, Axylus and his attendant Calesius, who was his charioteer at this time, and both sank below the earth. Euryalus killed first Dressus and then Opheltius, and went after Aesopus and Pedasus, whom long ago the river Nympha Barbare had borne to blameless Bucolion. Bucolion was the son of splendid Laomedon, his first to be born, but his mother gave birth to him in secret. 
Bucolian lay in love with this nymph while tending his sheep, and she conceived and gave birth to twin sons. But Mecistius' son loosened their fury and shining limbs, and he stripped the armor from their shoulder. Next, Polypoat, steadfast in war, killed Astyalus, and Odysseus with his bronze-tipped spear slew Pidite, who came from Percote, and Teucer killed brilliant Araton. Ablerus was killed by the shining spear of Antilochus, Nestor's son, and Agamemnon, lord of men, slew Elatus, who lived beside the banks of broad-flowing Satnioas, in steep Pedasa. The hero Letus overtook Philicus as he was running away, and Eurypylus slew Melanthius. Next Menelaus, master of the war cry, captured Adrestus alive, his horses, bolting in panic over the plain, had tripped over a tamarisk branch and broken the pole away where it was joined to the curved chariot, and had run off by themselves towards the city, where the rest of the Trojans were fleeing in terror. Adrestus was whirled out of the chariot next to the wee, head first onto his face in the dust. Menelaus, Atreus's son, stood over him, holding his far-shadowing spear, and Adrestus grasped him by the knees, entreating him. Son of Atreus, take me alive and accept a fitting ransom. There is much treasure stored up in my rich father's house, bronze and gold and elaborately worked iron, from which my father would gladly give you a boundless ransom if he learnt that I was alive by the ships of the Achaeans. So he spoke, and would have persuaded the heart in Menelaus's breast. He was about to hand him over to his attendant to escort to the swift ships of the Achaeans, but Agamemnon ran up and stood before him, and berated him loudly. My dear brother Menelaus, why so concerned for other men? Can it be that you were so generously treated by Trojans back in your own home? Let not one of them escape sheer ruin at our hand. Not even the man-child which a mother carries in her womb. Not even him. But let them all be obliterated from Troy. To vanish, unremembered. So speaking, the hero turned his brother's purpose, urging destiny's decree, and Menelaus thrust the hero Adrestus from him with his hand, and Lord Agamemnon stabbed him in the side. Adrestus fell back, and Atreus's son set his heel on his chest and pulled out the ash spear. Next Nestor called out to the Argives with a great shout, Friends, Dana and heroes, attendants of Ares, let no one hang back here, greedy for spoils, hoping to carry the biggest portion back to his ships. Killing men is our task. Afterwards you may take booty when you will, stripping the bodies that lie about the plain. So he spoke, and quickened the fury and spirit in each man. And then the Trojans, dear to Ares, would have been forced back into Ilium by the Achaeans, overcome by feebleness of spirit, had not a man stood next to Aeneas and Hector, Priam's son, Hellenist, by far the best of bird interpreters, who said to them, Aeneas and Hector, on you, above all Trojans and Lycian, rests the labor of war, since you are the best at both fighting and planning, whatever the enterprise. Make a stand here, Go up and down among the people and rally them in front of the gates before they run away and fall into their women's arms, and become a joy to our enemies. Then, when you have stirred all the companies to action, we shall make our stand here and fight with the Danans, even though we are very weary, for necessity bears hard on us. But ye, Hector, must go into the city and speak there to your mother and mine. Tell her to gather the matrons at the temple of grey-eyed Athena on the city's height, and to unlock the doors of the sacred house and tell her to choose the robe which she judges to be the loveliest and largest in her hall, and which is most precious to her, and to lay it on the knees of Athena of the beautiful hair, and to promise to sacrifice twelve heifers in her temple, yearlings untouched by the goad, in the hope that Athena will pity the city and the Trojans' wives and their infant children. So she may keep the son of Tydeus away from sacred Ilium, that savage spearman, ruthless deviser of panic rout, the one I reckon to be the mightiest of the Achaeans. Not even Achilles, leader of men, caused us so much terror, and they say he is the son of a goddess. But this man's rage goes too far, and no man can match him in fury. So he spoke, and Hector did not disobey his brother. At once he leapt fully armed from his chariot to the ground, and ranged through the whole army, shaking his two sharp spears, stirring them to fight and rousing up the grim conflict. They rallied and took their stand facing the Achaeans and the Argives gave ground and left off the slaughter, thinking some immortal had come from the starry high sky to give help to the Trojans, seeing how they had rallied. Then Hector gave a great shout and called out to the Trojans, High-hearted Trojans, and you allies of far renown, be met, my friend, 
and call up your surging courage while I go back into Ilium to talk to the elders, who are our counselors, and tell our wives to pray to the gods and to promise to make them an offering of hecatombs. So Hector of the glittering helmet spoke, and went on his way, and the dark hide kept knocking at his ankles and neck, the hide which ran as an outer rim around his bossed shield. Now Glaucus, Hippolochus's son, and the son of Tydeus came together in the ground between the sides, in a rage to fight. When they had advanced to within close range of each other, Diomedes, master of the war cry, was the first to speak. Who among men doomed to die are you, my lord? I have never seen you in the battle where men win glory before, and yet now you have gone far beyond everyone else in daring, since you stand up against my far-shadowing spear. Unhappy are the parents whose sons oppose my fury. But if you are some immortal, come down from the high sky, I am not the kind of man to fight against sky-dwelling gods. Not even the son of Dryas, mighty Lycurga, not even he lived for long after quarreling with the gods of the high sky. Long ago he pursued the nurses of frenzy Dionysus throughout the sacred land of Nysa. They all threw their Bacchic staffs to the ground, wounded by the ox goat of man-slaying Lycurgus, and Dionysus fled, plunging below the sea's waves, and Thetis took him terrified to her bosom, for cruel trembling had seized him at the man's threat. But then the gods who live at their ease were angry with Lycurgus, and Cronus's son blinded him, and indeed he did not have long to live, since he was hated by all the immortal gods. So I too am unwilling to fight against the blessed gods, but if you are one of mortals who eat the fruit of the tilled earth, come closer, so that you may sooner be caught in the snares of death. Then the illustrious son of Hippolochus addressed him, Great-spirited son of Tydeus, why do you ask about my family? As is the family of leaves, so it is also with men. The wind scatters the leaves on the ground, but the forest breaks into bud and makes more when the spring season comes round. So, with the family of men, one generation grows and another ceases. But if you really want to know for certain, to find out exactly about my family, it is one which many people know. There is a sit ephyre, in a corner of horse-rearing Argos, and here lived Sisyphus, who more than any man loved gain, Sisyphus, son of Aeolus. He fathered a son, Glaucus, and Glaucus had a son, blameless Bellerophon, to whom the gods gave beauty and manhood fit to win lovers, but Proetus planned mischief for him in his heart, and since he was much stronger drove him out of the land of Argos, for Zeus had made him subject to Proetus's staff of power. Proetus's wife, glorious Antea, was mad with desire for him, and longed to make secret love with him, but she could not sway sagacious Bellerophon, because he was a right-thinking man. Accordingly, the queen spoke deceitfully to Proetus. Proetus, you must kill Bellerophon, or else be killed yourself. He wanted to make love with me against my will. So she spoke, and anger seized her lord at what he had heard, but he held back from killing, for he felt awe at this in his heart. Instead, he sent Bellerophon to Lycia, and gave him some deadly signs. Many life-destroying things, marked by him in a folded tablet, and told him to show these to his father-in-law, so ensuring his death. So Bellerophon set off for Lycia under the gods' blameless guidance, but when he reached Lycia and the flowing Xanthus, the king of broad Lycia treated him with honor and generosity. For nine days he entertained him, and sacrificed nine oxen, but when rosy-fingered dawn appeared on the tenth day, he questioned Bellerophon and asked to see the message that he had brought for him from his son-in-law, Proda. When he was given the deadly message from his son-in-law, he first of all ordered Bellerophon to kill the ferocious Chimera. This was a being sprung from the gods, not from men, a lion in front, a serpent behind, and in her middle a goat, and she breathed out a terrible fury of blazing fire. Bellerophon, guided by portents from the gods, killed her. For his second task he fought with the far-famed Solimi, and this, he said, was the hardest battle with men he had endured. Then for his third task he slew the Amazons, who are a match for men. But on his return the king wove another cunning plot against him. After choosing the best fighters from broad Lycia he set them in an ambush, but they did not return home, because blameless Bellerophon slaughtered them to a man. When the king realized that he was of noble, divine descent, he kept him in Lycia and offered him his own daughter and gave him half of all the honors of his kingship, and the Lycians cut out for him an estate of their very best land, fine country of vineyards and plowland, for him to cultivate. 
War-minded Bellerophon's wife bore him three children, Isandrus and Hippolochus and Laodimea. Zeus the counselor lay with Laodimea, and she gave birth to godlike Sarpedon, whose helmet is made of bronze. But even Bellerophon came to be hated by all the gods, and he wandered on his own over the Aleian plain, gnawing at his spirit and avoiding the trodden ways of men. His son Asandrus was killed by Ari, insatiable in war, while fighting against the far-famed Solimi, and Artemis of the Golden Reigns became angry with Laodamia and killed her. Hippolochus was my father, and I declare myself his son. He sent me to Troy, and would often give me instructions, always to be the best and to stand out above other men, and not to bring disgrace on my father's family, who were by far the most distinguished in Ephir and in broad Lycia. This, then, is the family and bloodline which I boast is mine. So he spoke, and Diomedes, master of the war crop, was glad. He planted his spear in the earth that nourishes many, and addressed the shepherd of the people in affectionate words. You must then be a guest friend of my family from ancient times. Long ago, glorious Oeneus entertained blameless Bellerophon in his halls and kept him there for twenty days, and they gave each other fine gifts of guest friendship. Oeneus gave Bellerophon a belt, shining with purple dye, and Bellerophon gave Oaneus a gold two-handled cup, which I left behind in my palace when I came here. Tidius I do not remember, as I was still small when he left me, at the time when the Achaean force perished at Thebes. Therefore I am your dear guest friend in the heart of Argos, and you are mine in Lycia whenever I go to that land. Let us then avoid each other's spears. Even in the thick of battle, there are many Trojans and their far-famed allies for me to kill whoever a god sends me and my legs can overtake, and there are many Achaeans from whom you may slay those you can. Let us exchange our armor, so that these men too may know that we claim to be guest friends from our grandfather's time. So they spoke together, and jumped down from their chariots, and clasped each other's hands and made their friendship firm. But then Zeus the son of Cronus took away Glaucus's wit, since he exchanged armor with Diomede, Tydeus' son gold in return for bronze, a hundred oxen's worth for nine. Now when Hector had reached the Scaean gates and the oak tree, the Trojans' wives and daughters ran up and surrounded him, asking about their sons and brothers and relations and husbands. But he told them all to pray to the gods, each in turn, for misery was already in store for many of them. When he arrived at Priam's splendid house, which was constructed with polished stone porticos, in it there were fifty chambers made of polished stone built so as to be close to each other. And there the sons of Priam used to sleep next to their wedded wives, and opposite, for his daughter, opening off the courtyard. There were twelve roofed chambers made of polished stone, built so as to be close to each other. And there the sons-in-law of Priam used to sleep next to their respected wives. There his mother, the gently dowered lady, came to meet him, bringing with her Laodice, the most beautiful of her daughter. She gripped his hand tightly in hers, and addressed him, saying, My child, why ever have you left the daring battle to come here? The sons of the Achaeans, evil nay, must be pressing hard on you as they wage war around the city, and your heart has sent you to come here and hold your hands up to Zeus from the city's height. Wait, I beg you, so that I can bring you honey-sweet wine, for you to pour libations to Father Zeus and the other immortals first, and after that you may enjoy it, if you will drink. When a man is weary, Wine greatly increases his fury, even as you are weary, fighting to defend your kinsmen. Then in answer to her Hector of the glittering helmet spoke, My revered mother, do not offer me mine cheering wine, for fear that you sap my limbs' fury, and I forget my courage. And awe restrains me from pouring gleaming wine to Zeus with unwashed hands, nor is it right to pray to Cronus' son of the dark clouds when one is spattered with blood and gore. No. You must go to the temple of Athena who gathers the spoils with offerings. Once you have gathered the matrons together, then choose the robe which you judge to be the loveliest and largest in your hall, and which is most precious to you, and place it on the knees of Athena of the beautiful hair, and promise that you will sacrifice twelve heifers in her temple, yearlings, untouched by the goad. If only she will pity the city and the Trojans' wives and infant children. So may she keep the son of Tydeus away from sacred Ilium that savage spearman, ruthless deviser of panic rout. Go now to the temple of Athena who gathers the spoils, and I shall go in search of Paris, to summon him, to see if he is willing to listen to my words. 
How I wish that the earth would gape beneath him. The Olympian raised him to be a sore affliction to the Trojans and to great-hearted Priam and his sons. If I could see him going down to Hades' house, I could say that my heart had forgotten its joyless grief. So he spoke, and she went away into her house and summoned her servants. And they went through the city to gather the matrons. She herself went down into a sweet-smelling chamber where her robes were stored. Richly embroidered work of Sidonian women whom Alexander himself, who looked like a god, had brought from Sidon when he sailed over the wide sea on the voyage which brought well-born Helen to his home. Lifting out one of these Hecuba took it as a gift for Athena, the one that was the most intricately worked, and the largest, and it shone like a star, and lay stored under all the rest. Then she set off, and many matrons hurried after her. When they reached the temple of Athena on the city's heights, Theano of the beautiful cheeks opened the doors for them. Theana, Sisyphus's daughter, wife of Antenor, breaker of horses, whom the Trojans had made the priestess of Athena. Then they all with loud cries held up their hands to Athena, and Theano of the beautiful cheeks took the robe and laid it on the knees of Athena of the lovely hair, and called out in prayer to the daughter of great Zeus, Lady Athena, city's defender, bright among goddesses, shatter the spear of Diomede, and grant that he may fall face down in front of the Scaean gates, and we will straightway sacrifice twelve heifers to you in your temple, yearlings untouched by the goad, if only you will pity the city and the Trojans' wives and their infant children. So she spoke in prayer, but Pallas Athena lifted her head in denial. Now while they were praying in this way to great Zeus's daughter, Hector had set off for the splendid house of Alexander, which Paris himself had built with the help of those who then were the finest craftsmen in rich-soiled Troy. They had made for him a chamber and a hall and a courtyard next to the houses of Priam and Hector, on the city's heights. There Hector, loved by Zeus, went in, and in his hand was a spear eleven cubits long. The shaft's bronze point gleamed before him, and round it ran a golden neck ring. He found Paris in his chamber, looking after his magnificent armor, his shield and corslet, and turning his curved bow over in his hands. Argive Helen was sitting there with her serving women, instructing her maidservants over their far-famed handiwork. Seeing him, Hector rebuked him with shaming words. You are possessed. It is not good to nurse this anger in your heart. Our peoples are dying, fighting around the city and its steep walls, and it is on your account that war and the battle cry blaze about this city, and you would be quick to quarrel with anyone else you saw holding back in. The face of hateful war. So get to your feet, or the city will soon be destroyed by deadly fire. Then in answer, Alexander, who looked like a god, addressed him. Hector, you rebuke me rightly, and not beyond the proper limit, so I shall answer likewise, and you must listen and mark my words. It is not so much through anger or resentment at the Trojans that I sit in my chamber, but wanting to give way to my misery. But now my wife has persuaded me with beguiling words, urging me to return to battle, and I too think that this would be the better course, since victory shifts from one man to another. But come, wait here a while, and let me put on Ares's armor, or else go first and I shall follow. I think I shall overtake you. So he spoke, and Hector of the glittering helmet did not answer, but Helen addressed him with honey-sweet words. Brother-in-law, I am a bitch and a cold-hearted mischief-maker. I wish that on that first day when my mother bore me an evil storm-wind had carried me away to some mountain or into the surge of the loud roaring sea, where the waves would have swept me away before these things could happen. But since the gods have ordained that these dire things shall be, then I wish that I was the wife of a better man, one who knew the meaning of disgrace and the outrage that men can feel. As for this man, his wits are not firmly fixed, nor will they ever be so, and I think he will receive his reward for that. But come, enter, and sit down on this chair, brother-in-law, since it is your mind that war's toil especially besets, because of me, bitch that I am, and because of Alexander's delusion. Zeus has given us a wretched portion, so that in time hereafter we may become a theme for the songs of generations yet to come. Then in answer great Hector of the glittering helmet said, Do not make me sit, Helen. Loving as you are, you will not win me over, for my heart is already urging me to go to the Trojans' help, since they long for me while I stay away from them. Your task is to rouse this man, and he should stir himself to action, and so be able to catch me up while I am still in the city. Now I will go to my own house, 
in order to see the people of my house and my dear wife and my infant son, since I do not know if I shall ever come back to them again, or if the gods will soon beat me down under the Achaeans' hands. So Hector of the glittering helmet spoke and departed, and quickly came to his well-appointed house. But he did not find white-armed Andromache in his halls. She had left with their son and a finely robed woman servant, and was standing on the tower, crying and lamenting. When Hector could not find his blameless wife at home, he went and stood at the threshold and said to the serving women, Come, serving women, and tell me this truthfully. Where has white-armed Andromache gone from the hall? To my sister's houses, or those of my brother's finely robed wives? Or has she gone to Athena's temple, where all the other lovely-haired Trojan women are seeking to appease the dread goddess? Then in answer his trustworthy housekeeper addressed him, Hector, you order me to speak the truth. She has not gone to your sister's houses or those of your brother's finely robed wives, nor has she gone to Athena's temple, where all the other lovely-haired Trojan women are seeking to appease the dread goddess, but she has gone to the great tower of Ilium, because she has heard that the Trojans are hard-pressed and the Achaeans are triumphant. She went in a great hurry, making towards the wall like a frenzied woman, and a nurse has taken the child with her. So the housekeeper spoke, and Hector hurried from the house, back by the way he had come, along the well-built streets. When he had passed through the great city and had reached the Scaean gates, from where he would go out on to the plain, his richly dowered wife came rushing to meet him, Andromache, the daughter of great-hearted Eshan, Eshan, who had lived under wooded Placus, in Thebe under Placus, and had ruled over the Cilician people, and his daughter was married to bronze-helmeted Hector. She came now to meet him, and the nurse came with her, carrying at her breast the child of tender mind, only a baby, Hector's cherished son, who resembled a beautiful star, and whom he called Scamandrius. But all the rest called Astyanax, because Hector on his own defended Ilium. When he saw the child, Hector smiled without speaking, but Andromache wept tears as she stood beside him, and gripping his hand tightly in hers, she spoke to him, Man possessed, your fury will destroy you. You have no pity for your infant son or for me, ill-fated woman, I who will soon be your widow, for soon the Achaeans will all set on you and kill you. And when I lose you, it will be better for me to sink down below the earth, because when you have gone to meet your death there will be no comfort for me, but only misery. I have no father or revered mother. My father was killed by glorious Achilles when he sacked the well-populated city of the Cilicians, Thebe of the High Gates, though he killed Eshan. He did not strip him of his armor, for he was held back by awe in his heart, but cremated him with his finely worked armor and heaped up a burial mound over him. And the mountain nymphs, daughters of Zeus the Aegis wearer, planted elm trees round it. And as for the seven brothers who lived with me in my halls, they all went down on the same day to the house of Hades. Swift-footed, glorious Achilles slew them, every one, as they tended their shambling oxen and white-fleeced sheep. As for my mother, who was queen under wooded Placus, he carried her off here with the rest of the plunder, but then set her free in return for a boundless ransom. And Artemis the arrow-shooter shot her down in her father's halls. Hector, you are my father and my revered mother and my brother, and you are my tender husband. Come, show me pity and stay here on this tower, and do not make your son an orphan and your wife a widow. Station the people beside the fig tree, where the city is most easily scaled and the wall is open to assault. Three times their best men have made an attempt there, under the two called Idax and far-famed Idomeneus. And under the sons of Atreus and Tydeus's stalwart son, Perhaps some man skilled in divine revelations has told them, or it is their own hearts that instruct them and urge them on. Then in answer great Hector of the glittering helmet addressed her. Wife, all this concerns me too, but I would feel terrible shame before the Trojans and the Trojan women with their trailing robes if I were to hang back from the battle like a coward. Nor does my heart order me to do this, since I have learnt always to be brave and to fight among the foremost Trojans, winning great glory for my father and for myself. For I know full well in my mind and in my heart that the day will come when sacred Troy will be destroyed, and Priam, and the people of Priam of the fine ash spear. Yet I am not as troubled by the Trojans' future pain, or by what Hecuba herself will endure, or Lord Priam, or my brothers, the many and brave men who will fall in the dust. 
overcome by our enemies as much as by your pain, when some bronze-shirted Achaean leads you weeping away, robbing you of the day of freedom, to be in Argos, weaving at the loom at another woman's command, and carrying water from the spring messes or Hyperia, much against your will, and a harsh necessity will lie upon you. And some man, when he sees you shedding a tear, will say, That is the wife of Hector, who was always the greatest of the horse-breaking Trojans when they fought around Ilium. That is what they will say, and it will be a fresh grief for you, widowed of a man who might have saved you from the day of slavery. May I be dead, and hidden under a mound of the heaped earth, before I hear your cries as you are dragged captive away. So speaking illustrious, Hector stretched out his arms to his son, but the boy shrank back, crying into the bosom of his finely girdled nurse, terrified at the sight of his dear father and frightened by the bronze and the horsehair crest, seeing how it nodded on top of his helmet. A terrifying thing. His dear father and his revered mother laughed out loud, and at once illustrious Hector took the helmet from his head and laid it, gleaming brightly, on the ground. He kissed his dear son and dandled him in his arms, and spoke in prayer to Zeus and all the other gods. Zeus, and all you other gods, grant that this son of mine may be marked out above the Trojans as I am, and be strong and brave as me. And may he rule Ilium by might. And may men one day say as he returns from battle, This man is far better than his father. May he kill his enemy and bring home bloody spoils, and may his mother's heart be glad. So he spoke, and laid his son in his dear wife's arms, and she took him to her sweet-smelling bosom, laughing through her tears. Seeing this, her husband pitied her, and stroked her with his hand, and spoke to her, saying, Woman possessed, do not grieve too much for me in your heart. No man is going to dispatch me to Hades before my due time, and as for that time, no man, I say, can ever escape it, whether coward or brave, when once he has been born. Go back to the house and take charge of your own tasks, the loom and the distaff, and tell your women's servants to go about their work. War must be the concern of men, of all those who were born in Ilium, and mine more than any. So speaking, illustrious Hector picked up his helmet with its horsehair crest, and his dear wife set off for home, often turning round to look at him, and weeping huge tears. Very soon she came to the well-appointed house of man-slaying Hector, and inside it she found many women servants, and roused up lamentation in them all. So they wept for Hector in his house while he was still alive, for they did not believe he would come back again from the war, escaping the fury and hands of the Achaeans. Nor had Paris delayed long in his lofty house, but when he had put on his fine armor, intricately worked with bronze, he hurried through the city, confident in his swift feet. As when a horse that is kept at the manger and fed full with barley breaks its tether and gallops exultantly, hoofs drumming over the plain. Since its habit is to bathe in the waters of a sweet-flowing river, it holds its head high and its mane flows about its shoulders. And confident in its splendor, its legs carry it easily to the haunts and pastures of horses. So Paris, Priam's son, strode down from high Pergamus, shining brightly in his armor like the beaming sun, and laughing aloud as his swift feet carried him along. Very soon he caught up with his brother, glorious Hector, as he was about to turn away from the private conversation with his wife. Then Alexander, who looked like a god, was the first to speak. Dear brother, surely I have detained you in your haste by dawdling and not coming at the right time, as you told me. Then in answer, Hector of the glittering helmet addressed him. You are possessed. No one whose judgment is rightly ordered could deny your battle work its due, since you are a stalwart man. But you hang back willfully and refuse to fight, and at that the heart in my breast is pained. When I hear shameful reports about you from the Trojans, who endure great toil on your behalf. Still, let us go on. Later we shall set all this right, if ever Zeus allows us to set up the wine bowl of freedom in our halls, in honor of the gods of the high sky, who live forever. After we have driven the well-grieved Achaeans out of Troy. Book 7 So illustrious Hector spoke, and rushed out of the gates, and with him went his brother Alexander, both raging in their hearts to join the battle and the fighting. As when a god sends a breeze to eager sailors, when they are weary from sweeping the sea with their oars of polished pine, and exhaustion has loosened their limbs, so these two appeared before the desperate Trojans. Then they began the killing. Paris slew King Arethus's son, Menestius, who lived in Arne, 
and he was the son of Erethus, the club wielder and oxide Philomedusa. Hector struck Ioneus in the neck with his sharp spear underneath his fine bronze helmet and loosened his limbs. Glaucus, son of Hippolochus, captain of the Lycians, hit Iphinus, Dexius' son, in the shoulder with his spear in the crush of battle as he leapt up behind his swift mares, and he fell from his chariot to the ground. His limbs slackened. When the goddess gray-eyed Athena saw that these two were cutting down the Argives in the crush of battle, she set off and swept down from the heights of Olympus to sacred Ilium. Apollo, looking down from Pergamus, came to meet her, since he was plotting victory for the Trojans. These two encountered each other by the oak tree, and Lord Apollo, son of Zeus, addressed her first. Daughter of great Zeus, why have you come yet again raging from Olympus, urged on by your great heart? Is it to grant the battle's victory and turn to the Danans, because you have no pity for the Trojans as they die? Come now, listen to me, and it will be much better for us. Let us now put an end to the fighting and the conflict, for this day, and after this, they will fight again, until they reach their goal in Ilium, since it is the desire of you immortal goddesses that this city should be utterly destroyed. Then in answer the goddess gray-eyed Athena addressed him, Let it be so, shooter from afar. Indeed, I too had this in mind when I came from Olympus to join the Trojans and Achaeans. So, tell me, how do you mean to put an end to this war of men? Then in answer, Lord Apollo, son of Zeus, addressed her. Let us arouse savage fury in Hector, breaker of horses, to challenge one of the Danans to fight, man against man, matching strength to strength in the grim conflict. Then perhaps the bronze-grieved Achaeans will be alarmed and will send someone out to fight alone against glorious Hector. So he spoke, and the goddess gray-eyed Athena did not disobey him. Now Helenus, Priam's dear son, understood in his heart the plan which the designing gods had decided upon. He went and stood next to Hector and spoke to him. Hector, son of Priam, the equal of Zeus in scheming, I beg you to listen to me since I am your brother. Make all the other Trojans and Achaeans sit down, but yourself challenge whoever is the best of the Achaeans to fight with you in grim conflict matching strength to strength. I do not think it is your destiny yet to die and meet death. That is how I hear the voice of the gods who live forever. So he spoke, and Hector was mightily glad when he heard his words, and strode into the middle ground, grasping the middle of his spear, and held back the Trojan companies. And they all settled down. And Agamemnon made the well-grieved Achaeans sit down too, and Athena and Apollo of the silver bow settled themselves too taking on the likeness of vultures, and perching on a tall oak tree that was sacred to Father Zeus who wears the aegis, taking pleasure in the sight of the men, whose ranks sat close-packed, bristling with shields and helmets and spears. As when the west wind suddenly springs up and ripples unfurl over the open sea, and the sea grows black beneath it, so were the ranks of Achaeans and Trojans as they settled on the plain. Then Hector spoke out to both sides, Listen to me. Trojans and well-grieved Achaeans, and I will tell you what the spirit in my breast urges me. Cronus's son, who sits on high, has left our oaths unfulfilled, and has misery in mind for both of us in his plans. Until the day that you take Troy with its fine fortifications, or are yourselves beaten down beside your sea-traversing ships. In your midst are the champions of all the Achaeans. If the spirit of any one of them impels him to fight with me, let him come before all as a champion against glorious Hector. This I declare, and may Zeus be a witness for us. If this man should take me down with the sharp-bladed bronze, let him strip my armor and carry it off to his hollow ships, but he should return my body to its home, so that in death the Trojans and their wives may grant me the due right of fire. But if I overcome him, and Apollo grants me my prayer, I shall strip his armor and take it back to sacred Ilium, and hang it in the temple of Apollo who shoots from afar. But him I shall return after death to his well-benched ships, so that the flowing-haired Achaeans may bury him and heap up a grave mound for him beside the broad Hellespont. And one day a man may say, even one of generations to come, as he sails past in his many-benched ship over the wine-faced sea. That is the burial mound of a man who died long ago. He fought as a champion once and illustrious Hector killed him. This is what someone will say, and my fame will never die. So he spoke, and they all remained silent and still. They were ashamed to refuse his challenge, yet afraid to accept it. Finally Menelaus stood up and spoke out among them, rebuking them bitterly, 
and groaning deeply in his heart. Oh, you are full of brave words, Achaean women, no longer men. This will indeed bring contempt on us, beyond endurance, if not a single Dane and man will go to meet Hector. May you all turn into water and earth, each one of you, sitting here bereft of spirit, utterly lacking desire for glory. I myself will put on armor to fight this man. As for the snares of victory, they are held above us by the immortal gods. So he spoke and put on his splendid armor. Then, Menelaus, the end of your life would have come at the hands of Hector, for he was by far the stronger man, had not the kings of the Achaeans leapt up and seized you, and if Atreus' son himself. Wide ruling Agamemnon had not gripped you by the right hand and spoken directly to you, saying, Zeus nurtured Menelaus, you are out of your mind. There is no need for this madness. Restrain yourself, troubled though you are, and do not out of rivalry hope to fight a better man than you, Hector, son of Priam, whom other men shrink to face. Even Achilles shuddered to confront him on the battlefield where men win glory, and he is a far better man than you. No, go now and sit with the band of your companions, and the Achaeans will put forward another champion against this man. Hector may be without fear and unable to get his fill of fighting, but I think that even he will gladly bend his knee in rest if he can escape from the fierce fighting and the grim conflict. So speaking, the hero turned his brother's thoughts aside, urging what destiny had decreed, and Menelaus was persuaded. His attendants then gladly took the armor from his shoulders, but Nestor rose to his feet and spoke out among the Argives. This is not good. Great sorrow is coming to the land of Achaia. Surely Peleus, the aged driver of horses, would groan aloud Peleus, that excellent counselor and speaker of the Myrmidons who once took great delight in questioning me in his house, asking me about the ancestry and birth of all the Argives. If he now heard that they were all cowering before Hector, he would raise his hands repeatedly to the immortal gods, praying for his life to leave his body and go down to Hades' house. Father Zeus and Athena and Apollo, if only I were as young as I was when men fought beside the fast-flowing Celadon, men of Pylos gathered together against spear-wielding Arcadians by the walls of Phaea along the waters of Iardanus. Among them, Eruthalion stood up as a champion, a man like a god, wearing on his shoulders the armor of Lord Arethus, glorious Arethus, to whom men and fine-girdled women gave the name of Club Wielder, because he used to fight not with the bow and arrows nor with the long spear, but would smash enemy companies down with an iron club. Lycurgus killed him by cunning, not by force, on a narrow road, where his iron club could not save him from death. Before he could use it, Lycurgus skewered him through the middle with his spear, and he sprawled on his back on the ground. He stripped Arethus of the armor that brazen Eris had given him, and from this time forward always wore it in the grind of Eris' war. But when Lycurgus was growing old in his halls, he gave it to his dear. Attendant Eruthalion to wear, and he was wearing it when he challenged all our best men. They began to tremble and were terrified and no one dared stand. But my much-enduring spirit released in me the courage to enter the battle, and I was the youngest born of them all. So I fought with him, and Athena fulfilled my boast, and he was the tallest and mightiest man that I ever killed, and there he lay, his bulk spread eagle this way and that. If only I were as young again, with my strength unimpaired. Then Hector of the glittering helmet would soon meet his match. But not one of you, who are champions of all the Achaeans, has the desire and passion to meet Hector face to face. So the old man provoked them, and nine men in all stood up. Easily the first to rise was Agamemnon, lord of men, and next after him rose mighty Diomedes, Tydeus's son, and after them the pair called Ajax, clothed in impetuous courage. And after them Idomeneus and Idomeneus's attendant Meriones, who was the equal of man-slaying Inelius, and after them Eurypylus, the splendid son of Euaimon, and then rose Thoas, Andraemon's son, and glorious Odysseus, all of them eager to do battle with glorious Hector. Then among them Nestor the Gerenian horseman spoke again, Now shake lots thoroughly, to see who will be chosen. That man will surely gladden the well-grieved Achaeans, and will himself be gladdened in his heart. If only he can escape from the fierce fighting and the grim conflict. So he spoke, and they marked their lots, each man his own, and threw them into the helmet of Atreus's son Agamemnon. And the people prayed, holding their hands up to the gods, and this is what they would say, each looking up to the wide high sky. 
Father Zeus, let it be the lot of Ajax, or that of Tydeus' son, or even that of the king himself of Mycenae, rich in gold. So they spoke. Nestor, the Gerenian horseman, shook the helmet, and out leapt the lot that they had indeed wished for, that of Ajax. A herald carried it round the whole group from left to right, showing it to all the Achaean champions, and each man disclaimed it when he did not see his own mark. But when, carrying it round the whole group, he came to the man who had marked and thrown it into the helmet, illustrious Ajax held out his hand, and the herald stood by him and handed it to him. And Ajax saw and recognized his mark, and was glad in his heart. He threw the lot onto the ground at his feet and spoke, My friends, this is indeed my lot, and I am glad in my heart, because I think I shall defeat glorious Hector. So come, while I am putting on my armor for the battle, you must pray to the Lord Zeus, son of Cronus, silently to yourselves, so that the Trojans do not overhear you, or no. Pray out loud, since we have no fear of any man. No one can pit his will against mine and force me back by force or by craft, since I do not think I was born and bred on salamis to be so utterly lacking in skill. So he spoke, and they prayed to Lord Zeus, son of Cronus, and this is what they would say. Each looking up to the wide high sky, Father Zeus, you who rule from Ida, mightiest and most glorious, grant that Ajax may be victorious and win bright glory. But if Hector also is dear to you, and you care for him, give both men equal strength, and make their glory equal. So they spoke, and Ajax began to arm himself in flashing bronze. When he had put all his armor about his body, he then strode out, looking like monstrous Ares advancing when he goes to war and looks for men whom Cronus's son has brought together to fight in the fury of life-devouring strife. Just so Ajax, bulwark of the Achaeans, rose up towering, with a smile on his terrible face, his legs beneath him making great strides while he shook his far-shadowing spear. The Argives were glad when they saw him, but a dreadful trembling stole over the limbs of every Trojan. And even Hector's heart began to knock against his chest, but he could not retreat or turn back into the mass of people, since it was through his own battle lust that he had challenged Ajax. Ajax drew close to him, carrying his tower-like shield, bronze with seven oxide layers, made for him by the craftsman Tychius, by far the best of leather workers, whose home was in Hyl. He had made the flashing seven-oxide shield for Ajax from well-nourished bulls, and had laid on top an eighth layer of bronze. Holding this in front of his chest, Ajax, son of Telamon, stood very close to Hector, and threateningly addressed him. Now, Hector, you will find out for certain, one against one, what kind of champions the Danans also have among them, even apart from Achilles, the lion-hearted breaker of ranks. He is now lying by his curved sea-traversing ships, deeply angry against Agamemnon, shepherd of the people. But we have the kind of men who can stand up against you. And there are many of us. So begin the battle and the fighting. Then in answer, great Hector of the glittering helmet spoke. Ajax, son of Telamon, sprung from Zeus, ruler of the people. Do not put me to the test as if I were some feeble child, or a woman who knows nothing of war's business. No, I know well enough about battles and the killing of men. I know how to handle my toughened shield to the right and the left, which for me is what real shield work means. I know how to storm into the battle of swift chariots, and I know in close combat how to step to deadly Ares's dance. Prepare. I have no wish to look for a chance to catch a man like you unawares with my cast. I will throw openly to see if I can hit you. So he spoke and poised his long shadowing spear and threw it and hit the terrible seven oxide shield of Ajax on its outer covering of bronze, which was the eighth layer upon it. The relentless bronze tore its way through six folds, but was stopped by the seventh hide. Then in his turn Ajax, sprung from Zeus, let fly his far-shadowing spear and hit the perfectly balanced shield of Priam's son. The massive spear passed through the shining shield and forced its way through his intricately worked corslet, it cut clean through Hector's tunic, next to his ribs, but he leaned to one side and avoided death's black specter. Then both together grasped their spears and pulled them out and fell upon each other like flesh-devouring lions, or like wild boars whose strength is far from feeble. Priam's son jabbed his spear at the middle of Ajax's shield, but the bronze did not break through and its tip was bent back. Ajax sprang at Hector and pierced his shield. Straight through went the spear, 
and smashed back his raging advance. Driving on, it cut his neck, and the black blood spurted out. Even so, Hector of the glittering helmet did not stop fighting, but fell back, and in his brawny hand picked up a rock which was lying on the plain, black, jagged, and huge. Hurling this, he hit Ajax's terrible shield of seven hides on its center, on the boss, and the bronze rang out all around. But Ajax in his turn picked up a much bigger stone and whirling round flung it, forcing enormous strength into it, and the millstone-like rock smashed the shield inwards, and Hector's knees crumpled, and he fell onto his back, splayed out, crushed under his shield. But Apollo soon set him upright. Then they surely would have hewed at each other with swords at close quarters, had not the heralds, messengers of Zeus and men, come forward, one a Trojan and the other a bronze-shirted Achaean, Talthebius and Idaeus, both men of good judgment, and held up their staffs in the middle ground between both. And Idaeus the herald, a man skilled in wise counsel, spoke out. Dear sons, put an end to this battle and do not fight any more. Zeus who gathers the clouds holds you both dear and you are both excellent spearmen, this we all know. But now night is upon us, and it is good to give way to night. Then in answer Ajax, son of Telamon, addressed him. Aedaeus, you too must tell Hector to say these words. It was through his own battle lust that he challenged all our champions. Let him be the first to stop, and I will certainly follow his lead. Then in answer to him, huge Hector of the glittering helmet said, Ajax, some god has given you stature and might and sound judgment and you are by far the best Achaean spearfighter. So let us now put an end to fighting and conflict, for today. After this we shall fight again, until some deity decides between us, and gives the victory to one or the other. But now night is upon us, and it is good to give way to night, and then you will bring joy to all the Achaeans beside their ships, and especially whatever kinsmen and companions you have. I, for my part, shall go through the great city of Lord Priam and gladden the Trojans and the Trojan women with their trailing robes who are about to go into the sacred assembly to pray on my account. But come, let us give each other gifts that bring glory with them, so that men from among Achaeans and Trojans may say, Truly these two fought each other in heart-devouring strife, but then they parted and were joined in friendship. So speaking, he fetched a silver-riveted sword and gave it to Ajax together with its scabbard and skillfully cut belt, while Ajax gave him a sword belt, bright with purple dye. So they parted. One went back to the Achaean host and the other left for the gathering of Trojans, and these were glad when they saw him coming, alive and unharmed. Having escaped the fury and irresistible hands of Ajax, they escorted him to the city, scarcely believing he was safe. And on the other side, the well-grieved Achaeans escorted Ajax, exulting in his victory, to glorious Agamemnon. When they reached the huts of Lord Agamemnon, the son of Atreus sacrificed an ox on their behalf, a male beast, five years old, to the all-powerful son of Cronus. This they flayed and prepared, and divided into joints, and chopped the meat skillfully and threaded it onto skewers, and cooked it with great care, and then drew it all off. When they had finished their work and made the meal ready, they feasted, and no one's heart lacked a fair share in the meal. And the hero son of Atreus, wide ruling Agamemnon, honored Ajax with the whole length of the chine. When they had put from themselves the desire for food and drink, then first of all the old man began to weave a scheme, Nestor, whose counsel even before this had proved to be the best. With generous intent he spoke and addressed them, son of Atreus and you other champions of all the Achaeans. Seeing that many flowing-haired Achaeans have been killed, and violent Eras has now spilled their dark blood along Scamander's clear waters, and their shades have gone down to Hades, at dawn you must hold the Achaeans back from fighting. Let us assemble then and bring the dead men back here on wagons hauled by oxen and mules. After that let us burn them a little way from the ships, so that each may take a man's bones home to his children when we return to our native land. Let us then pile up one single grave mound around the pyre, throwing it up in a heap from the ground, and up against it let us quickly build a high-towered wall to protect both ships and men. In this wall let us construct some well-fitting gates, so that there shall be a way through them to drive chariots, and close to it on the outside let us dig a deep ditch, which with its circuit may protect chariots and men, in case we should one day be pressed hard by the proud Trojans' onslaught. So he spoke, 
and all the kings gave their approval. The Trojans also held an assembly on Ilium City Heights, next to Priam's gates. They were full of fear and confusion, and among them sagacious Antenor was the first to speak. Listen to me, Trojans and Dardanians and allies, and I shall tell you what the heart in my breast urges. Come now, let us give Argive Helen and her possessions with her back to Atreus' sons to carry away. We are fighting now because we have broken our solemn oaths. I do not therefore suppose that any advantage will come to us, unless we do as I say. So speaking, he sat down again, and among them there stood up glorious Alexander, husband of Helen of the lovely hair, who answered and addressed winged words to him. Antenor, what you now advise does not please me. You know that you could have thought of some better speech than this. But if you really are in earnest when you say this openly, then surely the gods themselves must have destroyed your wits. So I shall speak out among the Trojans, breakers of horses. I declare outright that I will not give the woman back, though as for the possessions that I brought from Argos to my house. I am willing to give them all back and to add more from my own store. So speaking, he sat down again, and among them there stood up Priam of Dardanus's line, the equal of the gods in council, who with generous intent spoke and addressed them. Listen to me, Trojans and Dardanians and allies, and I shall tell you what the heart in my breast urges. Prepare and eat your supper now throughout the city as always, and be sure to set sentries, and let each man be vigilant. And when dawn comes, let Aedaeus go to the hollow ships and report to Atreus's sons, Agamemnon and Menelaus, the words of Alexander, on whose account this quarrel has arisen. And let him add this shrewd proposal. Ask if they are willing to hold back from war's hideous clamor until we burn our dead. After this, we will fight again, until some deity decides between us, and gives the victory to one side or the other. So he spoke, and they listened carefully and did as he said. Then they ate their supper in ranks throughout the army, and when dawn came Idaeus made his way to the hollow ships, there he found the Danans, attendants of Ares at assembly, beside the stern of Agamemnon's ship. Taking his stand in their midst, the loud-voiced herald addressed them, Sons of Atreus and you other princes of all the Achaeans, Priam and the other splendid Trojans instruct me to report to you, in the hope that it may be acceptable and pleasing to you, the words of Alexander on whose account this quarrel has arisen. As for the possessions which Alexander brought to Troy and his hollow ships, if only he had died before he did, all these he is willing to give back. And to add more from his own store, but as for the wedded wife of glorious Menelaus, he says he will not give her up, though the Trojans strongly urge him to. Furthermore, they told me to invite you, if you are willing, to hold back from war's hideous clamor until we have burnt our dead, and after that we shall fight again until some deity decides between us, and gives the victory to one side or the other. So he spoke, and they all remained silent and still, but at last Diomedes, master of the war cry, spoke among them, Let no man now accept the possessions of Alexander nor Helen, even a very foolish man can see that the snares of death are already fastened tight around the Trojans. So he spoke, and all the sons of the Achaeans shouted their approval, amazed at the words of Diomedes, breaker of horses. Then Lord Agamemnon addressed Idaeus. Idaeus, you have yourself heard the Achaeans' words, how they answer you, and I too am pleased with what they say. But as for burning your dead, I do not at all begrudge at you. When there are dead men, there can be no reason to hold back from appeasing them swiftly with fire, now that they have died. May Zeus, Hera's loud, thundering husband, witness these oaths. So speaking, he held his staff up in the sight of all the gods, and Idaeus went back towards sacred Ilium. Now the Trojans and Dardanians were sitting in assembly, all gathered together, waiting for when Idaeus should come. And he came, and standing in their midst reported his message. Then with great haste they busied themselves with two tasks, some to collect the dead and others to look for wood. And on their side the Argives hurried from their well-benched ships, some to collect the dead and others to look for wood. The sun was rising through the high sky from the deep waters of peacefully flowing ocean, its light beginning to strike the tilled land when the two sides met. It was a hard matter to distinguish one dead man from another, but when they had washed the bloody gore from them with water, weeping warm tears, they lifted them on to wagons. Great Priam forbade them to cry out, and so they piled their dead on to a pyre in silence, grieving in their hearts, 
Then after burning them in the fire, they returned to sacred Ilium. In the same way, the well-grieved Achaeans on their side piled their dead on to a pyre, grieving in their hearts. And after burning them in the fire, they set off for the hollow ships. When it was not yet dawn, but still the night that is half light, a troop of Achaeans, specially chosen, gathered around the pyre and piled up a single grave mound around it, throwing it up in a heap from the ground. And up against it they built a wall with high towers, to protect both ships and men. In this wall they constructed well-fitting gates, so that there should be a way through them to drive chariots and close to it on the outside they dug a deep ditch, great and wide, and inside it they planted stakes. The flowing-haired Achaeans were busying themselves with this and the gods, sitting with Zeus the lightning sender in their midst, marveled at the great work of the bronze-shirted Achaeans. Among them Poseidon the Earthshaker was the first to speak. Father Zeus, is there any mortal left on the boundless earth who will tell the immortals of his thoughts and purposes? Can you not see? Here are the flowing-haired Achaeans again. They have built a wall in front of their ships and have driven a ditch around it, but they have not offered splendid hecatombs to the gods. Doubtless its fame will extend as far as the dawn spreads its light, and then men will forget the wall which Phoebus Apollo and I once labored hard together to build for the hero Laomedon. Then, deeply angered, Zeus who gathers the clouds addressed him. Come, come, earth shaker of wide power, what a thing to say. Some other god might well shudder at this invention, one who was far inferior to you in his hand's strength and his fury, but your fame will surely extend as far as the dawn spreads its light. Consider now, when the flowing-haired Achaeans have after this gone away with their ships to their dear native land, you may tear this wall down and scatter it all over the salt sea, you may cover the great seashore once again with sand, and so, you may be sure, the Achaeans' great wall will be blotted out. So they spoke one to another, in this way. And the sun went down, and the Achaeans' work was finished, and they slaughtered oxen, hut by hut, and ate their supper. Some ships had arrived from Lemnos, carrying wine, many of them, sent by Eunius, who was the son of Jason, he whom Hypsipyle had borne to Jason, shepherd of the people, and as a special gift to Atreus's sons Agamemnon and Menelaus Jason's son gave them a cargo of sweet wine, a thousand measures. From these ships the flowing-haired Achaeans bought their wine, some in exchange for bronze, some in exchange for flashing iron, some in exchange for hides, some in exchange for living cattle, and some in exchange for slaves, and they prepared a splendid feast. Then all night long the flowing-haired Achaeans feasted, and in the city the Trojans and their allies did the same. But all night long Zeus the counselor planned misery for the Achaeans, and kept up a terrifying thunder. Pale fear began to grip them, and they spilled the wine from their cups onto the ground, and no one dared drink until he had made a libation to Cronus's all-powerful son. Then they lay down to rest, and received the gift of sleep. Book 8 Now saffron-robed dawn was spreading over the whole earth, and Zeus, who delights in thunder, called an assembly of gods on the topmost peak of many-ridged Olympus. He himself addressed them, and the gods all listened with care. Hear me, all you gods and goddesses, and I shall tell you what the heart in my breast commands me, and let no one, whether female divinity or male, try to frustrate my plan. You must all approve it here so that I may quickly bring these matters to an end. If I see anyone turning his back on the other gods and wanting to go and help the Trojans or to the Danans, he will be struck down and have a painful return to Olympus, or else I shall seize and hurl him into murky Tartarus far, far away, where there is the deepest pit under the earth. And there are gates of iron and a threshold of bronze as far below Hades as the high sky is above the earth. Then he will learn how far I am the strongest of all the gods. So come now, gods, and test me, so that you all may find out. Let down a rope of gold from the high sky, and all of you, gods and goddesses, take hold of it, even so. However hard you toil at it, you will not be able to drag me, Zeus the Supreme Counselor, from the high sky down to earth. But if ever I were to turn my mind to hauling on the rope, I could pull you up, and the earth and the sea with you, and then I would fasten the rope around a crag of Olympus, and everything would then be left hanging, high in the air. That is how much stronger I am than both gods and men. So he spoke, and they all remained silent and still, amazed at his words, for he had spoken with great force. At last, 
The goddess gray-eyed Athena spoke among them. Our father, son of Cronus, supreme among rulers, we do know well that your strength is irresistible, but for all that we feel pity towards the Danan spearmen, who will surely bring their lives to a miserable end and perish. Still, we shall hold back from the warfare as you command, and will offer to the Argives such counsel as will benefit them, so that they do not all perish as a result of your anger. Then Zeus, who gathers the clouds, smiled at her and said, Be comforted, my dear child, Tritogenia. I did not speak with serious intent, and towards you I am minded to be gentle. So he spoke, and harnessed under the yoke his two horses, brazen-footed swift flyers who had flowing manes of gold and himself put on clothes of gold, and took up his whip, golden and skillfully made, and mounted his chariot. Then he whipped the horses into motion, and they eagerly flew on between the earth and the starry high sky. He came to Ida with its many springs, mother of wild beasts, to Gargarus, where he has a precinct and a smoking altar. There the father of gods and men reigned in his horses and untied them from the chariot, and poured a thick mist about them. He himself sat down on the mountain peaks, exulting in his glory, watching the city of the Trojans and the ships of the Achaeans. Now the long-haired Achaeans took their meal in haste, each in his own hut, and at once began to arm themselves, and on their side, in the city, the Trojans too were arming themselves, fewer in number but still raging to join the battle's MLE through hard necessity, since they were fighting for their wives and children. All the gates were opened, and the people streamed out, soldiers on foot and in chariots, and a huge clamor went up. When the ranks had met in one place and come to grips, then there was a clash of leather shields and spears and the fury of bronze-armored warriors. Bossed shields smashed against each other, and a tremendous clamor arose made up of the groans of dying men and the exultant cries of their killers, and the earth ran with blood. Now, as long as it was still morning and the sacred day was growing, both sides' missiles struck home, and the people kept falling. But when the sun stood astride the midpoint of the high sky, then indeed Father Zeus held up his golden scales, and in them he put two specters of death, the bringer of long misery, one for the horse-breaking Trojans and one for the bronze-shirted Achaeans. Taking the bar by the center, he lifted it up, and the Achaeans' destined day sank down, their specters settled on the earth that nourishes many, while the Trojans leapt up to the broad high sky. Zeus himself thundered loudly from Ida, and let fly a blazing flash into the Achaean host, and when they saw it, they were stunned, and pale fear took hold of them all. Then neither Idomeneus nor Agamemnon had the will to stand firm, nor did the two called Ajax, attendants of Ares, stand firm. Only Gerenian Nestor, protector of the Achaeans, stood his ground, not that he willed it, but his horse was exhausted, hit by an arrow from glorious Alexander. The husband of lovely-haired Helen, it was hit on the top of its head, where a horse's mane starts to grow upon its skull, and it is a most vulnerable point. The arrow sank into its brain, and it reared up at the pain, and reeling from the bronze it stampeded the other horses. While the old man was trying to cut the horse's trace reins, slashing at them with his sword, Hector's swift horses came up through the MLE, carrying their daring charioteer Hector, and then the old man would have lost his life had not Diomedes, master of the war cry, been quick to notice. He gave a terrible cry and urged Odysseus to help him. Son of Laertes, sprung from Zeus, Odysseus of many schemes, where are you running, turning back into the crowd like a coward? Take care. Someone may plant a spear in your back as you flee. Stand firm and let us drive this cruel warrior away from the old man. So he spoke. But much enduring, glorious Odysseus did not hear him, and ran past to the hollow ships of the Achaeans. Tydeus's son, though on his own, plunged into the front fighters and took his stand in front of the chariot of the old man, Neleus's son, and addressed him, speaking with winged words. Old man, it seems that the young fighters are wearing you down. Your power has gone to nothing, painful old age presses hard on you, your attendant is exhausted, and your horses are slowing down. Come now, get up onto my chariot, and you will see what the horses of TROs can do in pursuit and retreat, galloping this way and that across the plain, these inspirers of panic rout, that I captured from Aeneas. Let our two attendants see to your horses, and let us steer mine straight at the horse-breaking Trojans, 
so that Hector may know whether the spear in my hands too is full of rage. So he spoke, and Nestor the Gerenian horseman did not disobey him. Then the two powerful attendants, Senelus and Curtius Eurymedon, saw to Nestor's horses, and the two others got up into the chariot of Diomedes. Then Nestor took the shining reins into his hands and lashed the horses, and they quickly drew close to Hector, who charged straight at them, raging. Tydeus's son threw his spear but missed Hector, and hit his attendant and charioteer who was Eniopeus, the son of arrogant Thebaeus, on his chest next to the nipple as he held the horse's reins. He toppled from the chariot, and his swift-footed horses started back, and there his life and fury were loosened. Bitter grief for his charioteer crowded thick into Hector's heart, but he left him, distressed though he was for his companion, to lie there, and went in search of another bold charioteer, and not for long did his horses lack a master, since he quickly found daring Arcteptolemus, Iphidus's son, and made him mount behind his swift-footed horses, and gave the reins into his hands. Then dreadful deeds impossible to bear would have been done, and they would have been penned inside Troy like lambs, had not the father of gods and men been quick to notice. He thundered terribly, and launched a shining bolt, and made it fall to the ground in front of Diomedes' horses, a terrifying flame of burning sulfur shot up from it. And the horses took fright and cowered under the chariot. The shining reins slipped from Nestor's hands, and he was afraid in his heart and spoke to Diomedes. Quick, Tydeus' son, turn your single-hoofed horses back in flight. Can you not see that there is no courage to be had from Zeus? Now Zeus, the son of Cronus, is granting glory to Hector, for today, though tomorrow it will be our turn, if he so wishes. There is no man, however powerful, who can thrust aside the will of Zeus, since Zeus is much stronger than we are. Then Diomedes, master of the war cry, answered him, Old man, all that you have said is according to due measure. But this is a bitter grief that comes over my heart and spirit, because one day Hector will speak among the Trojans and say, Tydeus' son ran before me and went back to his ships. So one day he will taunt me, then may the wide earth gape before me. Then Nestor, the Gerenian horseman, answered him and said, Ah, son of war-minded Tydeus, what a thing to say. Even if Hector calls you a coward and a weakling, the Trojans and Dardanians will not believe him, nor the wives of the great-spirited Trojan shield-bearers, when you have hurled their tender bedfellows into the dust. So he spoke, and wheeled the single-hoofed horses round in flight, back through the MLE and the Trojans and Hector gave an astonishing shout and showered them with whirring missiles. Great Hector of the glittering helmet shouted loudly after Diomedes, Son of Tydeus, the swift horse Danans used to honor you above others, with the best place, the best meat, and full cups of wine. But now they will despise you. You have turned out to be a woman. Well, away with you, feeble doll. It will not be because of my yielding that you will climb our walls or carry off our women in your ships. Before that happens, I shall give you your destiny. So he spoke, and Tydeus' son's mind was divided, whether to wheel his horses round and fight, matching strength to strength. Three times he pondered in his mind and in his heart, and three times Zeus the counselor thundered from Mount Ida, sending the Trojans a sign that the battle was veering to one side. Then Hector gave a loud shout and called out to the Trojans, Trojans and Lycians and Dardanian hand-to-hand -hand fighters, be men, my friends, and call up your surging courage. I see that the son of Cronus favors us, and promises victory and great glory to me, but affliction for the Danans, those fools, who have devised the fortifications you can see, feeble and futile as they are. They will not hold back my fury. Horses can easily jump across the ditch that they have dug. As soon as I find myself among their hollow ships, then let men turn their thoughts to destructive fire, so that I can set their ships ablaze with flames and kill the Argives next to their ships. Panic-stricken amidst the smoke, so he spoke and summoned his horses and said to them, Xanthus and you, Podargus, Athon and bright Lampus, now is the time when you must repay me for the lavish care that Andromash, daughter of great-hearted Eshan, gave you, serving you mind-cheering wheat and mixing it with wine, to drink when the spirit urged you, before she served me, I who am proud to be her tender husband. So come, press on as fast as you can, and we shall seize the shield of Nestor, whose fame reaches the high sky, 
they say it is all made of gold, both itself and its cross struts. And stripped from the shoulders of horse-breaking Diomedes his finely worked corslet, which Hephaestus labored to make. If we can capture these two things, I could hope that the Achaeans will this very night embark on their swift ships. So he spoke boastfully, and Lady Hera was angry with him, and stirred on her throne, and caused high Olympus to shake. She spoke to the huge god Poseidon face to face. Do you see this, earth shaker of far-reaching power? Not even the heart in your breast has pity for the Danans as they die, yet they bring you many pleasing offerings to Helis and Aege, and you have always desired them to be victorious. Suppose that we who side with the Danans were minded to beat the Trojans back, and so frustrate wide-thundering Zeus, he would surely feel distressed. Sitting there alone on Ida. At this the Lord Earthshaker was deeply angered and answered her, Hera, your words are reckless. What a thing to say. I certainly would not wish the rest of us to fight against Zeus the son of Cronus, since he is very much stronger than we are. So they spoke, one to another, in this way. Meanwhile, the space beyond the ships that was bounded by wall and ditch was filled with both horses and shield-bearing men, close packed together. It was Hector, Priam's son, equal of swift Ares, who penned them in, since Zeus had given him the glory. And he would have burnt the well-balanced ships with blazing fire, had not the lady Hera put it into Agamemnon's mind to take it on himself to set about urging the Achaeans to swift action. He made his way along the huts and ships of the Achaeans, holding his great purple cloak in his brawny hand, and stopped by the deep-bellied black ship of Odysseus, which was in the middle, so that a shout could carry both ways, both towards the huts of Ajax, Telamon's son, and towards Achilles, for these had dragged up their well-balanced ships at the furthest points, trusting in their courage and in the strength of their hands, Agamemnon called out to the Danans in a far-carrying shout, Shame, Argives, you things of disgrace, admired only for your handsome looks. We claim to be the best men, but where are our boasts now? Those empty, loud boasts that you made on Lemnos, as you ate your fill of the meat of straight-horned oxen and drank from bowls that brimmed with wine. You claimed that each man could stand up to one or two hundred Trojans in battle, Yet now we are not even good enough to face one man, Hector, who will soon burn our ships with destructive fire. Father Zeus, did you ever ruin a powerful king like this before, driving delusion into him and robbing him of great glory? And yet I say that I never passed by any splendid altar of yours on my unlucky voyage here in my many-benched ship without burning on all of them the fat and thigh bones of oxen, impatient as I was to sack the strongly walled city of Troy. So, Zeus, I beg you, fulfill this plea at least for me. Grant that we may get away safely and escape, and do not allow the Achaeans to be beaten down like this by the Trojans. So he spoke, and the father pitied him as he wept tears and nodded his assent that his people should survive and not perish. Straight away he sent an eagle, the best omen among winged things, holding in its claws a fawn, the offspring of a swift hind. It dropped the fawn beside the splendid altar of Zeus where the Achaeans used to sacrifice to Zeus, source of all omens. And when they saw that the bird had come from Zeus, they sprang more vigorously at the Trojans and called up their battle lust. Then no man of the Danans, numerous though they were, could boast that he drove his swift horses in front of Tydeus's son, urging them across the ditch, matching his strength in the close fight. Diomedes was easily the first to kill a Trojan chieftain, Agelos, son of Fradman. He had wheeled his horses in flight, and as he turned Diomedes skewered him in the back with his spear right between the shoulders and drove it through his chest. Agelos fell from his chariot, and his armor clattered about him. After him came the sons of Atreus, Agamemnon, and Menelaus, and behind them the two called Ajax, clothed in impetuous courage. And after him Idomeneus, accompanied by his attendant Meriones, the equal of Inelius, slayer of men, and after them came Eurypylus, Euaimon's splendid son. The ninth to come was Teucer, tensing his curved bow, and he took his stand behind the shield of Ajax, Telamon's son. Ajax would lift the shield a little way, and then Teucer would peer out and let fly an arrow, shooting someone down in the MLA, and the man would fall there and give up his life. And Teucer would turn and shelter with Ajax like a child running to its mother 
and Ajax would cover him with his shining shield. Which man of the Trojans did blameless Teucer first kill? The first were Orsilicus and Ormanus and Ophelists, Dator and Chromius and godlike Lycophontes, and Amapon the son of Polyamon, and Melanippus. All of these he laid in quick succession on the all-nourishing earth. Agamemnon, lord of men, was glad to see him slaying whole companies of the Trojans with his powerful bow, and he came and stood beside him and addressed him. Teucer, dear man, son of Telamon, captain of the people, shoot on like this, and perhaps you will prove to be the Danan salvation, and Telamon's, who nurtured you as a child and cared for you in his house. Though you were his bastard, now bring him closer to glory even though he is far away. And I tell you this plainly, and it will surely be fulfilled. If ever Zeus who wears the Aegis and Athena grant that I may tear Ilium apart, that well-built city, it will be in your hands after myself. That I shall first place the prize of honor, either a tripod, or a pair of horses with their chariot, or a woman, who will go up to your bed and share it with you. Then in answer blameless Teucer addressed him, Atreus' glorious son, why do you urge me on when I am eager on my own account? Be sure that while the strength is in me I will not stop. Ever since we forced them back towards Ilium I have been looking for a chance to kill men with my bow. Eight arrows with long barbs I have let fly, and they have all stuck fast in the flesh of war-swift strong young men, but this maddened dog I am not able to strike down. So he spoke, and let fly another arrow from his bowstring, straight at Hector, and his heart longed to shoot him down. But he missed Hector, and with his arrow struck blameless Gorgathion, Priam's brave son in the chest. His mother had come in marriage from Asyme, beautiful Castianera, who was in stature like a goddess. As when in a garden a poppy droops its head to one side, heavy with the weight of its seed and with spring showers, so his head, weighed down by his helmet, slumped to one side. Then Teucer let fly another arrow from his bowstring, straight at Hector, and his heart longed to shoot him down. But he failed a second time, for Apollo made him miss his mark, and he hit Archiptolemus, Hector's daring charioteer, in his chest next to the nipple as he launched himself into battle. He toppled from the chariot, and his swift-footed horses started back, and there his life and fury were loosened. Bitter grief for his charioteer crowded thick into Hector's heart, but he left him there, grieved though he was for his companion, and called to his brother Sebriones, who happened to be nearby, to pick up the horse's reins, and Sebriones heard and obeyed him. Hector himself jumped to the ground from the gleaming chariot with a terrible yell. He picked up a large rock in his hand and made straight for Teucer, his heart driving him on to knock him down. Teucer had pulled a bitter arrow from his quiver and fitted it to the bowstring, as he drew the string back to his shoulder, raging to shoot at him. Hector of the glittering helmet hit him with the jagged rock at the point where the collarbone marks off the neck and chest, and it is a most vulnerable spot, and broke his bowstring. Teucer's hand went numb at the wrist, and he sank to his knees motionless, and the bow fell from his hand. Ajax did not desert his brother when he fell, but ran up and stood over him and sheltered him with his shield. Then two trusty companions lifted him onto their shoulders, Mesistius, the son of Echius, and glorious Alaster, and carried him, groaning deeply, back to the hollow ships. Then once again the Olympians stirred up fury in the Trojans, and they drove the Achaeans straight back towards the deep ditch. Hector strode among the front fighters, exulting in his strength, as when a hound snaps at a wild boar or a lion from behind, biting its flanks and hindquarters and running it down on swift feet, and keenly watches the lion's twists and turns. So Hector pressed hard on the flowing-haired Achaeans, all the time killing the hindmost, and they turned in flight. When they had passed the stakes and crossed the ditch in their flight, and many had been beaten down by Trojan hands, they halted beside the ships and made a stand there, calling out to each other and holding up their hands, each man praying in a loud voice to all the gods, while Hector was wheeling his fine-maned horses this way and that, glaring with the eyes of Gorgo or of Ares. Doom of mortals. When the goddess white-armed Hera saw them, she felt pity, and straightway she addressed Athena with winged words, daughter of Zeus the Aegis wearer, look at this, shall we too give up caring about the Danans as they die? It is our last chance. They will surely bring their lives to a miserable end, dying under the onslaught of one man, Hector, Priam's son, his fury is now irresistible. 
you can see what terrible things he has done. Then in answer to her, the goddess, gray-eyed Athena, said, If only this man could utterly lose his fury and his life, slain in his native land at the hands of the Argives. But my father is crazed, and his mind is set on no good, hard god, always opposing me and frustrating my schemes. He has not the smallest memory of the many times I saved his son when exhausted by the labors that Eurystheus set him. Heracles had only to cry out to the high sky, and Zeus would send me down from the high sky to bring him help. Had I been shrewd enough to know all this in my mind when he was sent down to the house of Hades, the gate guardian, to bring the hound of hateful Hades back from Erebus, he would not have escaped over the fast-flowing streams of Styx. But now Zeus hates me and has carried out Thetis's designs, that one who kissed his knees and took his chin in her hand and entreated him to honor Achilles. Sacker of cities, but the day will come when he calls me his dear gray eyes again. Now you must harness your single-hoofed horses for us. While I go into the palace of Zeus who wears the aegis and clothe myself in armor for war, to see whether Hector of the glittering helmet, Priam's son, will be glad when we two show ourselves along the battle lines of war, or whether the Trojans too will glut the dogs and vultures with their fat and flesh when they fall beside the Achaeans' ships. So she spoke, and the goddess white-armed Hera did not disobey her. She set about harnessing her horses with their golden headbands, Hera, elder goddess, daughter of great Cronus. But Athena, daughter of Zeus who wears the Aegis, let fall onto her father's threshold the soft embroidered robe which she herself had labored over with her own hands and put on the tunic of Zeus, the gatherer of clouds, and clothed herself in armor for war, the bringer of tears. She stepped on to the brightly blazing chariot and gripped the spear, heavy, thick, and massive, with which she beats down ranks of men, of heroes with whom she, child of a mighty father, is enraged. Then Hera quickly lashed the horses with her whip, and of their own accord the gates of the high sky groaned open, gates held by the seasons, who have charge of the great sky and Olympus, either to push aside the dense cloud or to close it up together. Through these gates they steered their horses, driven on by the whip, but when Father Zeus saw them from Ida he was terribly angry, and dispatched Iris the golden-winged with a message. Away now, swift Iris, and turn them back, and do not let them come up against me. It is not good that we should meet in battle. For I tell you this plainly, and it will surely be fulfilled. I shall lame these swift horses in their harness, and I shall fling them both out of the chariot and shatter it to pieces. And not even in the circle of ten returning years will they be healed of the wounds which my thunderbolt will inflict on them, so the gray-eyed one may learn what it is to fight with her father. With Hera I am not so much angry or so incensed, since it is always her custom to thwart me in everything I say. So he spoke, and storm-footed Iris arose to take her message and set off from the mountains of Ida for far Olympus. Just outside the gates of many-valleyed Olympus, she met the pair and tried to stop them, and reported Zeus's words to them. Where is your fury taking you? Why does the heart in you rage so? The son of Cronus will not allow you to help the Argives. The son of Cronus has threatened, and it will be fulfilled, to lame these swift horses of yours in their harness, and to fling you both out of the chariot and shatter it to pieces. And not even in the circle of ten returning years will you be healed of the wounds which his thunderbolt will inflict on you. So you may learn, gray-eyed one, what it is to fight with your father. With Hera he is not so much angry or so incensed, since it is always her custom to thwart him in everything he says. But you are indeed most wretched and a shameless bitch if you are really bold enough to raise your huge spear against Zeus. So Iris of the swift feet spoke and departed from them. And then Hera addressed Athena with these words, Daughter of Zeus who wears the Aegis, I can no longer agree to our fighting against Zeus just for mortal's sake. Let some of them die and let the others live as chance has it, and let Zeus make judgments on the Trojans and the Danans according to the thoughts in his heart, as is right. So she spoke and turned the single-hoofed horses back, and the seasons unyoked the fine-maned horses and tethered them at their immortal mangers and leaned the chariot body against the shining courtyard wall. Then the goddesses took their seats on golden chairs among the rest of the gods, troubled in their hearts. Now Father Zeus had driven his fine-wheeled chariot and horses from Ida to Olympus, and had come to the seat of the gods. The renowned earthshaker unyoked his horses for him, and set the chariot body on its base, and spread a cloth over it. 
Wide, thundering Zeus took his seat on a golden throne, and great Olympus trembled underneath his feet. Only Athena and Hera took their seats apart from Zeus and said nothing to him nor asked him any questions. But he understood in his mind and addressed them. Athena and Hera, why are you so troubled? Surely you are not weary from the battle where men win glory from slaying Trojans, for whom you have a terrible hatred. It is not possible. Such is my fury and my invincible hands, for all the gods on Olympus to turn me from my purpose. But as for you two, trembling seized your bright limbs before you even saw war and the cruel deeds of war. I tell you this plainly, and it would surely have been fulfilled. If my thunderbolt had struck you, you would never have returned in your chariot to Olympus, where the immortals have their seat. So he spoke. And Athena and Hera muttered to each other, sitting close together and planning misery for the Trojans. Athena was silent, saying not a word, being full of resentment towards Father Zeus, and savage bitterness gripped her. But Hera could not contain the anger in her breast, and said, Most dread son of Cronus, what is this that you have said? We know very well that your strength is not negligible, but for all that we feel pity for the Danan spearmen, who will surely bring their lives to a wretched end and die. Still, we will certainly hold back from war, if you command us, and will offer to the Argives such counsel as will benefit them, so that they do not all perish as a result of your anger. Then in answer to her Zeus who gathers the clouds said, In the morning, ox-eyed Lady Hera, if you wish it, you will see the son of Cronus in even greater fury, destroying great numbers of the Argive spearmen's army, for towering Hector will not cease from the fighting until swift-footed Achilles is roused up beside his ship. On the day when they will fight by their ship's sterns in a dreadful narrow space, for the sake of the dead Patroclus, so it is ordained. As for your anger, it does not concern me, not even if you roam as far as the lowest limits of the earth and the sea where Iapetus and Cronus sit, taking no delight in the rays of Hyperion, the sun, or in the winds, and deep Tartarus surrounds them. Even if your wanderings take you there, your ill temper will not concern me. There is no more shameless a bitch than you. So he spoke, and white-armed Hera made no reply. Now the bright light of the sun dropped into ocean, drawing black night over the grain-giving earth. The Trojans were not glad when the light sank down. But for the Achaeans, dark night's coming was welcome, an answer to many prayers. Now illustrious Hector led the Trojans away from the ships and held an assembly beside the swirling river in an open place where the ground was clear of dead men. They jumped to the ground from their chariots and began to listen to the speech which Hector, dear to Zeus, made. In his hand he held a spear eleven cubits long, and the shaft's bronze point gleamed before him, and round it ran a golden neck ring. Leaning on this, he made his speech to the Trojans. Listen to me, Trojans, Dardanians, and allies. I had thought that we would destroy all the Achaeans in their ships, and would then make our way back to windswept Ilium. But darkness has come and prevented us, and that above all has saved the Argives and their ships along the seashore. So let us now give way to Black Knight's persuasion, and prepare our supper. Unyoke your fine-maned horses from their chariots and throw fodder before them. Bring oxen and sturdy sheep from the city quickly. And supply yourselves with mind-cheering wine and bread from your halls and collect a great quantity of wood, so that all night long until early-born dawn we may keep many fires alight. And their brightness may reach the high sky, in case during the night the flowing-haired Achaeans stir themselves to escape over the broad back of the sea. They must not board their ships when they wish, without a fight. No, when they reach home, many of them must have a wound to tend, one inflicted by an arrow or a sharp spear as they leapt onto their ships, so that others too may hesitate before waging tear-laden war against the horse-breaking Trojans. Let the heralds dear to Zeus proclaim throughout the city that boys in their early youth and gray-haired old men should bivouac on the god-built walls around the city and that the women folk should each light a great fire in their halls, and let there be a trustworthy guard set, so that no enemy band may enter the city while its people are absent. Let this be done, great-hearted Trojans, as I declare. Let these sound orders of mine suffice for the present, and I shall make announcements tomorrow to the horse-breaking Trojans. I pray and hope to Zeus and all the other gods that I shall drive these dogs, brought here by death specters, away from here, those whom the specters carry upon their black ships, 
So for this night we must keep watch at our stations. And tomorrow, at break of day, let us put on our armor and wake fierce airs beside the hollow ships, and then I shall know if mighty Diomedes, Tydeus's son, will drive me back from the ships towards the wall, or if I will cut him down with the bronze and carry off his bloody arms. Tomorrow he will discover if he has the courage to withstand the onslaught of my spear, but I rather think that when the sun rises for tomorrow he will lie, speared through in the front ranks, and many of his companions around him. If only I could be immortal and ageless for all my days, and honored as Athena and Apollo are honored, as surely as this coming day will bring ruin to the Argives, so Hector spoke, and the Trojans shouted their approval. They set free their sweating horses from the yoke, and tethered them with leather thongs, each beside his chariot, and from the city they brought oxen and sturdy sheep, quickly. And they supplied themselves with mind-cheering wine and bread from their halls, and collected a great quantity of wood, and they sacrificed perfect hecatombs for the immortals. And the winds carried the savor from the plain up to the high sky. But sweet though it was the blessed gods did not feast on it, and had no wish to, for sacred Ilium was deeply hateful to them, and Priam and the people of Priam of the fine ash spear. So they sat for the whole night along the battle lines of war with great thoughts in mind and their fires burnt in great numbers. As when in the high sky stars shine out in their brilliance around the shining moon when the upper air is windless, and every crag and jutting peak and mountain glen is clear to see, boundless bright air breaks down from the high sky, and all the stars are visible. And the shepherd is glad in his heart. So many were the fires that the Trojans kindled in front of Ilium, shining out between the ships and the streams of Xanthus. A thousand fires were burning on the plain, and beside each sat fifty men in the brightness of the blazing fire. Their horses stood champing on white barley and emmer wheat beside their chariots, waiting for dawn on her lovely throne. Book 9 So the Trojans kept their watch. But the Achaeans were gripped by awesome rout, the companion of chilling panic, and all their best men were struck down by unbearable grief. As when two winds churn up the fish-rich sea, the north wind and the west, blowing from Thrace, suddenly they start up, and the dark waves mass and rise to a crest, and spew out heaps of seaweed along the shore, so were the hearts of the Achaeans torn in their breasts. The son of Atreus was struck to his heart with huge grief and went among the clear-voiced heralds, ordering them to summon each man to an assembly, calling him by name, but not to shout aloud, and he was busy himself with the foremost. They took their seats in the assembly in despair, and Agamemnon stood up, weeping tears like a spring of black water which pours its dark stream down over a sheer cliff. So Agamemnon addressed the Argives, groaning deeply, My friends, chieftains and rulers of the Argives, Zeus the son of Cronus has snared me in a cruel delusion, hard god that he is, who before this promised and assured me that I should return home only after sacking strongly walled Ilium. But now he has planned an evil deception, and orders me to go back to Argos without glory, after losing many people. This must I suppose be pleasing to Zeus the all-powerful, who has indeed destroyed the crowns of many cities, and will do so again, for his might is the greatest of all. But come, let us all be agreed and do as I say. Let us flee with our ships, back to our dear native land, because we shall never take Troy with its wide streets. So he spoke, and they all remained silent and still. For a long time the Achaeans' sons were speechless with despair, but at last Diomedes of the mighty voice spoke among them. Son of Atreus, I will begin by challenging your folly here, Lord, in the assembly, where it is proper. So do not be angry. You have already insulted my courage in front of the Danans, saying that I was no fighter and a coward. And all this is known to the Argives, both young men and old. The son of crooked scheming Cronus gave you gifts by halves. Along with your staff he granted you honor beyond all men, but courage, which confers most authority, he did not give you. Man possessed, do you really think the sons of the Achaeans are no fighters and cowards as you tell us they are? If your own heart especially is urging you to go home, then go. The way lies before you and your ships are stood to by the sea, the many ships that came with you from Mycenae. But the rest of the flowing-haired Achaeans will stay here until such time as we sack Troy, or no, rather let them also take flight in their ships to their dear native land. 
And we too, I and Senedalus, will fight on until we reach our goal in Ilium, for it was with a god that we came here. So he spoke, and the sons of the Achaeans all shouted in approval, amazed at the words of horse-breaking Diomedes. Then the horseman Nestor stood up and spoke among them, Son of Tydeus, in warfare your might is beyond others, and in council you are the best of all men of your age. No one of the Achaeans could treat your words with contempt or argue against them, but your speech did not reach its end, but then you are a young man, and you could be my son, my latest born. Still, there was good sense in your words to the Argive kings, since you spoke according to due measure. But come, because I declare proudly that I am senior to you, let me speak out and make everything plain, and no one will treat my words with scorn. Not even Lord Agamemnon, since shut out from brotherhood, from law, and from hearth, is the man who falls in love with bitter civil discord. Now, for the moment, let us surrender to Black Knight and prepare our meal, and let sentries be posted outside the wall along the ditch we have dug, each in their place. These are the orders I give to the younger men. After that, Atreus's son, you must take the lead, for you are the most kingly. Give your elders a feast, the right thing to do, causing you no shame, since your huts are full of wine, which the Achaean ships bring in every day from Thrace over the broad open sea. All hospitality is your duty, for you rule over many people. When many are gathered together, you must listen to the man who offers the best advice. The Achaeans are all in urgent need of good and shrewd advice, because our enemies are lighting many fires near the ships. And what man could be glad at that? This night will either break the army in pieces or save it. So he spoke, and they listened carefully and did as he said. Out hurried the sentries wearing their armor, led by Thrasymedes, Nestor's son, shepherd of the people, and by Ascalaphus and Iomenus, sons of Ares, and by Mareanus and Aphaerus and Epirus, and by glorious Lycomas, the son of Creon. There were seven captains of the guards, and with each went a hundred young men, holding long spears in their hands. They filed out and took their posts between the ditch and the wall, and there they lit fires, and each man prepared his meal. Then Atreus's son gathered the elders of the Achaeans together in his hut, and set before them a feast to satisfy their hearts. They reached out for the food that lay ready before them, and when they had put away the desire for eating and drinking, the very first to begin weaving his counsel was the old man Nestor, whose advice in time past too had proved to be the best. With generous intent he spoke and addressed them, Most glorious son of Atreus, Agamemnon, lord of men, with you I shall begin, and with you I shall end, because you are lord over many peoples, and Zeus has entrusted to you a staff and ordinances, for you to give counsel on their behalf. Therefore you must above all men give and take advice, and must carry out another's proposal. If his heart urges him to speak for the good, he will depend on you, whatever he begins. Now I shall speak as it seems to me to be best, because there is no one who will think of a better plan than that which I have long held in my mind, and still hold, since the time when Zeus born. You went to Achilles' hut and took away the girl Briseus's daughter, despite his anger, entirely against our judgment, and indeed I did my utmost to dissuade you. But you gave in to your great-hearted spirit and dishonored a mighty man, whom even the immortals have honored, you took his prize and kept it. Still, let us even now consider how we may appease and persuade him with acceptable gifts and with flattering words. Then, in answer, Agamemnon, lord of men, addressed him. Old man, you are not wrong when you describe my delusion. I was deluded, and I myself do not deny it. The man whom Zeus loves in his heart is worth many people, as he has now honored that man, and has beaten down the Achaean people. But because I was deluded and yielded to base feelings, I am willing to make amends, and to pay him a boundless ransom. In the presence of you all, let me name the splendid gifts, seven tripods untouched by fire, and ten talents of gold, twenty gleaming cauldrons, and twelve powerful horses race victors, prize winners with the speed of their feet. The man who came to own all that my single-hoofed horses have brought me in prizes would not be lacking in booty, nor would he be without possession of precious gold. And I will give him seven women, skilled in fine handiwork lesbians, whom I chose when he himself took Lesbos, the well-built city, and they surpassed all womankind in beauty. These I will give him, and with them the one I then took away, Briseus's daughter, 
and moreover I will swear a great oath that I have never gone up to her bed nor lain with her, as is the usual way of mankind between men and women. All these will be put before him immediately, but if some day the gods grant us to sack the great city of Priam, let him enter it at the time when we Achaeans are sharing out the booty and pile his ship high with gold and bronze, all that he wants, and let him choose for himself twenty Trojan women, those who are the most beautiful after Argive Helen. And if we reach Achaean Argos, that most fertile of lands, he can be my son-in-law, and I will treat him like Orestes, my last-born, who is raised amidst great abundance. And I have three daughters in my well-constructed hall, Chrysothemis and Laodice and Iphianassa. Of these he may take the one he chooses to be his own, without bride gifts to Peleus's house. And I will give him dowry gifts as well, in plenty, such as no man has ever given with his daughter. I will give him seven well-populated cities, Cardamile and Enope and Hyre with its grassy pastures, Sacred Phere and Anthea with its deep meadows, beautiful Apea and Pedasus, country of vines. All these are near the sea, on the borders of sandy Pylos, and in them live men who are rich in sheep and rich in cattle, and they will honor him with gifts, as if he were a god. And under his staff's rule they will live in obedient prosperity. All this will I do for him if only he gives up his anger. Let him give way, only Hades is implacable and inflexible, and that is why of all gods he is the most hated by mortals, and let him take his place below me, since I am the more kingly, and because I declare that I am older than him by birth. Then the Gerenian horseman Nestor answered him, and said, Most glorious son of Atreus, Agamemnon, lord of men, the gifts that you now offer Lord Achilles are not to be despised, so come. Let us select men and dispatch them to go without delay to the hut of Achilles, son of Peleus. Come now, let those on whom my eye falls accept this duty. First of all, Phoenix, dear to Zeus, should be the leader, and with him should go huge Ajax and glorious Odysseus. And of the heralds let Odeus and Eurybates accompany them. Bring water for our hands and command holy silence for us to pray to Cronus's son Zeus to see if he will pity us. So he spoke, and his words were pleasing to them all. Straightway heralds poured water over their hands, and young men filled mixing jars to the brim with wine and distributed it to all, after first pouring libations into the cups. When they had made libations and drunk to their heart's desire, they set out from the hut of Atreus's son Agamemnon and the horsemen Gerini and Nestor kept giving them instructions, looking sharply at each man, but especially at Odysseus, as to how they should try to persuade Peleus's blameless son. So they went along the shore of the loud roaring sea, praying earnestly to the earthholder, shaker of the earth, that they would easily persuade the great heart of Aeacus's grandson. And so they came to the huts and ships of the Myrmidons, and they found him delighting his heart with a clear-voiced lyre, fine and intricately worked and on it was a silver cross piece. He had chosen it from the spoils when he sacked Aetian's city. With this he was delighting his heart, singing the glorious deeds of men, and only Patroclus was with him, sitting opposite him in silence, watching for the time when Achilles should end his singing. So they came forward, and glorious Odysseus led them, and stopped in front of him. Achilles leapt up in amazement, still holding his lyre, and left the seat where he had been sitting and likewise Patroclus, when he saw the men, stood up. Swift-footed Achilles greeted and addressed them, Welcome, my true friends. Some pressing need must bring you here, the Achaeans I love the most, even in my anger. So speaking, glorious Achilles led them into his hut, and sat them down on seats spread with bright purple cloths, and at once spoke to Patroclus, who was standing nearby. Son of Menoetius, quick, bring out a larger mixing bowl and make the mixture stronger, and set out a cup for each man. These men who have come under my roof are my dearest friends. So he spoke, and Patroclus obeyed his dear companion. In the light of the fire he set down a great butcher's block, and laid on it the backs of a sheep and a fat goat, and also the chine of a full-grown hog, rich with fat. Automedon held them for him, while glorious Achilles jointed them. He chopped the meat carefully and threaded it on to skewers, and Menoetius's son, a man equal to the gods, built up the fire. When the fire had burned down and the flame had faded, he spread the embers out and laid the skewers above them, resting them on props, and sprinkled sacred salt over them. Then, when he had cooked the meat and piled it onto platters, 
Patroclus fetched bread and set it out on the table in fine baskets, but Achilles apportioned the meat. He then took his seat facing godlike Odysseus against the opposite wall and ordered his companion Patroclus to sacrifice to the gods, and he threw the first pieces into the fire. They reached out for the good things that lay ready before them, and when they had put from themselves the desire for food and drink, Ajax nodded to Phoenix. But glorious Odysseus noticed this, and filling a cup with wine, he drank a toast to Achilles. Greetings, Achilles. We have not lacked our fair share in the feasting, either in the hut of Agamemnon, Atreus's son, or indeed here now, for there is much food here to satisfy our hearts. But pleasant feasts are not now our concern, Zeus-nurtured man. We see great suffering, too great, and we are afraid. It is in the balance whether we save or lose our well-benched ships unless you put on courage's garment. The high-hearted Trojans and their far-famed allies have pitched their camp up against the wall and the ships and have lit many fires throughout their camp, and they think they will no longer be held back, but will fall on our black ships. Zeus, the son of Cronus, reveals signs favorable to them by his lightning on the right, and Hector exults greatly in his strength, raging prodigiously, trusting in Zeus. And respecting neither men nor gods, a cruel frenzy has entered him. He prays for the bright dawn to appear as soon as possible, and vows that he will hack the tops of the stern posts from our ships, and burn the ships themselves with ravaging fire, and cut down the Achaeans beside them. Panic-stricken amidst the smoke, and I have a terrible fear in my heart that the gods will fulfill his threatening words, that it will indeed be our fate to perish here at Troy, far from Argos, rearer of horses. Up then, if you are determined, late though it is, to rescue the weary Achaean sons from the Trojans' war clamor. You will certainly suffer if you delay, for once evil is done there is no cure to be found. Long before that happens, consider how you may keep the day of disaster away from the Danans. My dear friend, your father Peleus, surely impressed this on you on the day that he sent you from Thea to join Agamemnon. My son, as for strength, Athena and Hera will give it to you if they so wish it. But you must curb the great-hearted spirit in your breast, since it is a better thing to preserve good fellowship. Avoid the strife that leads to destruction, and the Argives, both young and old, will show you the more respect. That is what the old man told you, but you are forgetting it. Give way, even now, and leave off your heart-sore bitterness. If you quit your anger, Agamemnon will give you worthy gifts. Come now, listen to me, and I shall describe to you all the gifts which Agamemnon has promised to you from his huts. Seven tripods untouched by fire, and ten talents of gold, twenty gleaming cauldrons, and twelve powerful horses, race victors, prize winners with the speed of their feet. The man who came to own all that his single-hoofed horses have brought him in prizes would not be lacking in booty, nor would he be without possession of precious gold. He will give you seven women, skilled in fine handiwork lesbians, whom he chose when you yourself took Lesbos, the well-built city, and they surpassed all womankind in beauty. These he will give you, and with them the one he then took away, Briseis' daughter and moreover he will swear a great oath that he has never gone up to her bed nor lain with her, as is the usual way of mankind between men and women. All these will be put before you immediately, but if some day the gods grant us to sack the great city of Priam, you may go into it when we Achaeans are sharing out the booty, and pile your ship high with gold and bronze, all that you want, and you may choose for yourself twenty Trojan women, those who are the most beautiful after Argive Helen. And if we reach Achaean Argos, that most fertile of lands, you can be his son-in-law, and he will treat you like Orestes, his last-born, who is raised amidst great abundance. And he has three daughters in his well-constructed hall, Chrysothemis and Laodice and Iphianassa. Of these you may take the one you choose to be your own, without bride gifts, to Peleus' house. And he will give you dowry gifts in addition, in plenty such as no man has ever given with his daughter. He will give you seven well-populated cities, Cardamile and Enope and Hyre with its grassy pastures, Sacred Pharae and Anthea with its deep meadows, beautiful Apea and Pedasus, country of vines. All these are near the sea, on the borders of sandy pylos, and in them live men who are rich in sheep and rich in cattle, and they will honor you with gifts as if you were a god, and under your staff's rule they will live in obedient prosperity. All this will he do for you 
if only you give up your bitterness. But if the hatred in your heart for Atreus's son is now too great, both for the man and his gifts, at any rate have pity on all the rest of the Achaeans suffering in the camp, and they will honor you as a god, and you could well win vast glory in their eyes, for now you could kill Hector since his murderous madness will bring him very close to you, he reckons he has no equal among the Danans who have been brought here in their ships. Then in answer swift-footed Achilles addressed him, Son of Laertes, sprung from Zeus, Odysseus of many schemes, I must say what I say with frankness, and tell you bluntly what thoughts are in my mind and how they will be fulfilled, so that you do not sit there trying to coax me, each in his way. For that man is as hateful to me as the gates of Hades, who hides one thing in his mind but says another. I shall tell you then, what seems best to me. I do not think that Atreus's son Agamemnon will persuade me, or the other Danans, since I now see that battling with the enemy, on and on without ceasing, earns no gratitude. The man who just stands there, and the man who fights bravely get the same share. Coward and brave are equally honored. A man dies just the same, whether he has done much or nothing. I have endured pain in my heart, always risking my life in battle, but I get no more of a share than others, not even a little. Like a bird which brings all the morsels she can find to her unfledged young, and suffers herself because of it, so I too have passed many nights without sleeping, and have come through days that were blood-stained with fighting, struggling against men, fighting for the sake of their wives. Twelve cities of men have I sacked from my ships, and on land I claim eleven such around rich-soiled Troy. From all of these I took much splendid treasure, and always I brought it back and gave it all to Agamemnon, son of Atreus, and he would stay behind by the swift ships and take it, sharing it out in small lots, keeping most for himself. All that he gave as prizes to the chieftains and kings is stored safely in their keeping. From me alone of the Achaeans he took my prize, and keeps the wife who warmed my heart. Well, let him sleep beside her and take his pleasure. Why must Argives make war against Trojans? Why did Atreus's son assemble an army and bring it here? Was it not for lovely-haired Helen's sake? Are then Atreus's sons the only ones among mortal men who love their wives? Surely every good man of sound mind loves his own and cherishes her, just as I, for my part, loved mine from my heart, though she was won by my spear. But now that he has cheated me, taking my prize from my arms, let him not test me. I know him too well. He will not persuade me. No, Odysseus, let him take thought with you and the other kings as to how you may keep destructive fire away from the ships. He has certainly labored very hard while I was absent. He has built a wall, look, and dug a ditch alongside it, a great wide one. And he has planted stakes in it. But for all that he cannot contain the might of Hector, killer of men. So long as I was fighting with the Achaeans, Hector was unwilling to do battle away from his walls, but came only as far as the Scaean gates and the oak tree. There once he waited for me alone, and scarcely escaped my attack. But now, since I have no wish to fight against glorious Hector, tomorrow I shall make a sacrifice to Zeus and all the other gods, and I shall drag my ships down to the sea and pile them full. Then you will see, if you have a mind to and if it matters to you my ships sailing at break of day over the Hellespont rich in fish, and my men in them straining at their oars. And if the famed earthshaker grants me a good voyage, on the third day we should reach rich-soiled Phia. I have much wealth there which I left when I came here to my cost, and from here I shall take more, gold and red bronze, and women with fine girdles and gray iron everything at any rate. That fell to my lot, but my prize, the one he gave me, Lord Agamemnon, Atreus's son, has taken back, violently insulting me. Tell him everything that I am telling you, quite openly, so that the rest of the Achaeans may be angry too, in case he is hoping to cheat some other man of the Danans, clothed as he always is in shamelessness. But as for me, he would not dare to look me in the face, the dog. I will not join him in his counsels or in his actions. He has cheated and wronged me. Let him not try to deceive me again with words. Once is enough. Let him ruin himself as he pleases. Zeus the counselor has robbed him of his wits. I abominate his gifts, and I value him no more than a splinter. Not even if he were to offer me ten or twenty times all that he now possesses, and anything else he may acquire, or all the wealth that flows into Orchomenus or into Thebes in Egypt. 
where the houses are crammed full with treasure, and which has one hundred gates, and two hundred men can ride out through every one, with chariots and horses, not even if he gave me gifts as numerous as the sand or dust. Not even then would Agamemnon win over my heart, until he has paid me back in full for this heart-wounding outrage. I will not marry a daughter of Atreus's son Agamemnon, not even if she rivals golden Aphrodite in her beauty, and is a match for grey-eyed Athena in the work of her hands. Not even then will I marry her. Let him choose another Achaean, whose rank is equal to his, and who is more kingly than I am. If the gods preserve me, and if I reach my home, then surely Peleus himself will search out a wife for me. There are many Achaean women throughout Hellas and Phthia, daughters of chieftains who defend their cities, and whichever of these I want I shall make my dear wife. Indeed, my proud spirit has many times moved me to take a wedded wife there, a well-matched partner, to enjoy the treasures that aged Peleus has amassed. I do not think that anything is of equal worth to my life. Not even all the wealth they say that Ilium, that well-populated city, once possessed in time of peace before the sons of the Achaeans came. Nor all the wealth that the stone threshold of the archer Phoebus Apollo guards inside his temple in Rocky Pytho. Cattle and flocks of sturdy sheep can be got by raiding, and tripods and herds of chestnut horses can be made one's own. But raiding and getting cannot bring back a man's life when once it has passed beyond the barrier of his teeth. My mother, Thetis of the Silver Feet, tells me that there are two specters carrying me towards the end of death. If I remain here and fight around the city of the Trojans, I shall lose my homecoming, but my fame will never die, while if I go back home to my dear native land, my noble fame will be lost. But my life will be long, and the end of death will not come quickly upon me. As for the rest of you, I would advise you all to sail home, because you will never reach your goal of taking sheer Ilium, since Zeus the wide thunderer has stretched his hand over it, and its people have taken heart. So go back now and report my answer plainly to the Achaeans' chieftains, for that is the office of elders, so that they can devise another, better plan in their minds such as will safeguard their ships and the Achaean people beside the hollow ships, since this plan that they have invented as a result of my stubborn anger will not work out for them. But let Phoenix stay behind and spend the night with us, so that he may sail with me on my ships to our dear native land tomorrow, if he so wishes. I will not compel him to come. So he spoke, and they all remained silent and still, amazed at his words, so forcibly had he refused them. But at last Phoenix, the old horse driver, spoke out, bursting into tears, because he feared greatly for the Achaean's ships. Illustrious Achilles, if returning is really in your thoughts, and you have no mind at all to keep destructive fire from the swift ships, because bitterness has entered your heart, how can I be left behind here, dear child, without you, alone? Your father, the old horse driver Peleus, sent me to you on the day that he dispatched you from Thea to Agamemnon a mere lad not yet skilled in warfare that touches all men alike, nor yet in debate, where men grow into distinction. For this reason he sent me to teach you all these things, to be both a speaker of words and a doer of deeds. So, dear child, I have no wish to be left alone after this without you, not even if a god himself were to promise to scrape away my old age and make me young and vigorous, as I was when I first left Hellas of the beautiful women, escaping from a quarrel with my father Aminter or Menace's son, who was furious with me because of a lovely-haired concubine. He was infatuated with her, and dishonored his wife, my mother, and she would take me by the knees, entreating me to lie with the concubine first, to make her loathe the old man. I listened to her and did the deed, but my father quickly found out and cursed me at length and called on the hateful Furies to make sure that he would never set on his knees a dear son who was born to me. And the gods fulfilled his curses, Zeus of the world below and dread Persephone. I planned to kill him with a sharp bronze, but one of the immortals stayed my anger, putting into my mind the talk of my people and how men would censure me, so that I should not be called a father slayer among the Achaeans. After this, the spirit in my breast could no longer be confined to continue living in my father's halls while he was so angry. Even so, my cousins and kinsmen who lived round about earnestly entreated me and tried to keep me there in his halls, and sacrificed many sturdy sheep and shambling crook-horned cattle, and many a hog, rich with fat, was stretched out over Hephaestus's flame to be singed, 
and much wine was drunk from the old man's jars. Nine nights they passed sleeping close around me, keeping watch by turns, and the fires never went out, one in the portico of the well-walled courtyard, and another in the entrance, in front of the doors of my room. But when the tenth dark night came upon me, I broke down the close-fitting doors of my room and escaped, and leapt over the courtyard wall easily, unseen by the men on guard and the women servants. So I became a fugitive through Hellas of the wide dancing floors, and came to rich-soiled Phia, mother of flocks, to Lord Peleus, and he received me with kindness, and loved me as a father loves his own dear son. Alas, born only son, heir to many possessions, and he enriched me, and made over a numerous people to me, and I lived on the frontier of Phia, ruling over the Dilopians. And, godlike Achilles, I made you into the great man you are, loving you with all my heart. You never wanted to go to a feast with anyone else, or to eat a meal in your own halls until I had set you on my knees and given you your fill, first cutting your meat and holding the wine to your lips. Many times have you soaked the tunic on my chest, dribbling wine down it in your childish helplessness. So I have endured much on your account, and toiled hard, knowing that the gods were not going to bring into being any offspring of mine. I made you my son, godlike Achilles, so that one day you could protect me from ugly destruction. So come, Achilles, master your great spirit. You should not have a pitiless heart. Even the gods can be made to bend, though their greatness and honor and power exceed our own. Men can sway them with sacrifices and propitiating prayers, petitioning them with drink offerings and the smoke of burnt offerings, whenever a man has overstepped the mark and done wrong. Indeed, there are pleas for forgiveness, daughters of great Zeus, who are lame and wrinkled, and their eyes are squinting, and their office is to follow in pursuit of delusion. Now delusion is strong and swift-footed, and therefore far outruns them all, and gets in first bringing hurt to men all over the world, but the pleas follow and heal them. If a man respects these daughters of Zeus when they approach, they give him great blessings and listen to his prayers. But if anyone denies and stubbornly rejects them, they go to Cronus's son Zeus and entreat him, asking for delusion to go along with him, so that he will be hurt and pay the price. So come, Achilles, you too must grant the daughters of Zeus the respect that bends the minds of others, fine men though they are. If Atreus's son was not offering you gifts and promising more to come, but was persisting in his furious rage, I would not be telling you to cast your anger aside and to defend the Argives, however much they have need of you. But as it is, he is offering you much now, and has promised more, and he has sent the best men on a mission to entreat you, choosing them from the Achaean people. And they are also the Argives you love most. Do not scorn their words or their coming here, though before this your anger could not be blamed. So it was in former times, too, the famous tales we have heard of heroes, of when violent anger came over one of them. But they were open to gifts, and could be won over by speeches. There is a story I recall from long ago, just as it happened, though it was not a recent event. We are all friends here, so I will tell it to you. The Curites and Aetolians, steadfast in battle, were fighting around the city of Caledon and were slaughtering each other. The Aetolians were defending lovely Caledon while the Curites were raging to sack it in the War of Eras. Artemis of the Golden Throne had sent the Aetolians an evil thing, being angry because Oeneus had not offered her the first fruits from his hillside orchard. The other gods were feasting on hecatombs, and it was only to great Zeus's daughter that he offered nothing. Either he forgot or he did not intend to do it, but his mind was mightily deluded. Furious, the archer goddess, that divine being, sent against him a fierce wild boar, a white-tusked creature, which kept causing great damage by ravaging Oeneus's orchard. It ripped out many tall trees and threw them to the ground, roots, fruits, and blossom all at the same time. This boar was killed by Meliger, the son of Oeneus, after he had gathered together huntsmen and hounds from many cities, for it could not be overcome by a few, so huge it was and had set many men upon the painful pyre. The goddess stirred up a great clamor and uproar over it between the Curites and the great-spirited Aetolians as to who should win the prize of its head and shaggy hide. Now so long as Meliager, dear to Ares, kept fighting, matters went badly for the Curites, and they were not able to stand their ground outside the wall, many as they were, but when anger entered Meliager, such as swells the heart in the breasts of other men too, 
even the sound of mind, because he was angry with his own mother Althea, he lay beside his wedded wife, beautiful Cleopatra, child of Euenus's daughter Marpessa of the lovely ankles, and of Idas, who was the strongest among earth-dwelling men at that time. He it was who took up his bow to challenge Lord Phoebus Apollo over the girl with lovely ankles. Later Cleopatra's father and revered mother gave her the name Alcyone in their halls. Because Marpessa had endured the fate of the mournful kingfisher, the Halcyon, she would weep because Phoebus Apollo, the shooter from afar, had stolen her away. It was beside this Cleopatra that Meliger lay, brooding on his heart-wounding anger, furious at his mother's curses, who was grieving for her brother's killing, and she prayed often to the gods, and many times beat with her hands on the earth that feeds many, sitting hunched forward and soaking her lap with tears as she called upon Hades and dread Persephone to bring death to her son, and the fury, the drinker of blood whose heart cannot be placated, heard her from Erebus, and soon the noise and din of the Curetes rose about the gates as they battered the walls, and the elders of the Aetolians kept sending the best priests of the gods to Meliger, entreating him to come out and fight, and promising him a huge gift. They told him he could choose a magnificent estate in the place where the lovely plain of Caledon was richest a tract of fifty acres, half of it vine-producing country and half cleared plowland, to be carved out for himself. And many times the aged horse-driver Owenius entreated him, standing on the threshold of his high-roofed chamber and rattling its close-jointed doors as he implored his son. Many times his sisters and his revered mother entreated him, but he refused them all the more. Many times his companions tried, those who were closest to him and dearest of all but for all that they could not win over the heart in his breast until missiles rained thick on his chamber and the curates began to climb on the walls and to set fire to the great city. Then indeed his finely girdled wife entreated Meliger with lamentation and described in full all the miseries that happen to people when their city is captured, the enemy kill the men. Fire levels the city with the ground and strangers carry off their children and deep girdled women. When he heard this dreadful tale, Meliger's spirit was quickened, and he set off and put on his brightly gleaming armor. And so, though he had yielded to his anger, he kept the evil day from the Aetolians, but they did not give him the many fine gifts they had promised, and he saved them from disaster for nothing. Do not, I beg you, have thoughts like his, dear boy, and do not let some god turn you on to that course. It will be harder to defend the ships when they are already ablaze. There are the gifts, take them and the Achaeans will honor you like a god. But if you enter the man-destroying conflict without gifts, you will not have the same honor, even if you drive the war away. Then in answer swift-footed Achilles addressed him. Phoenix, aged father, nurtured by Zeus, this is an honor I do not need. It is by Zeus' will, I believe, that I am honored, and this will stay with me beside my curved ships. As long as the breath remains in my breast and my own knees can lift me, but I tell you another thing, and you should store in your mind. Do not break my resolve with your grieving and lamentation, hoping to win favor with the hero son of Atreus. Do not take his side. Or I, who love you, may come to hate you. For you, the honorable course is to hurt the man who hurts me. This way you may have half my kingdom and enjoy half my honor. These men can take my answer back. You must stay here and sleep on a soft bed, and then as soon as dawn appears we shall decide whether to go home or to stay here. So he spoke, and signaled silently to Patroclus with his eyebrows, to make up a thick bed for Phoenix, so that the others might think the sooner of leaving the hut for home. Then Ajax, the godlike son of Telamon, spoke out among them, Son of Laertes, sprung from Zeus, Odysseus of many schemes, let us go. I do not think our embassy's purpose will be fulfilled. On this journey, at any rate, we must quickly report his reply to the Danans, even though it is not good, for they will surely now be sitting waiting for it. Achilles has turned the great-hearted spirit in his breast to cruelty, hard man, and he has no regard for his companion's love, we who used to honor him above all others beside the ships. He is without pity, and yet, a man will accept compensation for his dead brother or his own son from the man who killed him. The murderer pays a great price and stays among his people. And the other's heart and proud spirit are restrained, now that he has accepted amends. But as for you, the gods have given you a harsh and implacable heart in your breast, and all for one girl. 
Now we are offering you seven, the very best and many other gifts besides. So make your heart gracious and respect your obligations as a host. We are here under your roof on behalf of the whole Danan army. And we are eager to remain your nearest and dearest friends among all the Achaeans. Then in answer, swift-footed Achilles addressed him, Ajax, son of Telamon, sprung from Zeus, ruler of the people, all that you have said seems much in keeping with my mind, but my heart swells with bitterness whenever I think of what happened, of how contemptuously Atreus's son treated me before the Argives, like some wandering migrant who has lost his rights. No, go back now and report my answer, in public. I shall not think of entering the blood-stained war until glorious Hector, the son of wise Priam, reaches as far as the huts and ships of the Myrmidons, killing the Argives and consuming the ships with fire. But I think that when he reaches my hut and black ship Hector will be held back, raging though he is for battle. So he spoke, and they each picked up a two-handled cup, made a libation, and returned along the row of ships, and Odysseus led the way. But Patroclus ordered his companions and maids to make up a thick bed for Phoenix as quickly as they could. The women obeyed, and made up the bed as he had told them, with fleeces and a rug and the softest of linen cloths. And there the old man lay down and waited for the bright dawn. But Achilles went to sleep in the inmost part of his well-built hut, and beside him lay a woman whom he had brought from Lesbos, Diomede of the Beautiful Cheeks, the daughter of Forbas. Patroclus lay on the other side, and beside him too was a woman, Iphis of the lovely girdle, whom glorious Achilles had given him when he captured sheer Skyros, the citadel of Aeneas. Now when the others reached the huts of Atreus's son, the sons of the Achaeans stood up and drank their health, one here, one there, in golden cups, and began to question them. And the first to ask a question was Agamemnon, lord of men, Odysseus of many tales, great glory of the Achaeans. Tell me, is he willing to keep destructive fire away from our ships, or did he refuse? And does anger still grip his great-hearted spirit? Then in answer much enduring glorious Odysseus addressed him, most glorious son of Atreus, Agamemnon, lord of men. The man has no mind to quench his anger, but is even more filled with fury, and he repudiates you and your gifts. He tells you to take thought among the Argives as to how you may save both the ships and the Achaean people. As for himself, he threatened that as soon as dawn breaks, he will drag his well-benched, balanced ships down to the sea. Moreover, he said that he advises all the rest of you to sail for home, because you will never reach your goal of taking sheer Ilium, because Zeus the wide thunderer has stretched his hand over it, and its peoples have taken heart. So he spoke, and these who went with me will say the same, Ajax and the two heralds, both men of sound judgment. But the old man Phoenix is sleeping there, urged by Achilles, so that he can sail with him on his ships to his dear native land tomorrow, if he wishes, but he will not compel him to come. So he spoke and they all remained silent and still, amazed at his words, so forcibly had he spoken. For a long time the sons of the Achaeans were speechless with despair, but at last Diomedes, master of the war cry, spoke out among them, Most glorious son of Atreus, Agamemnon, lord of men, I wish that you had never entreated the blameless son of Peleus and offered him countless gifts. He is a proud man at any time, but now you have driven him to even greater arrogance. Let us leave him alone, to decide whether he goes or stays. Later he will fight again, whenever the heart in his breast prompts him to, and a god stirs him up. So come, let us all accept what I say. For the present, all should go to bed, now that you have had your hearts fill of food and wine. For that is our fury and courage. And when lovely dawn with her rosy fingers appears, you must quickly marshal the people and chariots before the ships, and urge them on and fight yourself among the front warriors. So he spoke, and all the kings assented to what he said, amazed at the words of Diomedes, breaker of horses. Then they made libations and went each to his own hut, and there they lay down to rest and received the gift of sleep. Book 10 Now all the other chieftains of the Achaean people slept through the night by their ships, overcome by soft sleep. But sweet sleep did not take hold of Atreus' son Agamemnon, shepherd of the people, as he pondered much in his mind. As when the husband of lovely-haired Hera flashes his lightning, foretelling a heavy fall of rain or a prodigious hailstorm or a blizzard, when snow covers the plowed fields, 
or somewhere opens the great jaws of harrowing war, so Agamemnon kept groaning aloud from the depths of the heart in his breast, and the spirit within him trembled. Whenever he looked towards the plain of Troy, he marveled at the many fires burning before Ilium, and at the noise of pipes and flutes and the clamor of men. But when he looked at the ships and army of the Achaeans, he would tear the hair from his head by the roots, praying to Zeus who sits on high, and his noble heart groaned aloud. And this seemed to him in his heart to be the best plan, to go before all others to Nestor, the son of Neleus, to see if he could with him devise some excellent counsel that would keep disaster away from all the Danans. So he rose and put a tunic about his chest and bound fine sandals under his shining feet, then slung round himself the hide of a great tawny lion, blood dark and reaching to his feet, and picked up his spear. In the same way trembling gripped Menelaus, for with him to sleep would not sit on his eyelids. He was afraid that some harm would befall the Argives, who for his sake had crossed a wide expanse of water to Troy, determined on audacious war. First he covered his broad back with a leopard's dappled skin, then lifted up a bronze helmet and placed it on his head, and with his brawny hand picked up a spear. He set off to rouse his brother, who was the supreme ruler over all the Argives, and was honored by the people like a god. He found him by the stern of his ship, putting his fine armor around his shoulders, and he was glad to see his brother come. Menelaus, master of the war cry, was the first to speak. Brother, why are you arming like this? Are you sending one of your companions to spy on the Trojans? I am terribly afraid that no one will undertake this mission for you, to go out and spy on the enemy forces. Alone in the immortal night, he will have to be a man of very bold heart. Then in answer, Lord Agamemnon addressed him. Zeus nurtured Menelaus, we have need of a plan, you and I, a shrewd one, that will protect and save the Argives and their ships, since Zeus's mind has turned away from us. Clearly, he has heeded Hector's offerings more than ours. I have never seen, nor have I heard anyone tell of, a single man devising as much destruction in one day as Hector, dear to Zeus, has inflicted on the sons of the Achaeans, and on his own, for he is no dear son of a god or goddess. I think that the things he has done will trouble the Argaves for many, many years, such is the harm he has dealt the Achaeans. But go now, run swiftly along the row of ships and summon Ajax and Idomeneus, and I will go in search of glorious Nestor and will urge him to rise, to see if he is willing to go out and give orders to the devoted company of the sentries. They are most likely to listen to him, for it is his son who is in charge of the sentries, he and Idomeneus' attendant Meriones. To them especially we entrusted this duty. Then Menelaus, master of the war cry, answered him, I will. But what do you mean by these orders and instructions? Am I to remain there with them, waiting for you to come, or shall I run back to you when I have given them their orders? Then in answer Agamemnon, lord of men, addressed him, Stay there, in case we somehow miss one another as we go, for there are many footpaths through the camp. Wherever you go, shout aloud to the men to stay awake, reminding each of his ancestry and his father's name, and addressing all with respect. And do not show a haughty spirit. We too must toil on our own account, for this, it seems, is the heavy affliction that Zeus gave us when we were born. So he spoke, and sent his brother on his way with clear orders. He himself set off to look for Nestor, shepherd of the people, and found him beside his hut and his black ship, lying on his soft bed. Next to him lay his intricately worked armor, a shield and a pair of spears and a shining helmet, and by him too lay his bright gleaming belt, which the old man wore round him when he armed for man-destroying war, leading his people, for he would not give in to painful old age. Nestor lifted his head and raised himself on his elbow, and addressed the son of Atreus with a question. Who are you, going alone about the camp and along the ships through the dark night, when other mortals are asleep? Are you looking for one of your mules? or some companion. Speak, do not creep silently up on me. What do you want here? Then in answer Agamemnon, lord of men, addressed him. Nestor, son of Neleus, great glory of the Achaeans, you should recognize Agamemnon, Atreus's son, the one whom Zeus has set amidst endless labors, beyond all men. While there is breath in my breast and my knees can lift me, I am wandering like this because sweet sleep does not sit on my eyes, and the war and the Achaeans' troubles vex me, and I am terribly afraid for the Danans, 
and my heart will not stay still. And I am distraught, and my heart leaps out of my breast, and my bright limbs shake beneath me. If you are minded to act, since sleep does not visit you either, let us go out there to the sentries to inspect them in case they are exhausted by toil and sleeplessness and have fallen asleep and have quite forgotten to keep watch. The enemy are encamped close by and we do not know what they intend. They might even attack us by night. Then Nestor the Gerinian horseman answered him, Most glorious son of Atreus, Agamemnon, Lord of men, Zeus the counselor will surely not fulfill all Hector's designs, everything that he now hopes for. No, I believe that he will have more troubles to struggle with, if only Achilles can turn his dear heart away from his destructive anger. I shall certainly go with you, but let us also wake some others, Tydeus's son, the renowned spearman, and Odysseus, swift-footed Ajax and Megas, the stalwart son of Phileus and someone should go in search of other men too and summon them. I mean godlike Ajax and Lord Idomeneus, for their ships are furthest away on either side and not close by. As for Menelaus, though I love and respect him, I must quarrel with him, and I will not hide it, even if you are angry with me, because he is asleep and has left you to toil on your own. I could wish that he was working now among all the chieftains in treating them, because an intolerable need has come upon us. Then, in answer, Agamemnon, lord of men, addressed him. Old man, at other times I might even urge you to blame him, since he is often remiss and unwilling to take his part in the toil, not because he gives way to cowardice or thoughtlessness, but because he always looks to me and waits for my lead. But this time he woke well before me, and came after me, and I sent him forward to summon the men you are asking about. Come then, let us go. We shall find them with the sentries, in front of the gates, which is where I told them to gather. Then Nestor the Gerenian horseman answered him, If that is so, none of the Argives will be angry with him or disregard him when he gives orders and urges men on. So he spoke, and put a tunic on over his chest, and bound fine sandals under his shining feet, and with a clasp fastened about himself a bright purple cloak, long and double-folded, and it had a thick wool nap on it. He picked up his stout spear, pointed with sharp bronze, and set off along the ships of the bronze-shirted Achaeans. The first man whom the Gerenian horseman Nestor roused from sleep was Odysseus, the equal of Zeus in scheming. He called to him, and the sound flowed quickly around his mind. And he came out of his hut and addressed them, saying, Why are you wandering alone like this about the camp, along the ships, through the immortal night? Has some great need arisen? Then Nestor the Gerenian horseman answered him, Son of Laertes, sprung from Zeus, Odysseus of many schemes, do not be angry. A great grief has indeed crushed the Achaeans. Come, follow me, and we will wake others too, those who should rightly offer their advice as to whether we flee or fight. So he spoke, and Odysseus of many schemes went into his hut and slung a finely worked shield over his shoulders and followed them. They went in search of Tydeus's son Diomedes and found him outside his hut with his armor. Around him his companions were sleeping, their heads on their shields, and their spears had been driven into the ground, upright on their butt ends, and the bronze shone like the lightning of Father Zeus. The hero was asleep, and under him was spread the hide of a field ox, and a bright rug was pulled up underneath his head. Nestor the Gerenian horseman stood close to wake him, stirring him with his foot. He rebuked him to his face. Wake up, son of Tydeus. Why sleep all night? Have you not heard that the Trojans are camped on the rising plain close by the ships and only a narrow space now separates us? So he spoke, and Diomedes woke and sprang up very quickly and addressed Nestor, speaking with winged words. You are hard, old man, and you never rest from toil. Are there not other sons of the Achaeans, younger men, who might better go up and down the camp, rousing each of the kings? Old man, you are impossible to control. Then in answer Nestor the Gerenian horseman addressed him. All that you say, my friend, is according to due measure. I do have blameless sons, and I have men, many of them, any of whom could go up and down the camp and summon people. But a very great need has overwhelmed the Achaeans, and matters now stand upon a razor's edge for all of us Achaeans, either survival or an exceedingly miserable death. So come, if you have any pity for me, Go and rouse swift Ajax and Megas, Phileas's son. You are a younger man than I am. So he spoke. 
and Diomedes slung over his shoulders the hide of a great tawny lion, reaching to his feet, and picked up his spear. He set off and woke the two men and brought them back with him. When they joined the sentries at the place where they were gathered, they did not find their leaders asleep, but they were all sitting there, armed and wide awake. As dogs who keep restive watch over sheep in a fold, having heard some ferocious wild beast coming down the mountains and through the woods, and a great clamor arises from the men and hounds pursuing it, and their sleep is lost. So sweet sleep was lost to the sentry's eyelids, too, as they kept watch through the uneasy night, since all the time they were facing the plain, waiting to hear the Trojans coming. The old man was glad when he saw them, and rallied them with his speech, and addressed them, speaking with winged words. This is the way, dear children, to keep watch. Do not let sleep catch anyone unawares in case we become a delight to our enemies. So he spoke, and strode over the ditch, and the other Argive kings followed him all who had been called to the council. And with them went Mariones and Nestor's splendid son, since they had been invited by the others to join their debate. When they had crossed over the deep-dug ditch, they sat down in an open space where the ground was clear of the dead men who had fallen, the place where towering Hector had turned back from slaughtering the Argives, when night covered the earth. Sitting there, they began to converse with each other, and the first to speak was Nestor the Gerenian horseman. My friends, could not some man put his trust in his audacious spirit to go among the great spirited Trojans and see if he could capture some enemy straggler, or perhaps hear some rumor among the Trojans, and so find out their plans, whether they are bent on remaining here by the ships, away from their homes, or if, having crushed the Achaeans, they will return to their city. He could find all this out, and then come back to us unscathed, and great would be his fame under the high sky, among all men and he will receive a noble reward. All the chieftains who have command over ships will each and every one give him a black sheep, a ewe with its suckling lamb, a possession without equal, and he will always be invited to their feasts and banquets. So he spoke, and they all remained silent and still, but Diomedes, master of the war cry, spoke out among them. Nestor, my heart and my proud spirit prompt me to steal into the camp of our enemies the Trojans, who lie close by, but if some other man were to come with me, I would find more encouragement and confidence. When two go together, one can discern before the other what is best for them, and even if one on his own can see this, his mind has a shorter reach and his resources weaker. So he spoke, and many men wanted to go with Diomedes. The two called Ajax, attendants of Ares, wanted to go. Meriones wanted to go. Nestor's son wanted fervently to go. Atreus's son, Menelaus, famed with the spear, wanted to go. And stalwart Odysseus wanted to steal in among the Trojan soldiery, for the heart in his breast was always daring. Then Agamemnon, lord of men, spoke among them, Diomedes, son of Tydeus, delight of my heart, you shall choose whichever companion you want, the best of those who have come forward, for many are raging to go. But do not, out of respect in your heart, leave the better man and take the worse with you, yielding to your esteem for him and looking to his ancestry, not even if he is more kingly. So he spoke, and he was terrified for fair-haired Menelaus. Diomedes, master of the war cry, spoke out among them again. If you are really telling me to choose a companion myself, how could I then forget godlike Odysseus, whose heart and proud spirit are ready beyond others for all kinds of labors, and Pallas Athena loves him. If he comes with me, we could even pass through blazing fire and return safe together, because his mind has no equal. Then in turn, much-enduring glorious Odysseus addressed him, Son of Tydeus, do not overpraise me, or dwell on my faults. You are speaking among Argives, who surely know me. Come, let us go. Night is almost at an end, and dawn is near, the star's course is advanced, and most of the night has gone, two-thirds of it are spent, and only the third part is left. So speaking, they both put on their terrifying armor. Thracy Medes, steadfast in war, gave the son of Tydeus a two-edged sword, because he had left his own by the ship, and a shield, and placed on his head a helmet made of oxide, without a horn or a crest, the kind that is called a skull cap, and it protects the heads of strong young men. Meriones gave Odysseus a bow and a quiver and a sword, and placed on his head a helmet of leather, carefully made. On the inside it was stretched tight by many straps, 
and on the outside close-set pieces of a shiny-toothed boar's white tusks ran this way and that, very cunningly made, and inside it was fitted a felt cap. Autolycus had once stolen this from a minter, or Manus's son, when he broke into his strongly built house in Elian, and he gave it to Amphidamas of Cethera to take to Scandia. Amphidamas gave it to Molus as a mark of guest friendship, and Molus gave it to his son Marions for him to wear, and now it was set for his protection on the head of Odysseus. So when the two of them had put on their terrifying armor, they set off, leaving all the chief men where they were. And Pallas Athena sent them an omen on the right, a heron close to their path. They could not see it with their eyes through the dark night, but they heard its piercing cry. Odysseus was glad of the bird omen, and prayed to Athena. Hear me, child of Zeus who wears the ages, you who stand by me in all my labors, and who do not forget me when I am stirred to action, now especially show me favor, Athena, and grant that we may return to the ships in glory, having done some great deed that will disquiet the Trojans. Next, Diomedes, master of the war cry, prayed in his turn. Hear me too, daughter of Zeus, Atritone. Go with me as once you went with my father, glorious Tydeus, into Thebes, when he went as an envoy from the Achaeans. He had left the bronze-shirted Achaeans beside the Asopus, and was taking beguiling words to the Cadmeans in that place. But on his way back he devised terrible deeds, with your help, bright goddess. And you readily stood beside him. So now again be willing to stand beside me and protect me, and I will in turn sacrifice to you a yearling heifer, broad of brow, not yet broken. One that no man has yet led under the yoke, I will sacrifice her to you, and I will cover her horns with gold. So they spoke in prayer, and Pallas Athena heard them. And when they had prayed to great Zeus's daughter, they went on their way like two lions through the black night, amidst the carnage, the dead men, the war gear, and the black blood. Nor indeed did Hector allow the proud Trojans to sleep, but he called together all their chief men to an assembly. All those who were leaders and captains of the Trojans, and when he had summoned them, he put forward a shrewd plan. Is there anyone who will undertake to perform a task for me? in return for a great reward. The recompense will be ample. I will give him a chariot and two horses with powerful necks, the best that there are beside the swift ships of the Achaeans, to whoever dares. And he will also win glory for himself, to go up close to their swift traveling ships, and to find out whether the swift ships are being guarded as before, or whether having now been beaten down at our hands. They are thinking among themselves of flight, and worn out by sheer weariness, do not care to watch through the night. So he spoke, and they all remained silent and still. Now there was among the Trojans a son of the sacred herald Eumes called Dolon, who was rich in gold and bronze, a man of most ugly appearance, but swift-footed. Eumedes had five daughters, and he was the only son. This man then spoke out to the Trojans and to Hector. Hector, my heart and my proud spirit urge me to draw close to the swift traveling ships and find out about them. So come, hold up the staff there, and swear to me that you will truly give me the horses and chariot intricately worked with bronze that now carry the blameless son of Peleus. And I shall prove no useless spy for you, nor frustrate your hopes. I shall go straight through the camp until I reach the ship of Agamemnon, where their chieftains will doubtless be deliberating in council, whether to flee or to fight. So he spoke. And Hector put his hand to the staff and swore to him, Let Zeus himself, the deep thundering husband of Hera, witness that no other Trojan shall ride behind those horses except you. And you, I declare, will take your delight in them forever. So he uttered an oath that would come to nothing, but it made Dolon bold. At once he slung a curved bow over his shoulders and over everything through the pelt of a gray wolf, and on his head a ferret skin cap and he took up a sharp spear and started off from the camp for the ships, but he was not destined to return from the ships and bring word to Hector. He had left the mass of men and horses behind him and was on his way, full of fierce intent, when Odysseus, sprung from Zeus, saw him approaching and addressed Diomedes. Look, Diomedes, here is a man coming from their camp. I do not know whether he means to spy on our ships or intends to strip the armor from one of the dead men. Let us first allow him to pass by us on his way to the plain, a little way, and after that we can rush out and capture him quickly, and if he chances to outrun us on swift feet, 
Keep forcing him towards the ships away from their camp, darting at him with your spear, so that he cannot escape to the city. So they spoke, and turned off the path and lay down among the dead men, and Dolan, in his ignorance, quickly ran past. But when he was as far ahead as the width of a day's mule plowing, and mules are better than oxen at dragging the jointed plow through deep fallow land, the pair ran after him, and he, hearing the sound, stopped still, thinking in his heart that they were his Trojan companions come to turn him back, because Hector had ordered him to return. But when they were separated by a spear cast or even less, he realized that they were enemies, and quickened his limbs into swift flight, and they quickly roused themselves in pursuit. As when two sharp-toothed hounds, skilled in the chase, press in never-relenting pursuit on a young deer or a hare through a wooded land, and it runs screaming before them, so the son of Tydeus and Odysseus, sacker of cities, in never-relenting pursuit cut Dolon off from his own people. Now, when in his flight towards the ships he was about to fall in with the sentries, then, indeed, Athena cast fury into Tydeus' son so that none of the bronze-shirted Achaeans might boast that he hit Dolon first and Diomedes was second. Threatening him with his spear, mighty Diomedes addressed him, Stop there, or my spear will find you, and then I do not think you will long escape sheer destruction at my hand. So he spoke, and let fly the spear, but deliberately missed the man. The point of the polished spear passed over his right shoulder and stuck fast in the ground. Dolon stood motionless terrified and stammering, the teeth in his mouth chattering, and he was pale with fear. The two caught up with him, panting, and seized him by the arms, and he burst into tears and spoke, Take me alive, and I will ransom myself. In my house there is bronze and gold and elaborately worked iron, from which my father would gladly give you a boundless ransom. If he learnt that I was alive by the ships of the Achaeans. Then in answer Odysseus of many schemes addressed him, do not despair, and do not let death cast your spirit down. But come, tell me this, and give me an exact account. Where are you going all alone, away from your camp to the ships, through the dark night, when all other mortals are asleep? Do you mean to strip the armor from one of the dead men? Or has Hector sent you out towards our hollow ships to spy on everything there? Or did your own heart impel you? Then Dolan answered him, and his legs beneath him were trembling. Hector has greatly deluded me, driving me out of my mind, promising to give me the single-hoofed horses of splendid Peleus's son and his chariot. Intricately worked with bronze, he has ordered me to go through the swift, dark night and come close to our enemy's ships and to find out whether the swift ships are being guarded as before or whether. Having now been beaten down at our hands, they are thinking among themselves of flight and worn out by sheer weariness do not care to watch through the night. At this Odysseus of many schemes smiled and addressed him. These were indeed great rewards that your heart longed for, the horses of Aeacus's war-minded grandson, but they are hard to master and to drive, at least for mortal men, except for Achilles, whom an immortal mother bore. But come, tell me this, and give me an exact account. When you came here, where did you leave Hector, shepherd of the people? Where is his armor of war lying, and where are his horses? How are the other Trojans' pickets placed, and where do they sleep? What plans have they made among themselves? Are they resolved to stay where they are, near the ships and far from their city, or will they return to the city, having now beaten down the Achaeans? Then in answer Dolan, son of Eumedes, addressed him, Very well, I will give you an exact account of all this. Hector, in company with all those who are his advisers, is holding a council beside the grave mound of godlike Ilus, away from all the hubbub. As to the pickets you ask about, hero, none has been appointed to defend or guard the camp. At every watchfire there are Trojan men under orders to stay wide awake and encourage each other to keep guard, but as for our allies, who are summoned from many lands, they are asleep. And leave it to the Trojans to keep watch, not having their children and wives lying near at hand. Then in answer Odysseus of many schemes addressed him, I see, but where are they sleeping, among the horse-breaking Trojans, or apart from them? Tell me clearly, so that I may know. Then Dolon, the son of Eumedes, answered him, Very well, I will give you an exact account of all this. By the sea are the Carians and Paeonians with their curved bows, 
and the Leleges and the Calcones and the glorious Pulaski. The proud Mesians were assigned a place towards Thimbre with the Phrygians, fighters from horses and the Myonian horse marshals. But why are you asking me to describe all this in detail? If you two are raging to steal into the Trojan soldiery, over there at the furthest point, away from the rest, are the Thracians, newly arrived, and with them is their king Rhesus, Eonius's son. His horses are the finest and the biggest I have ever seen. They are whiter than snow, and they run like the winds. His chariot is finely decorated with gold and silver, and he has brought with him massive armor of gold, a wonder to look at. It is not right for mortal men to wear such things, but only for the immortal gods. But take me now to your swift traveling ships, or else tie me up and leave me here, tightly bound, and you can both go and test my account to find out if I have spoken to you according to the truth. Or not. Mighty Diomedes looked at him darkly and addressed him, I warn you, Dolon, do not put thought of escape in your heart. Your news may be good, but you have fallen into our hands, and if we now accept a ransom or let you go free, you will surely return some day to the Achaeans' swift ships, either to spy on us or to fight us, matching strength to strength. But if you are beaten down by my hands and lose your life, you will never after this be an affliction to the Argives. So he spoke. Dolon was about to touch his chin in entreaty with his brawny hand, but Diomedes lunged with his sword and drove it through the middle of his neck, severing both tendons, and his head rolled in the dust while he was still speaking. They stripped the ferret skin cap from his head, and his wolf's pelt and curved back bow and long spear, and glorious Odysseus held them aloft in his hand to Athena who gathers the spoils, and spoke in prayer. Be glad with these, goddess. Of all the immortals on Olympus you will be the first we shall call on for help. Now help us again, and bring us to the horses and sleeping places of the Thracians. So he spoke, and lifted the spoils high above him, and hung them on a tamarisk bush. Above it he set a clear marker, pulling together a bundle of reeds and sturdy tamarisk branches, so that they should not miss it, returning through the swift, dark night. So the pair went onward through the war gear and the black blood, and as they went came quickly to the company of the Thracians. These were sleeping, worn out by weariness, and their fine weapons were piled neatly beside them on the ground in three rows, and by each man stood a pair of horses. Rhesus was sleeping in the midst, and next to him his swift horses were tethered with leather straps to the end of his chariot's rail. Odysseus saw him first and pointed him out to Diomedes. This must be the man, Diomedes, and these must be the horses that Dolan, the man whom we have killed, told us about. So come, and bring your strong fury into play. This is no time to stand idle here with your weapons. Untie the horses, or rather I will take care of the horses while you kill the men. So he spoke, and grey-eyed Athena breathed fury into Diomedes, and he began to kill. Laying about him with his sword, and a shameful groaning arose from the men he felled, and the ground grew red with blood. As a lion comes upon flocks which have no herdsmen, either sheep or goats, and it leaps on them with havoc in its heart. So the son of Tydeus kept at the men of Thrace, until he had killed twelve of them. Whenever Tydeus's son stood over a man and struck with his sword, Odysseus of many schemes would come from behind and seize him by the foot and drag him out of the way, with this plan in his mind. That the fine-maned horses might pass easily through the camp and not tremble in their hearts as they trod on dead men, for they were still unused to them. When the son of Tydeus came upon the Thracian king, he was the thirteenth whose sweet life he plundered as he lay there gasping, for by Athena's contrivance an evil dream, Diomedes, Oeneus's grandson, had that night stood over his head. Meanwhile, steadfast Odysseus released the single-hoofed horses and tied them together with thongs, and drove them out of the camp, beating them with his bow, since he had not thought to pick up the shining whip from the finely worked chariot. Then he whistled a signal to glorious Diomedes who, however, hung back, thinking of the most audacious thing that he could do, either to seize the chariot where the finely worked armor lay and drag it off by its pole, or else to lift it aloft and carry it away, or whether he should rob even more Thracians of their lives. As he was pondering this in his mind, Athena came and stood next to him and addressed glorious Diomedes, son of great-spirited Tydeus, think now about your return to your hollow ships, you will not want to reach them in panic flight, for it may be that some other god will wake the Trojans. So she spoke. 
and he knew he had heard a goddess's voice, and quickly mounted, and Odysseus struck the horses with his bow, and they flew towards the swift ships of the Achaeans. But Apollo of the silver bow was not keeping blind watch. He could see Athena looking after the son of Tydeus, and, enraged with her, went down among the massed soldiery of the Trojans and roused Hippocon, a counselor of the Thracians and Rhesus's excellent cousin. He started up from sleep, and when he saw the empty place where the swift horses had stood, and the men gasping their last amidst the ghastly carnage, he groaned aloud and called on his dear companion by name. An enormous noise of shouting arose from the Trojans as they flocked to the place. They were amazed at the terrible deeds that the men had done before returning to their hollow ships. When the pair reached the place where they had killed Hector's spy, Odysseus, loved by Zeus, reigned in the swift horses, and Tydeus's son leapt to the ground and placed the bloody spoils in Odysseus's hands, and then mounted once again. He whipped up the horses, and they flew willingly on towards the hollow ships, for their hearts were set on it. The first to hear the hoofbeats was Nestor, and he spoke. My friends, chieftains, and rulers of the Argives, my heart urges me to speak. Will it turn out that I am deceived or right? The beat of swift-hoofed horses strikes on my ears. May this mean that Odysseus and mighty Diomedes are driving single-hoofed horses here, straight from the Trojans. But I am terribly afraid in my heart that the Argives' chieftains have suffered some setback, and the Trojans are in full cry after them. He had not yet finished speaking when the pair arrived. They jumped down to the ground and the others gladly welcomed them with clasped right hands and cordial words. And the first to question them was Nestor the Gerenian horseman. Come now, Odysseus of many tales, great glory of the Achaeans, tell me how you two won these horses. Did you steal into the Trojan soldiery, or did some god meet you and give you them? They are amazing and look to me like the rays of the sun. I am always meeting Trojans in battle, I can claim that I do not hang back by the ship's aged warrior, though I am. But I have never yet seen or clapped my eyes on such horses. No, I think some god met you and made you a present of them, for both of you are dear to Zeus who gathers the clouds, and to grey-eyed Athena, daughter of Zeus who wears the aegis. Then in answer Odysseus of many schemes addressed him, Nestor, son of Neleus, great glory of the Achaeans, it would be easy for a god if he wished it, to give us even finer horses than these, since the gods are far stronger than we are. No, these horses that you ask about, old man, have just come here from Thrace. Courageous Diomedes killed their lord and twelve companions with him, all of them chieftains. The thirteenth man was a scout we caught near the ships, one whom Hector and the other splendid Trojans had sent out to be a spy on us in our camp. So he spoke, and drove the single-hoofed horses across the ditch, laughing aloud and the other Achaeans went happily with him. When they reached the well-built hut of Tydeus's son, they tied the horses up with finely cut leather straps, at the manger where Diomedes' own swift-footed horses were standing and munching honey-sweet wheat. And Odysseus laid the blood-stained spoils of Dolon in his ship's stern, until they could make an offering to Athena. Then they waded into the sea and began to wash off the abundant sweat from their legs and necks and thighs. When the waves of the sea had washed away the abundant sweat from their skin, and their dear hearts were refreshed, they stepped into polished baths and soaked themselves, and having bathed and anointed themselves richly with oil. The pair sat down to supper, and from the full mixing bowl they drew off honey-sweet wine and made an offering to Athena. Book 11 Now Dawn arose from her bed beside splendid Tithonus, to bring light to immortals and to mortals, and Zeus dispatched strife to the swift ships of the Achaeans, a goddess of pain, holding in her hands a portent of war. She stood on Odysseus's deep-bellied black ship, which was in the middle of the line, so that a shout could reach both ends, both to the hut of Ajax Telamon's son. And to Achilles' hut, these had dragged up their balanced ships at the furthest points, trusting in their courage and in the strength of their hands. Standing there, the goddess gave out a great terrifying shout in a piercing voice, and cast into the heart of each Achaean great strength to take up arms and fight without ceasing, and at once war became a sweeter thing to them than a return in their hollow ships to their dear native land. Then Atreus's son shouted to the Argives, ordering them to arm, and among them he himself put on the shining bronze. 
First of all, he fastened greaves around his shins, splendid ones, fitted with silver ankle pieces. Then over his chest he put on a corslet, one that Siniras had once given him as a mark of guest friendship. Siniras had heard in Cyprus the momentous news that the Achaeans were to sail in their ships for Troy, and for that reason sent him this gift, to find favor with the king. On it there were ten bands of dark blue enamel, and twelve bands of gold and twenty of tin, Dark enamel snakes reached up towards the neck, three on either side. Like the rainbows that Cronus's son imprints on a cloud as a portent for mortal men. Around his shoulders he slung his sword. On it there were rivets of gold, shining brightly, and the scabbard holding it was silver, fitted with golden shoulder straps. He lifted up the body-covering shield, intricately worked and beautiful and strong. Round it ran ten bronze circles, and on them there were twenty bosses of white tin and in the middle there was one of dark blue enamel. On the center was set like a circlet a grim-faced gorgon, staring hideously, and about her were terror and panic. From this shield hung a silver shield strap, and on it writhed an enamel snake with three heads that twisted this way and that but grew from a single neck. On his head he set a twin-ridged helmet with four plates and a horsetail crest, and the plume nodded terribly above him. He chose for himself two stout spears, tipped with bronze and sharp, and the gleam of their bronze reached to the high sky. Athena and Hera thundered over him, to show honor to the king of Mycenae, rich in gold. Then each man instructed his charioteer to rein in his horses in good order there by the ditch, while they themselves, fully armed, streamed over on foot, and their shouts rose unquenchable in the early morning. They formed up at the ditch well before the charioteers, who arrived soon after them. Cronus's son aroused a dreadful uproar among them, and from the clear air rained down drops heavy with blood, because he intended to hurl many mighty heads down to Hades. On their side the Trojans formed up on rising ground in the plain, around huge Hector and blameless Polydamas and Aeneas, who was honored by the Trojan people like a god. And around the three sons of Antenor, Polybus, glorious Agenor, and the unmarried Achamos, who looked like the immortals. Among the front ranks Hector carried a perfectly balanced shield, like the death-bringing star that appears rising out of the clouds, shining brightly, and then sinks again into the shadowing clouds. So Hector would at one time appear among the front ranks, and at another at the rear, urging them on. And all in bronze he shone like the lightning of Father Zeus who wears the aegis. Just like reapers who start from opposite ends of the field of a powerful man, and drive their path through wheat or barley. And the handfuls fall thick and fast. So the Trojans and Achaeans surged forward and began to cut each other down, and neither side thought of fatal flight. The battle kept them head to head, and they stormed in like wolves. Strife, the bringer of groans, was glad at the sight, for she alone of the gods attended their fighting. The other gods were not present, but were sitting peacefully in their own halls where each one's fine palace had been built along Olympus's upland glens, and they were all at odds with Cronus's son of the dark clouds, because he wished to give glory to the Trojans. But the father paid them no attention. He had slipped away from the others, and was sitting alone, exulting in his glory, looking out towards the Trojan city and the Achaeans' ships, at the lightning flash of bronze, at the slayers and the slain. As long as it was morning and the sacred day was growing, both sides' missiles struck home and the people kept falling, but at the time when a woodcutter prepares his meal in the mountain glens, because he has worn out his arms with felling tall trees, and weariness comes over his spirit, and the desire for pleasant food takes hold of his mind. Then the Danans called out to their companions along the lines, and by their courage broke through the enemy ranks. Agamemnon was the first to charge. He killed Bionor, shepherd of the people, first the man and then his companion Oleus Whipper of Horses, who had leapt down from the chariot and stood facing him, and as he came raging on Agamemnon pierced his forehead with his sharp spear. The heavy bronze helmet could not stop it, and it passed through both it and the bone, and his brain inside was all turned into pulp, and the man was beaten down in his rage. Agamemnon, lord of men, left them both where they were, their chests gleaming, for he had stripped them of their tunics, and he pressed on, looking to kill and strip Isus and Antiphus, two sons of Priam. One a bastard and one born in wedlock, both standing in one chariot, 
the bastard was holding the reins while far-famed Antiphus stood beside him. Achilles had once captured them on Ida's ridges as they tended their sheep and bound them with pliant osiers and set them free for a ransom. But this time Atreus's son, wide ruling Agamemnon, hit Isis on the chest with his spear above the nipple and struck Antiphus with his sword beside the ear and threw him from the chariot. He hastened to strip the pair of them of their fine armor, recognizing them, for he had seen them before by the swift ships, when swift-footed Achilles had brought them down from Ida. As a lion easily crushes the bones of a swift hind's young fawns, when it has come upon their lair and sees them in its mighty teeth, and rips out their tender hearts, and the mother, even if she chances to be nearby, cannot help them, because fearful trembling overcomes her limbs, and at once she darts away through dense thickets and woodland in a sweating fervor to escape the powerful beast's attack, so not one of the Trojans could keep death from these two, but were themselves driven in panic before the Argives. Next he caught Pisander and Hippolochus, steadfast in battle, the sons of war-minded Antimachus, who more than anyone had taken the gold of Alexander, a splendid gift, and would never allow Helen to be returned to fair-haired Menelaus. It was his two sons that Lord Agamemnon caught, both in one chariot, and both were trying to hold the swift horses. But the shining reins had fallen from their hands, and their horses were in confusion. Atreus's son rose like a lion before them, and from the chariot they entreated him. Take us alive, Atreus's son, and you will receive a worthy ransom. Many treasures lie stored in the house of Antimachus, bronze and gold and elaborately worked iron, from which our father would gladly give you a boundless ransom if he learnt that we were alive by the ships of the Achaeans. So these two weeping addressed the king with soft words, but they received a hard answer, if you are truly the sons of war-minded Antimachus. He who once in the Trojans' assembly advised that Menelaus, who had come on an embassy with godlike Odysseus, should be killed there and then and not be allowed back to the Achaeans, then now you will surely pay for your father's ugly act. So he spoke, and with a spear cast to his chest knocked Pisander out of his chariot, and he lay flat on his back on the earth. Hippolochus leapt down, but Agamemnon killed him on the ground, slicing his arms away and cutting off his head with his sword, and sending the trunk rolling like a log away through the soldiery. He left them there, and sped on to where the fighting in the ranks was thickest, and with him went other well-grieved Achaeans. Foot soldiers killed foot soldiers, and charioteers slew charioteers slashing at them with the bronze and driving them into flight, and on the plain a dust cloud rose under the chariots, kicked up by the horse's thundering hoofs. Lord Agamemnon kept up the pursuit, killing all the time and urging the Argives forward. As when destructive fire falls on a forest full of dry wood, and a swirling wind carries it everywhere, and bushes are uprooted and toppled down, driven by the fire's onrush, so the routed Trojans kept falling before Agamemnon, son of Atreus, and many strong-necked horses rattled their empty chariots along the battle lines of war, missing their blameless charioteers, who were now lying on the earth, far more appealing to vultures than to their wives. Now Zeus withdrew Hector from the dust and flying weapons, from the slaughter of men and the blood and the uproar, and Atreus's son pressed on, shouting urgently to the Danans. The Trojans kept pouring back, past the burial mound of old Ilus, son of Dardanus, across the mid-plain and past the wild fig tree, straining to reach the city, and Atreus's son kept up his pursuit, screaming, and his irresistible hands were spattered with gore. When the Trojans reached the Scaean gates and the oak tree, there they halted and stood, waiting for one another. Many were still fleeing in panic over the mid-plain, like cattle stampeded by a lion that has come on them in the dead of night. The rest have scattered, and one alone faces sheer death, and first the lion seizes the neck in its powerful jaws and breaks it, and then greedily gulps down its blood and all its entrails. So Lord Agamemnon, son of Atreus, pursued the Trojans all the time killing the hindmost, and they fled in panic. Many men fell from their chariots, head first or onto their backs, at the hands of Atreus's son, such was the driving fury of his spear. But when he was about to pull up below the city and its steep wall, then indeed the father of gods and men came down from the high sky and took his seat on the peaks of Ida of many springs. And he was, holding a thunderbolt in his hands. 
Quickly he sent Iris of the Golden Wings away with a message. Away now, swift Iris, and give this message to Hector. As long as he can see Agamemnon, shepherd of the people, rampaging among the front fighters and killing the ranks of men, so long let him hold back. But order the rest of the people to keep grappling with the enemy in the fierce crush of battle. But when Agamemnon is struck by a spear or hit by an arrow and leaps back into his chariot, then I will promise him the strength to kill, right up to when he reaches their well-benched ships. And the sun goes down and sacred darkness comes on. So he spoke, and wind-footed swift Iris did not disobey him, but flew down from the heights of Ida to sacred Troy, and she found glorious Hector, son of wise Priam, standing behind his horses in his close-jointed chariot. Swift-footed Iris stood next to him and addressed him, Hector, son of Priam, the equal of Zeus in scheming, Father Zeus has sent me to bring you this message. As long as you can see Agamemnon, shepherd of the people, rampaging among the front fighters and killing the ranks of men, so long hold back from the fighting. But order the rest of the people to keep grappling with the enemy in the fierce crush of battle. But when Agamemnon is struck by a spear or hit by an arrow and leaps back into his chariot, then Zeus will promise you the strength to kill, right up to when you reach their well-benched ships. And the sun goes down and sacred darkness comes on. So swift-footed Iris spoke and left him, and Hector leapt fully armored from his chariot to the ground. And hefting his sharp spears, he ranged through the whole army, urging the men to fight and rousing them for the grim conflict. They rallied and took their stand facing the Achaeans, while the Argives on their side strengthened their companies. So the battle order was set, and they stood facing each other, and Agamemnon was the first to leap out, eager to fight in front of all. Tell me now, muses, who have your homes on Olympus, who was the first to come out and oppose Agamemnon, whether of the Trojans themselves or of their far-famed allies. It was Iphidamas, the son of Antenor, a valiant and mighty man, who was raised in rich-soiled Thrace, mother of flocks. His mother's father raised him in his house when he was a little child, Sisses, who fathered Theano of the lovely cheeks. When he reached the time of manhood when men long for glory, Sisses tried to keep him there and offered him his daughter's hand. But straight after his marriage, he left the bridal room, hearing news of the Achaeans coming, and went to Troy with an escort of twelve curved ships. He had left these balanced ships at Percout and had continued on his journey on foot to Ilium by himself. He it was who then came out to face Atreus' son Agamemnon. When they had advanced to within close range of each other, Atreus' son threw and missed, and his spear was deflected. And Iphidama stabbed him on the belt, below his corslet, putting his weight behind the blow and trusting in his brawny hand. But he could not pierce the gleaming belt, and long before that happened his point met the silver and was bent back like lead. Wide ruling Agamemnon grasped the spear with his hand and pulled it towards himself, raging like a lion, wrenching it from Iphidamas' hand, and struck him in the neck with his sword and loosened his limbs. There he fell, and slept the sleep of bronze pitiable man, helping his countrymen and far from his wedded wife, his bride, from whom he had no joy, though he had given much. First he gave a hundred cattle, and promised a thousand more goats and sheep mixed, from the countless flocks he owned. And now Agamemnon, son of Atreus, stripped him of his gear and went back with the fine armor through the Achaean soldiery. When Khan saw him, Khan, a man distinguished among men, who was the eldest son of Antenor, a powerful grief for the death of his brother covered his eyes. He came up unnoticed with his spear at glorious Agamemnon's side and stabbed him on the middle of his forearm, below the elbow, and the point of the shining spear passed clean through. At this Agamemnon, Lord of men shuddered, but even so he did not give up the battle and the fighting, but sprang at Khan with his wind-hardened spear. At this Khan, raging, seized the foot of his brother, his father's son, and began to drag him away, calling out to all the leading men. But as he dragged him through the mass, Agamemnon stabbed him below his bossed shield with a bronze-tipped spear and loosened his limbs, and coming up to him cut his head off over the dead of Fidamas. So their Antenor's sons filled up the measure of their lives at the hands of the king, Atreus's son, and went down into the house of Hades. Now the son of Atreus, so long as the blood welled up warm from his wound, went up and down the Trojan ranks, attacking them with spear and sword and great stones. But when the wound began to dry, 
and the blood stopped flowing, then sharp pains began to assail the fury of Atreus's son. As when a sharp spasm seizes a woman in labor, a piercing pang, sent by the Aelithiae, goddesses of painful birth, bringers of bitter suffering and daughters of Hera. So sharp pains began to assail the fury of Atreus's son. He leapt up into his chariot and ordered the charioteer to drive towards the hollow ships, for his heart was in anguish. He called out in a penetrating voice, shouting to the Danans, My friends, chieftains, and rulers of the Argives, now it is your task to keep the wearisome conflict away from our sea-traversing ships, since Zeus the Counselor has not allowed me to fight all day against the Trojans. So he spoke, and his charioteer whipped the fine-maned horses towards the hollow ships. And they flew willingly on. Their chests were covered in foam and spattered beneath with dust as they carried the wounded king away from the battle. When Hector saw that Agamemnon was falling back, he called to the Trojans and Lycians with a far-carrying shout, Trojans and Lycians and Dardanian hand-to-hand -hand fighters, be men, my friends, and call up your surging courage. Their best man has gone, and Cronus's son Zeus has given me great glory. Now drive your single-hoofed horses straight at the mighty Danans, and so win even greater glory. So he spoke, and quickened the fury and spirit in each man. As when a huntsman sets on his white-toothed hounds in pursuit of some boar in the wilds or a lion, so Hector, Priam's son, the equal of errors, doom of mortals, set the great-spirited Trojans on in pursuit of the Achaeans. He himself strode with high confidence among the front fighters, and rushed into the fighting like a violent squall that sweeps down and churns the violet-colored sea into swelling motion. Who then was the first, and who the last to be killed by Hector, Priam's son, when Zeus had granted him glory. They were Asaeus first, and Autonus and Opites, Dolops, son of Clatius and Opheltius and Agelos, Asimnus and Orus and Hipponus, steadfast in battle. These were leaders of the Danans, and after them he killed a mass of men. As when the west wind pounds clouds that are blown up by the clearing south wind, beating them with its violent blast, and the waves swell hugely and roll onward, and the spray is scattered by the veering wind's assault. So the people were beaten down in their multitudes by Hector. Then dreadful deeds, impossible to bear, would have been done, and indeed the Achaeans would have fled and fallen by their ships, had not Odysseus called out to Diomedes, son of Tydeus. Tydeus's son, what has made us forget our surging courage? Come here, my friend, and stand by me. We will surely be blamed if Hector of the glittering helmet captures the ships. Then, in answer, mighty Diomedes addressed him, Certainly I will stay and hold off their attack. But our relief will be short-lived, since it is clear that Zeus the cloud-gatherer wishes to give victory to the Trojans and not to us. So he spoke, and toppled Thimbraeus from his chariot to the ground, hitting him with a spear on the left nipple, and Odysseus fell godlike Molion, who was Lord Thimbraeus's attendant. They left them there, having put an end to their fighting, and rushed into the soldiery, spreading confusion, as when two boars fall with fearless intent on a pack of hunting hounds. Like them, they turned and charged, killing Trojans, and the Achaeans were glad to catch their breath as they fled before glorious Hector. Next they took a chariot with two men, chieftains of their people, the two sons of Merops from Percote, who above all men was skilled in seercraft. He had tried to prevent his sons from going to man-destroying war. But they would not listen to him, for the specters of black death were leading them on. It was these whom Diomedes, the spear-famed son of Tydeus, robbed of their life and breath, and took away their glorious arms. And Odysseus slew and stripped Hippodamus and Hyperochus. Then the son of Cronus, looking down from Ida, pulled the conflict taut, making it on equal terms, and both sides kept killing one another. Tydeus's son hit and wounded Agastrophus, the hero son of Paeon on the hip joint with his spear. His chariot and team were not at hand for him to escape. He was mightily deluded in his mind, for his attendant was holding them some way apart while he stormed through the front fighters on foot, until he lost his dear life. Hector was quick to see this along the ranks and ran at them screaming, and with him went companies of the Trojans. Seeing Hector, Diomedes, master of the war cry, shuddered, and at once addressed Odysseus, who was close by. Look, here is a great affliction rolling in on us, towering Hector. Come, 
Let us stand firm, wait for him, and then drive him off. So he spoke, and poising his long shadowing spear through it, aiming at the head. And he did not miss, and hit Hector on his helmet's crest. But bronze rebounded from bronze, and did not reach the handsome flesh, stopped by the vizard three-layered helmet which Phoebus Apollo had given him. At once Hector ran a long way back, joining the soldiery, then dropped to his knees and paused, propping himself on the ground with his brawny hand, and dark night covered his eyes. But while the son of Tydeus was following his spear cast far through the front fighters to where it had fallen on the earth, Hector recovered his breath and leaping into his chariot drove off into the mass of men and avoided the black death specter. Mighty Diomedes darted after him with his spear and addressed him. Dog, this time you have escaped death again, though disaster came very near you. Once again, Phoebus Apollo has saved you, the god you doubtless pray to when you enter the thudding of spears. Be sure that I shall make an end of you when I next meet you, if I too can discover a god somewhere to come to my aid. But now I shall go after the rest and hope to overtake them. So he spoke, and began to strip the arms of Paeon's spear-famed son. But Alexander, the husband of lovely-haired Helen, aimed his bow at the son of Tydeus, shepherd of the people, leaning against a pillar of the grave mound that men had made for Ilus, Dardanus's son, elder of the people in time past. Diomedes was stripping the bright shining corslet from mighty Agastrophus's chest and the shield from his shoulders and his strong helmet. When Paris pulled against his bow's grip and shot, and the arrow did not fly vainly from his hand, but hit the flat part of Diomedes' right foot, and the arrow went clean through and stuck in the earth. Paris laughed happily and leapt from his hiding place and spoke, boasting, You are hit, and my arrow did not fly in vain. How I wish I had hit you in the base of your belly and taken your life away, for then the Trojans would have had some relief from their misery. They who shudder at you as bleeding goats before a lion. Then mighty Diomedes answered him, in no way alarmed, You archer, braggart, hair-curled dandy, ogler of girls. If you were to face me in a trial of strength, in full armor, you would get no help from your bow and your showers of arrows, and now you have but scratched the flat of my foot, and yet you boast. I am no more troubled than if a woman or a careless child had hit me, for the arrow of a cowardly, worthless man is a feeble thing. Quite different is the sharp spear that I throw, which takes a man's life there and then, even if it only grazes him, his wife tears her cheeks in grief, his children are made orphans and he reddens the ground with his blood and rots away, and there are more vultures gathered round him than women. So he spoke, and Odysseus, the renowned spearman, came near and stood in front of him. Diomedes sat behind him and pulled the sharp arrow from his foot, and a painful spasm ran through his flesh. He leapt up into his chariot and ordered the charioteer to drive towards the hollow ships, for his heart was in anguish. Odysseus, the renowned spearman, was left on his own and not one of the Argives stayed with him, for fear had gripped them all. Deeply troubled, he spoke to his great-hearted spirit, What is to become of me now? A great disgrace if I flee, in fear of their masked men, but even worse to be captured alone, for Cronus's son has put the rest of the Danans to flight. But why does my dear heart debate with me in this way? I know well that those who run from the battle are cowards, while those who fight bravely in war must take their stand unyieldingly either to kill others or be killed themselves. While he was considering this in his mind and in his heart, the ranks of shield-bearing Trojans came up on him and penned him in their midst, but they brought suffering on themselves. As when hounds and strong young men close eagerly in on a boar, and it breaks out of a dense coppice, wetting its white fangs in its crooked jaws, and they rush to surround it, the noise of gnashing teeth rises up, but they bravely stand their ground before it, terrible though it is. So the Trojans closed around Odysseus, dear to Zeus. And first he wounded blameless Diopites on the shoulder, leaping forward and aiming high with his sharp spear, and after them he cut down Thon and Enomus. Next, when Chesidamas had jumped down from his chariot, he stabbed him with his spear in the groin, under his bossed shield. He fell in the dust, clawing the earth with his hand. Odysseus left them there, and with his spear-wounded Charops, Hippasus's son, full brother of wealthy Socus. Socus, a man like a god, ran up to protect him, and standing very close to him addressed Odys, Eus, Odysseus of many tales, insatiate of trickery and toil, 
Today you will either boast over two sons of Hippasus when you have killed two fine men and stripped their armor, or else you will lose your own life, struck down by my spear. So speaking, he lunged at Odysseus' perfectly balanced shield, and the massive spear passed through the shining shield, and forced its way through his intricately worked corslet, and tore the flesh right away from his flank. But Pallas Athena did not allow it to drive through into the hero's guts. Odysseus realized that the spear had not hit a fatal place, and giving ground he addressed Socus, Miserable man, now sheer destruction is surely catching up with you. You have indeed stopped me doing battle with the Trojans, but I tell you here and now that death and its black specter will be with you on this day. When beaten down by my spear, you give the glory to me and your shade to Hades, master of famous horses. So he spoke, and Socus turned and began to run away. But as he twisted round, Odysseus planted his spear in his back, between the shoulders, and he drove the point through his chest, and Socus fell with a thud. Glorious Odysseus boasted over him. Socus, son of war-minded Hippasus, breaker of horses, the end of death has come to you before you could escape it. Luckless man, neither your father nor your revered mother will close your eyes in death, but flesh-eating vultures will tear at you, flapping their fast-beating wings about you. But if I die, the glorious Achaeans will bury me with due rights. So he spoke, and began to pull war-minded Socus's massive spear out from his flesh and from his bossed shield. As he wrenched it out, the blood spurted up, and his heart was distressed. When the great-spirited Trojans saw Odysseus's blood, they called to each other down the ranks and made for him all together, and he gave ground and shouted to his companions. Three times he shouted in a voice as large as a man's head can hold, and three times Menelaus, dear to our A's, heard his cry, and quickly spoke to Ajax, who was standing nearby. Ajax, son of Telamon, sprung from Zeus, ruler of the people. I can hear the shouts of stout-hearted Odysseus ringing round me. And they sound as if the Trojans have cut him off in the harsh conflict. They have isolated him and are pressing him hard. Come, let us go through the soldiery. Rescue is the best course. I am afraid that left alone like this something may happen to him, brave though he is and that will be a great loss to the Danans. So he spoke and led the way, and the other, a godlike man, followed, and they found Odysseus, dear to Zeus, and around him the Trojans were swarming like blood-red mountain jackals around a stricken horned stag that a man has shot with an arrow from his bowstring. The stag evades him on swift feet, as long as its blood is warm and its knees can lift it. But when the swift arrow overcomes it, the flesh-eating jackals tear it apart on the mountains, in a dark wood, and then some divine power leads a lion there, a ravening beast, and the jackals scatter in fright, and the lion eats the stag. So the Trojans, many and courageous, crowded round war-minded Odysseus of the cunning wiles, but the hero kept the pitiless day from himself, lunging at them with his spear. Then Ajax drew near, carrying his shield that was like a tower and stood by him, and the Trojans scattered in fright. This way and that, and then warlike Menelaus took him by the hand and led him away from the mass of fighters while his attendant drove up his chariot. Next, Ajax sprang at the Trojans and killed Doriclus, a bastard son of Priam, and after that wounded Pandocus, and also wounded Lysandrus and Pyrrhus and Pylarts. As when a brimming river in winter spate, swollen by rain from Zeus, sweeps down from the mountains to the plain and carries along with it dead oaks and pines in abundance, and flings a mass of driftwood out into the sea. So then glorious Ajax drove them in confusion over the plain, cutting down both horses and men. As yet Hector knew nothing of this since he was fighting on the battle's far left, by the banks of the river Scamander where men's heads were falling thickest and an unquenchable clamor was rising around huge Nestor and around warlike Idomeneus. Among these Hector was fighting, causing terrible havoc with spear and chariot skill, crushing the ranks of young fighters. But even so the glorious Achaeans would not have given ground, had not Alexander, husband of Helen of the lovely hair, checked the great deeds of Mashan, shepherd of the people, hitting him with a three-barbed arrow on his right shoulder. At this the Achaeans, breathing fury, were greatly afraid that as the battle shifted towards the Trojans he might be captured. At once Idomeneus addressed glorious Nestor. Nestor, son of Neleus, 
Great glory of the Achaeans, come mount your chariot and let Mashan mount beside you, and drive your single-hoofed horses with all speed to the ships. A healer who has the skill to cut out arrows and apply soothing ointments is worth a great number of other men. So he spoke, and Nestor the Gerenian horseman did not disobey him. Straight away he mounted his own chariot, and Machon, son of the blameless healer Asclepius, got up beside him. He lashed the horses, and they flew eagerly onward towards the hollow ships, for that is where they wished to be. Now Sebriones, standing beside Hector in his chariot, saw that the Trojans were in confusion, and addressed him. Hector, while we two are engaged with the Danans here on the furthest flank of war and its hideous clamor, the rest of the Trojans are in wild confusion, both horses and men. It is Telamon's son, Aox, who is causing the rout. I know him well, from the broad shield he wears across his shoulders. Let us two direct our horses and chariots straight there, where especially men in chariots and on foot are clashing in fierce strife, killing each other, and an unquenchable clamor goes up. So he spoke, and lashed the fine-maned horses with his loud whip, and they, hearing the whips crack, carried the swift chariot at speed in among the Trojans and Achaeans, trampling dead men and shields alike. The axle beneath it and the rails round the platform were splashed all over with the blood that was thrown up in showers by the horses' hoofs and by the wheel tires. Hector was impatient to enter the mass of men, to leap in and break through them. He caused dreadful confusion among the Danans, and gave his spear little rest. Up and down the ranks of the fighters he went, doing battle with spear and sword and huge stones, but kept away from engaging with Ajax, son of Telamon, for Zeus was angry with him when he fought with a better man. But now Father Zeus, seated on high, aroused terror in Ajax, he stood dumbfounded and slung his shield of seven oxhides behind him, and looking keenly around him like a wild beast, turned in flight towards his own men, moving slowly step by step and many times wheeling round. As when country people and their dogs drive a tawny lion away from the yard where they keep their cattle, and keeping watch all night will not allow it to take a fat beast from among the cattle, it is desperate for meat and keeps coming at them, but without success. For spears and burning bundles of sticks fly thick from bold hands against it and terrify it for all its impatience, and at daybreak it goes away, grieved at heart. So then, Ajax withdrew before the Trojans, grieved at heart, with deep reluctance, for he was greatly afraid for the Achaeans' ships, as when a stubborn donkey passing a cornfield defies the boys driving it, and though many sticks have been broken on its sides, it goes into the field and causes havoc in its deep crop. And the boys beat it with sticks, but their strength is weak, and they drive it out with difficulty only when it has had its fill of food. So then the high-hearted Trojans and their allies assembled from many lands, kept attacking great Ajax, Telamon's son, thrusting at the center of his shield with their polished spears. At one time Ajax would recollect his surging courage and wheel round, keeping the companies of horse-breaking Trojans at bay, and then again he would turn in flight so he prevented them all from marching on the swift ships, standing alone in battle fury on the ground between Trojans and Achaeans. Spears were flung at him from bold hands, some, as they flew towards him, stuck in his great shield, and many, before they could reach his white body, came to rest in the ground between, yearning to taste his. When Eurypylus, the splendid son of Euaemon, saw that Ajax was being overwhelmed by dense showers of missiles, he went and stood beside him and let fly with his shining spear and hit Apison, son of Phausius, shepherd of the people, in the liver below his midriff and quickly loosened his knees. He leapt forward and began to strip the armor from his shoulders. But when Alexander, who looked like a god, saw Eurypolis stripping the armor from Apison, he immediately drew his bow against him and hit him with an arrow in his right thigh, and the shaft broke and weighed his leg down. At once he withdrew into his companion's band, avoiding the death specter, and with a piercing cry shouted to the Danans, My friends, chieftains, and rulers of the Argives, rally now and make a stand, and keep the pitiless day away from Ajax, who is overwhelmed by missiles. And I do not think he will escape war's hideous clamor. Come now, stand fast around huge Ajax, son of Telamon, and confront the enemy. So the wounded Eurypylus spoke, and they stood close beside him leaning their shields against their shoulders and leveling their spears before them. 
Ijax came to meet them and turned and stood when he had reached his companion's band. So they fought on in the likeness of blazing fire. Meanwhile, Nellius's mares, sweating, were carrying Nestor out of the battle, and with him Mashon, shepherd of the people. Glorious, swift-footed Achilles was aware of this and saw him. He was standing on the stern of his deep-bellied ship, watching the grim toil of war and the miserable rout. At once he addressed his companion Patroclus, calling to him from the ship, and Patroclus heard from the hut and came out, looking like Ares, and this was to be the start of his downfall. Menoeshus's stalwart son spoke first. Why do you call me Achilles? What need have you of me? Then in answer swift-footed Achilles addressed him, Glorious son of Menoeshus, delight of my heart, now I think that the Achaeans will gather about my knees and entreat me, for an intolerable need has come upon them. But go now, Patroclus, dear to Zeus, and ask Nestor who this is that he is bringing wounded from the battle. From behind he looks in every way like Mashon, the son of Asclepius, but I did not see the man's eyes, since the horses passed me by as they bolted onward. So he spoke, and Patroclus obeyed his dear companion, and set off at a run for the huts and ships of the Achaeans. When the others reached the hut of Nestor, Neleus's son, they got down from their chariot on to the earth that nourishes many, and Eurymedon, his attendant, unyoked the old man's horses from the chariot. The two then dried the sweat from their shirts, standing in the wind beside the seashore, and then went into the hut and took their seats on the chairs there. Hecamed of the lovely hair prepared a brew for them, the girl whom the old man had won at Tenedos when Achilles sacked it. And she was the daughter of great-hearted Arsenus. The Achaeans had picked her out for him because he was the best of all in council. First she pushed up a table before them, a beautiful thing, well-polished and with dark enamel feet, and on it set a bronze bowl with an onion as a side dish for the drink and yellow honey and beside it bread made of sacred barley, and next to these a very beautiful cup which the old man had brought from his home, it was studded with golden rivets, and had four handles, on each handle were two golden doves, feeding, one on either side, and underneath it rested on two feet. Other men would find it hard to raise the cup from the table when it was full, but the old man Nestor could lift it easily. In this cup the woman who looked like a goddess made them a brew of Pramnian wine, grating goat's cheese into it with a bronze grater, and sprinkling white barley on top, and when she had prepared the brew she invited them to drink. When they had drunk and driven away their parching thirst and were engaging each other in pleasant conversation, Patroclus, a man like a god, appeared standing at the door. When the old man saw him he jumped up from his shining chair, took him by the hand, led him in, and told him to be seated. But Patroclus refused, staying where he was, and addressed him, No chair for me, Zeus-nurtured old man, nor will you persuade me. He is easily offended and quick to anger. The man who sent me to find out who the wounded man is that you are bringing back, but I know him myself, for I recognize Mashon, shepherd of the people. So now I shall go back on my errand and report to Achilles. You know well, Zeus-nurtured old man, how terrifying a man he is. Likely to find fault even with one who is blameless. Then in answer Nestor the Gerenian horseman addressed him. Why is Achilles now so touched with pity for the Achaean sons, all those who have been wounded by spears? He knows nothing of the great grief that has arisen in the camp, now that the best men are lying in their ships, wounded by thrown and stabbing weapons. Mighty Diomedes, son of Tydeus, has been wounded by a spear, while spear-famed Odysseus and Agamemnon have been stabbed. Eurypolis has been shot in the thigh by an arrow. And just now I brought this other man out of the battle, pierced by an arrow from the bowstring. Yet the brave Achilles cares nothing for the Danans, and feels no pity for them. Is he waiting until our swift ships burn with destructive fire on the seashore, despite all the efforts of the Argives, and until we are killed one after another, since my strength is no longer as it used to be when my limbs were supple? I wish I was as young and healthy and my strength as secure, as I was when a dispute arose between us and the Elians over the matter of a cattle raid, and I killed Edemonius, the fine son of Hyperochus, whose home was in Elis. I was driving off his herds in reprisal, and while he was defending his cattle in the front fighters a spear from my hand struck him, and he fell dead, and his rustic people fled in panic. We drove off a huge amount of booty from the plain, fifty herds of oxen, and as many flocks of sheep, as many herds of swine, 
and as many wandering flocks of goats, and a hundred and fifty head of chestnut horses, all mares, many of them with their suckling foals. All these we drove into Pylos, city of Neus, into the city by night, and Neleus was delighted in his heart, because such success had come my way as a young man going to war. When dawn appeared, heralds proclaimed in a clear voice that all who had a debt owing in bright Elis should come forward, and those who were chieftains of the Pylians rounded up and shared out the booty. For the Apeans owed a debt to many, since we and Pylos had become enfeebled and few in number. In the years before this Heracles, that violent being, had attacked and weakened us, and all our best men had been killed. We sons of blameless Neleus had been twelve in all, but of these I alone was left, and all the others had perished. As a result of this, the bronze-shirted Apeans grew arrogant, and in their reckless machinations committed acts of violence against us. Out of the booty age, Neleus chose a herd of cattle and a great flock of sheep, selecting three hundred and their shepherds with them, because he had a huge debt owing to him in bright Ellis. Four prize-winning horses, together with their chariot, had been on their way to the games, intending to race for the prize of a tripod, but Ogeus, lord of men, had kept them in his house and had sent the charioteer away, grieving for his horses. The old man was enraged at these words and deeds, and so chose for himself a huge amount of booty. The rest he gave to the people to share out, so that no one to his knowledge should leave without a fair share. So we were busy with all this, and making offerings to the gods around the city, and on the third day the Epeans arrived all together, many men and single-hoofed horses in great haste, and with them the two Moliones in armor, still boys, with no experience yet of surging courage. Now there is a city called Threoessa, set on a steep hill, far off beside the Alpheus, on the borders of Sandy Pylos, and to this the Epeans laid siege, raging to destroy it utterly. But when they had scoured the whole plain, Athena came to us by night, in haste from Olympus, telling us to arm ourselves, and she assembled an army in Pylos, men by no means unwilling, but eagerly impatient to go to war. Now Nellius would not allow me to wear armor, and he hid my horses from me, because he said that I knew nothing as yet of war's work. But all the same I surpassed even our own chariot fighters, though I was on foot. Such was the way Athena framed the battle. There is a river called Minyus that empties into the sea near Arene, and there we Pylian chariot fighters waited for the bright dawn, and the foot soldiers' bands came streaming up. Hastily we armed ourselves in our gear, and set out and came at midday to the sacred waters of Alpheus. There we sacrificed fine victims to all-powerful Zeus, and a bull to Alpheus and a bull to Poseidon, but to gray-eyed Athena a cow from the herd, and then we took our supper in ranks throughout the camp, and lay down to sleep, each man in his armor, by the banks of the river. Now the great-spirited Epeans were camped around the city, raging to destroy it utterly, but before they could. Arez's mighty handiwork was revealed to them. When the sun rose bright above the earth, we prayed to Zeus and to Athena, and joined together in battle. When the conflict between Pylians and Epeans began, I was the first to kill a man, and I seized his single-hoofed horses. He was Muleus the spearman, the son-in-law of Ogeus, whose eldest daughter he had married. Fair-haired Agamede, and she knew all the drugs that the wide earth nourishes. As he charged at me, I hit him with my bronze-tipped spear, and he fell in the dust. Then I leapt into his chariot and took my place among the front fighters. The great-spirited Epeans fled in panic this way, and that when they saw the leader of their chariot fighters fall, a man who excelled in battle. But I sprang at them in the likeness of a black tempest, and I captured fifty chariots, and in each of them two men fastened their teeth on the earth, beaten down by my spear. And indeed I would have cut down the two Moliones, the sons of Actor, had not their father, the wide-ruling earthshaker, carried them safe from the battle, covering them with a dense mist. So there Zeus granted a great victory to the Pelians, for we went after them over the wide rolling plain, killing the men and gathering up their fine armor, until we brought our chariots to Buprasium, rich in wheat, and to the Olenian rock and the place that is called the Hill of Elysium. And there Athena turned our people back. There I killed my last man and left him there, and the Achaeans drove their swift horses back from Buprasium to Pylos, and all praise Zeus among gods and Neleus among men. Such a man I was among men, if I ever was. But Achilles is the only one who will benefit from his valor, 
though I think he will weep much when it is too late and the people have died. My dear friend, I will tell you the advice that Menoeshes gave you on the day that he sent you from Thea to join Agamemnon. We two were in the house, I and glorious Odysseus, and we easily heard all the advice he gave you in his halls. We had come to the well-appointed palace of Peleus while we were assembling an army throughout Achaia that nourishes many. And we found the hero Menoeshes there in the house, and you, and with you Achilles. The aged horse driver Peleus was burning an ox's fat-wrapped thigh bones for Zeus who delights in the thunder, in an enclosed space of his court. He was holding a golden cup and pouring gleaming wine over the burning offerings. You two were occupied with the ox meat when we appeared, standing in the doorway. Achilles jumped up, amazed, and taking us by the hand, led us in and invited us to sit, and put before us the food that is right for strangers to receive. When we had satisfied our desire for food and drink, I spoke first, saying that both of you should come with us. You readily agreed, and your fathers both gave you much advice. The old man Peleus exhorted his son Achilles always to be the best, and to stand out above others. But this was the advice that actor's son Menoeshius gave you. My son, Achilles is more distinguished than you in birth, but you are the older. He is far stronger than you, but it is for you to speak shrewdly to him, and give him advice and guidance, and he will obey you to his benefit. So the old man advised you, but you have forgotten. Even now you could speak like this to war-minded Achilles, and you might win him over. Who knows if you might with a god's help arouse his spirit by persuasion. A friend's persuasion is a good thing. But if in his heart he is trying to avoid some divine revelation, and his revered mother has brought him a message from Zeus, let him at least send you out, and the rest of the Myrmidon people with you, and perhaps you will prove to be the Danan's saving light. Let him give you his fine armor to wear into battle, and perhaps the Trojans will mistake you for him and hold back from the battle, and the Achaeans' warlike sons will breathe again. Worn down though they are, there is little breathing space in war. Being unwearied, you might easily drive men who are exhausted in the battle's uproar back to the city from the ships and huts. So he spoke and roused the spirit in the other's breast, and he set off running past the ships towards Achilles, grandson of Aeacus. But when as he ran Patroclus reached the ships of glorious Odysseus, where they held their assembly and public tribunal, and where they had built altars to the gods, there he was met by Eurypolis, son of Euaemon. A man sprung from Zeus, limping out of the battle, wounded in the thigh by an arrow. Sweat was streaming from his shoulders and head, and from his painful wound black blood was oozing, but even so his mind was unshaken. Seeing this, the stalwart son of Menoeshus took pity on him, and groaning, he addressed him with winged words. O oh, you poor wretches, leaders and rulers of the Danans, so after all it seems you will glut the swift dogs in Troy with your white fat far from your friends and native land. But come, tell me, hero Eurypylus, sprung from Zeus, is there any way that the Achaeans can restrain huge Hector, or are they now to perish, beaten down by his spear? Then in turn the wounded Eurypylus addressed him, Patroclus, sprung from Zeus, there can be no more defense for the Achaeans, they will fall beside their black ships. All those who were before the best men among us now lie in their ships, wounded by thrown or stabbing weapons at the Trojans' hands, whose strength is always increasing. But come, help me, and take me to my black ship. Cut the arrow from my thigh and wash away the dark blood with warm water, and spread soothing ointments over it. Those excellent medicines that they say you learnt from Achilles, who was taught by Chiron, most just of the centaurs. We do have healers, Podalirius and Machaon, but I think that one of them is lying in his hut nursing a wound, himself in need of a blameless healer, while the other is out on the plain, facing the Trojans and ferocious heirs. Then in turn the stalwart son of Menoeshus addressed him, How can these things be? What are we to do, hero Eurypylus? I am on my way to deliver to war-minded Achilles the words that Gerenian Nestor, protector of the Achaeans, spoke, but even so I shall not abandon you, exhausted as you are. So he spoke, and gripping the people's shepherd round the waist, he led him to his hut. An attendant saw them, and spread oxides on the ground, and there Patroclus laid him down, and with a knife cut the sharp, piercing arrow out of his thigh, and with warm water washed the dark blood away. Then with his hands he crushed a bitter root, 
a killer of pain, and applied it, and wholly relieved his agony, and the wound began to dry, and the blood stopped flowing. Book 12 So Menoetius's stalwart son attended to the wounded Eurypylus in the huts. Meanwhile the Argives and Trojans fought on in massed conflict, and it seemed that the Danans' ditch would no longer hold out, nor the wide wall behind it. They had built this to shelter their ships, and had driven the ditch alongside it to protect their swift ships and the vast booty within its bounds. But they had not offered splendid hecatombs to the gods, and it was built without the immortal gods' sanction, and therefore did not remain standing for long. As long as Hector lived, and Achilles kept his anger alive, and the city of Priam the king remained unsacked, so long the great wall of the Achaeans also endured but when all the best men of the Trojans were dead, and many of the Argives had been killed, though some were left, and in the tenth year the city of Priam had been sacked, and the Argives had sailed in their ships to their dear native land. Then indeed Poseidon and Apollo devised a plan to sweep the wall away, channeling the fury of rivers onto it. All those that flow from the mountain range of Ida to the sea, Rhesus and Heptapurus and Chirusus and Rhodius, Granicus and Aesopus, and Bright's commander and Simois, where many oxide shields and helmets and a generation of the half divine had fallen in the dust. Phoebus Apollo diverted all these rivers' mouths to disgorge in the same place, and for nine days he flung their waters at the wall, and Zeus reigned without ceasing to sweep the wall more rapidly out to sea. The earth shaker, holding his trident in his hands, himself took the lead, and carried away on his waves all the footings of logs and rocks which the Achaeans had labored to lay, and leveled the beach beside the strong-flowing Hellespont, and when he had swept the wall away, he covered the great shore again with sand, and diverted the rivers back to stream in the channels where their lovely flowing water had run before. This is what Poseidon and Apollo would do in the future, but now war and its clamor were blazing around the well-built wall and the timbers of its towers reverberated as missiles struck it. The Argives, subdued by Zeus's lash, were penned in and confined next to their hollow ships, terrified by Hector, the ruthless divisor of panic rout. He, as before, was fighting in the likeness of a whirlwind, as when a boar or a lion is surrounded by hounds and huntsmen and twists about, exulting in its strength, while they form themselves into a close-knit wall and confront it, and hurl their spears thick and fast from their hands, but its superb heart is not daunted or driven away in fear, and it is its courage that kills it. Again and again it wheels about, testing the ranks of men, and wherever it charges the ranks of men retreat. So Hector went wheeling about among the soldiery, urging his companions to cross the ditch, but not even his swift-footed horses would attempt it for him, but stood whinnying loudly at its very edge. The wide ditch terrified them, and it was not easy to jump or to cross, since its banks along the whole length were overhanging. And at the top it was planted with great sharp stakes set close together, fixed there by the sons of the Achaeans as a defense against the enemy. No horse drawing a well-wheeled chariot could easily get over it, and so the Trojans were thinking to try on foot. Then Polydamas stood next to daring Hector, and spoke, Hector, and all you leaders of Trojans and allies, it is madness to try driving our swift horses over the ditch. It is extremely hard to cross. There are sharp stakes set upright in it, and behind them is the Achaean's wall. And there is no room for chariot fighters to dismount there and fight. It is a narrow place, and I think we shall come to grief. If high thundering Zeus in his hatred for them means to destroy them utterly, and is intent on helping the Trojans, I for my part would wish this to happen here and now, that the Achaeans should die here far from Argos. Their names forgotten but if they should rally and make a counterattack from the ships, and we become encumbered in the ditch that they have dug, I do not think that even one man would then get back to the city with the news. Once the Achaeans have turned to face us. So come, let us all do what I propose. Let our attendants hold the horses back by the ditch, and let us arm ourselves in our gear as foot soldiers and all accompany Hector in a body. The Achaeans will not resist us, if indeed they are caught fast in the snares of death. So Polydamas spoke, and his prudent advice pleased Hector, and at once he leapt, fully armed, from his chariot to the ground. Nor did the other Trojans stay massed together in their chariots, but when they saw glorious Hector they all jumped down. 
Each man then instructed his own charioteer to hold his horses in good order, there by the ditch, while they separated and formed themselves up, and, marshaled into five sections, marched off behind their leaders. Those who went forward with Hector and blameless Polydamas were the best and the most numerous, raging beyond the rest to break through the wall and fight by the hollow ships. Cibriona's made a third with these. Hector had left behind another man, weaker than Cibriona's, with his chariot. Paris led the second company with Alcathus and Agenor. Helenus and godlike Dephobus, two sons of Priam, were in charge of the third, and with them went the hero Asius, Asius, son of Hyrtacus, whom huge gleaming horses had brought from Arisbe, which is near the river cells. The fourth company was led by the valiant son of Anchises, Aeneas, and with him were the two sons of Antenor, Archelochus, and Achamas, well skilled in all battle's arts. The commander of the far-famed allies was Sarpedon, and he chose Glaucus and warlike Asteropeus to go with him, for they seemed to him to be without doubt the best of all men. After himself, but he stood out above everyone. When they had formed up oxhide shields overlapping, they eagerly made straight for the Danans, thinking that no one could now resist them, and that they would fall on the black ships. The rest of the Trojans and their far-famed allies followed the advice given by excellent Polydamas. But Asius, son of Hyrtacus, captain of men, was unwilling to leave his horses there with his attendant charioteer, and drove up close to the swift ship's chariot and all. Fool that he was, he would not escape death's evil specters and make his way back from the ships to windswept Troy, taking delight in his horses and his chariot. Before he could, his accursed destiny overwhelmed him in the spear of Adamenius, the splendid son of Deucaion. Asius charged towards the left of the ships, where the Achaeans were returning with their horses and chariots from the plain. Here he drove his horses and chariot across. And at the gates he did not find the doors shut, nor the long crossbar in place, since men were keeping them wide open, hoping to save any of their companions fleeing from the battle to the ships. Asius aimed straight with his chariot for this point, and his men followed with shrill screams, thinking that the Achaeans could resist no longer, but would fall beside their black ships, fools. For in the gateway they found two of the best fighters, the high-hearted sons of Lapith spear fighters. One was mighty Polypoetes, the son of Pirithus, and the other was Leontes, the equal of Ares, doom of mortals. Now these two took their stand in front of the high gateway, looking like high-crested oak trees on the mountains that day after day stand up to wind and rain securely fixed there by their great long roots. So these two, trusting in the strength of their hands, stood up to the charge of huge Asius and did not take flight. The Trojans, with a mighty shout, made straight for the well-built wall, holding up their shields of dried oxide, grouped around Lord Asius and Iaminus and Orestes, Adamas, the son of Asius, and Thon and Oenomaeus. For a time the Lapiths remained behind the wall, trying to rouse the well-grieved Achaeans to fight in the ship's defense, but when they saw that the Trojans were making a rush at the wall. While the Danans gave rise to shouting and panic, they charged out and began to fight in front of the gateway, looking like two wild boars on the mountains that confront a noisy rabble of men and dogs coming at them. With slanting forays, they smash the underbrush about them, ripping it up by the roots, and the noise of their clashing teeth rises up, until some man with a spear cast robs them of their life. So the shining bronze clashed on these two men's chests, battered by enemy missiles, so fiercely did they fight, trusting in the men above them and in their own strength. Those above kept hurling stones from the well-built towers, in defense of themselves and their huts and their swift traveling ships, and these fell to the ground like flakes of snow that a fierce blizzard, driving the dark clouds onwards, heaps up in drifts on the earth that nourishes many, just so the missiles streamed from the hands of Achaeans and Trojans alike, and helmets and bossed shields rang harshly, as rocks huge as millstones struck them. Then indeed Asius, son of Hyrtacus, groaned aloud, and striking both thighs spoke out in impotent rage. Father Zeus, so you too have turned out to be a complete and utter liar, I did not think that the Achaean heroes would withstand our fury in our irresistible hands, but they are like flickering-bodied wasps or bees that have made their habitation by a rocky road, and will not abandon their hollow house but face the men who are tracking them and fight to defend their children. Just so these men, 
though they are only two, will not fall back from the gates until they kill or are killed. So he spoke, but his speech did not persuade the mind of Zeus, whose heart wished rather to give the glory to Hector. Now other men were fighting about other gates, but it would be hard for me to describe this in full, as if I were a god. Everywhere around the wall of stone there arose awesome fire, and the Argives, for all their exhaustion, were compelled to keep fighting for their ships, and all the gods who supported the Danans in battle were grieved in their hearts. But at this point the two Lapiths rushed into the war and conflict, and the son of Pirithus, mighty Polypoetes, hit Damasus with his spear through his bronze-cheeked helmet. The brazen helmet could not keep it out, and the bronze point passed clean through and smashed the bone, and his brain inside was all turned to pulp, so he crushed the man in his frenzied charge, and after this he killed Pylon and Ormanus. Leontius, a shoot of Ares, hit Hippomachus, son of Antilochus, with a spear cast that went through his belt. Next he drew his sharp sword from its scabbard and darting through the soldiery first struck down Antifates from close quarters, who sprawled on his back on the ground. Then he brought down Menon and Iamenus and Orestes, all of them, one after another, on to the earth that nourishes many. While they were stripping the shining armor from these men, the young men who accompanied Hector and Polydamas, who were the best and most numerous warriors, and were raging more than the rest to break through the wall and set the ships ablaze, were still standing along the ditch, uncertain what they should do. For though they were raging to cross it, a bird omen had appeared to them. An eagle, skirting the army and flying high from right to left, and carrying in its talons the portent of a blood-red snake, still alive and struggling. This had not forgotten its battle lust, but, twisting backwards, bit its captor on the breast beside its neck, and the bird, smarting with a pain, let it fall to the earth, dropping it in the midst of the soldiery, and with a scream flew away on the gusts of the wind. The Trojans shuddered when they saw the writhing snake lying among them, a sign from Zeus who wears the Aegis. Then indeed Polydamas stood beside bold Hector and spoke, Hector, it seems you are always rebuking me in assemblies, though I give you good advice. It is of course not fitting for one of the people to speak out against you, in council or in war, but we must always promote your authority. Now, however, I shall speak publicly as seems to me best. Let us not press on to fight against the Danans over their ships. I will tell you how I think it will end, if indeed it was for the Trojans that this omen came as they raged across the ditch, an eagle, skirting the host and flying high from right to left, and carrying in its talons the portent of a blood-red snake, still alive, and then it let it fall before reaching its dear home, and did not succeed in carrying it off to give to its children. So we, even if with our mighty strength we break down the Achaeans' gates and wall, and the Achaeans give ground, we shall not return from the ships by the same way in good order, since we shall leave many Trojans behind, whom the Achaeans, as they defend their ships, will cut down with the bronze. This is how a prophet would interpret this sign, one whom the people trusted, and who had sure knowledge of portents in his heart. Then Hector of the glittering helmet looked at him darkly and said, Polydamas, what you advise does not now please me. You know that you could have thought of some better speech than this. But if you are serious in giving this public advice, then the gods themselves must have destroyed your wits. You say I should forget the plans of loud thundering Zeus, the promises that he gave me and his confirming nod, and you presume to tell me to put my trust in long-winged birds, for which I have not the slightest regard or concern, whether they fly to the right towards the dawn and the sun, or fly to the left and towards the murky darkness. No, let us put our trust in the plans of great Zeus, who holds sway over all mortals and immortals. There is one omen that is best of all to fight for one's fatherland. Why should you be so afraid of war and conflict? Even if all the rest of us are killed beside the ships of the Argives, you need have no fear of dying, since your heart is not the kind to fight or to face the enemy. However, if you do hold back from the slaughter or persuade some other man with your words to turn from the conflict, you will instantly lose your life, struck down by my spear. So he spoke and led them on. And the others followed him with an astonishing clamor. And Zeus, who delights in the thunder, raised a storm wind from the mountains of Ida which blew dust straight against the ships, bewildering the Achaeans' minds but giving glory to the Trojans and Hector.
Trusting in signs from Zeus and in their own strength, they kept trying to breach the great wall of the Achaeans, striving to tear out the tower's abutments and to pull down its battlements, and to lever out the jutting buttresses that the Achaeans had first sunk in the ground to be supports for the towers. By uprooting these, they hoped to breach the Achaeans' wall, but the Danans would not give way. Closing the gaps in the battlements with oxide shields, they kept throwing missiles from behind them at the enemy as they advanced up to the wall. The two called Ajax were ranging everywhere on the towers, all the time giving orders and stirring up the Achaeans' fury, addressing one man with soft words and rebuking another with hard ones. If they saw anyone holding far back from fighting, argive friends, exceptional warriors, or mediocre ones, or those who are weaker, since men are by no means all equal in war. Now there is work for everyone to do. But of course you know this for yourselves. Let no one turn back to the ships now that you have heard the call for battle, but press forward and encourage one another, in the hope that Olympian Zeus who sends the lightning will grant us to fend off the enemy's assault and drive them back to the city. So they, with cheering shouts, roused the Achaeans for battle. As the flakes of snow that fall thick and fast on a day in winter, when Zeus the counselor begins to send the snow, revealing his shaft to men, he lulls the winds and keeps the snow falling until he has covered high mountain peaks and jutting crags, the fields of clover and the rich tillage of men, and it settles thickly on the gray seas, bays, and beaches, and melts on the waves as they break on the shore. Everything is blanketed from above when Zeus' heavy snowstorm falls, so from both sides the stones flew thick and fast, hurled both at the Trojans and by them at the Achaeans without ceasing, and over the whole wall the din rose up. Even so, the Trojans and illustrious Hector would never have broken through the wall's gates and their long crossbar, had not Zeus the counselor roused his own son Sarpedon against the Argives, like a lion against crook-horned cattle. At once he held before him his perfectly balanced shield, a fine work of beaten bronze, which a bronze smith had hammered out and had stitched inside many layers of hide, attached with golden fastenings all the way around its rim. Holding this before him and poising his two spears, Sarpedon set out like a mountain-nurtured lion that has been a long time without meat. And its noble spirit drives it on to attack a strongly built farmyard and go after the sheep there. And even if it finds herdsmen in that very place, keeping watch over their flocks with dogs and spears, it refuses to be driven from the sheepfold before attacking it, and either pounces on a sheep and drags it away, or is itself struck down in its onslaught by a spear from a quick hand. So now godlike Sarpedon's spirit impelled him to make a rush at the wall and break through its battlements. At once he addressed Glaucus, son of Hippolochus. Glaucus, why are we two especially honored in Lycia with the best seats and cuts of meat, and ever full wine cups? And all men look on us as if we were gods, and we enjoy a huge estate cut out beside Xanthus's banks, fine land of orchards and wheat-bearing plowland. That is why we must now take our stand in the first rank of the Lycians and confront the scorching heat of battle, so that among the close-armored Lycians men may say, certainly those who rule us in Lycia are not without glory, these kings of ours, who eat fattened sheep and drink choice honey-sweet wine. There is also noble valor in them, it seems, because they fight in the first ranks of the Lycians. My dear friend, if we too could escape from this war and were certain to live forever, ageless and immortal, I would not myself fight in the first ranks. Nor would I send you into the battle where men win glory, but now, since, come what may, death specters stand over us in their thousands, which no mortal can flee from or escape, let us go forward, and give the glory to another man or he to us. So he spoke, and Glaucus did not turn away or disobey him, and they strode straight ahead leading a great company of Lycians. When Menestheus, son of Peteus, saw them he shuddered, for they were making for his tower, bringing destruction with them. He peered along the Achaeans' tower in the hope of seeing one of the leaders, who might keep ruin away from his companions, and he saw the pair called Ajax, insatiate of war, standing there, and also Teucer, who had recently come up from his hut, next to them. But he could not shout loud enough to be heard. So great was the noise and the clamor that reached the high sky as blows rained on shields and horsehair-crested helmets, and on the gates, these had all been shut. And the Trojans were standing at them, trying to shatter them and force a way in. At once Menestheus dispatched the herald thoats to Ajax. Go, 
Glorious Thotes, run to Ajax and summon him, or rather both the Ajaxes, for that would be the best course by far. Since sheer destruction will soon be done here, so heavily do the Lycian leaders press us, they who before have showed themselves formidable in the fierce crush of battle. But if toil and fighting are springing up about them there as well, at least let Ajax, the stalwart son of Telamon, come alone and let Teucer, a man skilled in archery, come with him. So he spoke. And the herald heard and did not disobey him, but set off at a run along the wall of the bronze-shirted Achaeans, and came and stood by the two called Ajax, and at once addressed them. You two named Ajax, leaders of the bronze-shirted Argives, the dear son of Peteus, who was sprung from Zeus, directs you to go to him, to face the toil of battle, if only for a short time, better both of you, for that would be the best course by far, since sheer destruction will soon be done there, so heavily do the Lycian leaders press them. They who before have showed themselves formidable in the fierce crush of battle, but if toil and fighting are springing up about you here as well, at least let Ajax, the brave son of Telamon, come alone, and let Teucer, a man skilled in archery, come with him. So he spoke, and huge Ajax, Telamon's son, did not disobey him, but at once addressed the son of Oleus with winged words. Ajax, you and mighty Lycomedes stand here together, both of you, and urge the Danans to fight as strongly as they can. I shall go over there and meet the enemy's attack face to face, and will quickly return once I have come to their rescue. So Ajax, the son of Telamon, spoke and went on his way, and Teucer, his brother by the same father, went with him and along with them Pangean carried Teucer's curved bow. They went along inside the wall, and came to the tower of great-spirited Menestius, and found men hard-pressed. Since the powerful leaders and commanders of the Lycians were climbing up the ramparts like a black tempest, and so they crashed together in battle, and the clamor rose up. Ajax, the son of Telamon, was the first to kill a man, great-spirited Epicles, one of Sarpaton's companions, hitting him with a huge jagged rock which was lying inside the wall on top of a heap, next to the ramparts. No man among mortals who live now, even one in the prime of youth, could easily lift it with both hands, but Ajax heaved it high and flung it and shattered his four-plated helmet, smashing all the bones inside to pieces. Epicles plunged from the high tower like an acrobat, and the breath abandoned his bones. Then as Glaucus, Hippolochus's mighty son, rushed forward at the high wall, Teucer hit him with an arrow at the point where he saw that his arm was exposed, and put an end to his battle lust. He sprang back from the wall unobtrusively, so that no Achaean should see that he was wounded and shout boastfully over him. Grief rose in Sarpedon as soon as he realized that Glaucus had left the fighting, but he did not forget his battle lust. He struck at Alcmon, Thestor's son, with his spear and stabbed him, and wrenched the spear out. Alcmon followed it and fell forward, and his armor, intricately worked with bronze, clattered about him. Sarpedon seized the battlement with his massive hands and pulled, and it fell away in one piece, and the wall above was laid bare, and so he made a path for many men. Then Ajax and Teucer set upon him together. Teucer hit him with an arrow on the shining belt that held his man-protecting shield across his chest. But Zeus kept the death specters from his son, unwilling for him be beaten down at the ship's sterns. Then Ajax leapt at him and stabbed at his shield, but the spear did not pass right through, though it flung back his frenzied attack. Sarpedon gave ground a little way from the rampart, but did not fall back completely, since his heart was hoping to win glory. Wheeling round, he called out to the godlike Lycians. Lycians, why abandon your surging courage in this way? It is hard for me, powerful as I am, to break through on my own and make a path to the ships. Forward. The more men, the quicker the work is done. So he spoke, and they trembled at their lord's loud rebuke, and pressed on all the harder around their king, the counselor. On the other side, the Argives strengthened their ranks behind the wall, for an enormous task appeared before them. The powerful Lycians were not able to break through the Danans' wall and make themselves a path to the ships, but neither could the Danan spearmen ever drive back the Lycians from the wall when once they had reached it. Like two men who are in dispute over boundary stones on common plowland, holding measuring rods in their hands, and quarreling over the fair division of a narrow patch of earth. So the battlements separated these men, and over them both sides kept hewing at the oxhide shields held before the others' chests shields both round and made from stretched, fringed hides. 
The flesh of many men was gashed by the pitiless bronze, both when fighters exposed their backs as they turned, and when they were stabbed clean through the shield itself. Everywhere the towers and battlements were spattered with the blood of men from both sides, Trojan and Achaean. But for all that the Trojans could not put the Achaeans to flight, they held out, just as when an honest wool-working woman holds her scales, lifting up the wool and weight together and balancing them, to earn some mean pittance for her children. So the battle and the conflict was pulled taut on equal terms, until the moment when Zeus gave the greater glory to Hector, Priam's son, who was the first to leap inside the Achaeans' wall. With a far-carrying shout he called out to the Trojans, Up with you, Trojan breakers of horses! Break down the Argive wall! and hurl awesome fire onto their ships. So he spoke, driving them on, and every ear caught his voice, and they made straight for the wall in a body, then, gripping their sharpened spears, they began to scale the abutments. Hector had seized and was carrying a boulder that was lying in front of the gates, broad at its base but pointed above, not even the two best men in any city, among mortals who live now, could easily lever it from the ground on to a wagon, but he lifted it easily even on his own. The son of crooked scheming Cronus made it light for him. As when a shepherd easily carries the fleece of a ram in one hand, and its weight sits but lightly on him, so Hector picked up the boulder and made straight for the planks that made up the tall double gates. Close-fitted and strong, two bars held them on the inside, crossing over from each side, and one bolt kept them shut. He came up and stood close, and putting his weight behind it and with legs planted well apart, to give the rock extra force. He flung it at the gate's middle and smashed it out of both pivots. The rock's weight carried it inside, and the gates groaned loudly, and the crossbars could not hold. And the planks were shattered in all directions under the stone's impact. Illustrious Hector sprang in, his face like swift night, shining in the terrible bronze armor that he wore on his body, gripping two spears in his hands. No one but a god could have faced and held him back when he leapt inside the gates, and his eyes blazed with fire. Whirling round towards the soldiery, he called to the Trojans to climb over the wall, and they obeyed his command. At once some scaled the wall, while others streamed in through the well-made gate itself. The Danans scattered in panic among their hollow ships, and the clamor rose unceasing.